Book One, Chapter One of A Woman of Genius. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Amy Dunkelberger. Book One, Chapter One of A Woman of Genius by Mary Hunter Austin. It is strange that I can never think of writing any account of my life without thinking of Pauline Mills and wondering what she will say of it. Pauline is rather given to reading the autobiographies of distinguished people, unless she has left off since I disappointed her, and finding in them new persuasions of the fundamental lightness of her scheme of things. I recall very well how, when I was having the bad time of my life there in Chicago, she would abound in consoling instances from one then appearing in the monthly magazines, skidding over the obvious derivation of the biographist's son from the Lord knows who, except that it wasn't from the man to whom she was legally married, to fix on the foolish detail of the child's tempers and woolly lambs as the advertisement of that true womanliness which Pauline loves to pluck from every feminine bush. There was also a great deal in that story about a certain other celebrity, for her relations to whom the writer was blackballed in a club, of which I afterward became a member. And I think it was the things Pauline said about one of the rewards of genius being the privilege of association with such transcendent personalities on a footing which permitted one to call them by their first names in one's reminiscences that gave me the notion of writing this book. It has struck me as humorous to a degree that in this sort of writing the really important things are usually left out. I thought then of writing the life of an accomplished woman, not so much of the accomplishment as of the woman, and I have never been able to make a start at it without thinking of Pauline Mills and that curious social warp which obligates us most to impeach the validity of a woman's opinion at the points where it is most supported by experience. From the earliest I have been rendered highly suspicious of the social estimate of women by the general social conspiracy against her telling the truth about herself, but in fact I do not think Mrs. Mills will read my book. Henry will read it first at his office and tell her that he'd rather she shouldn't, for Henry has been so successfully Pauline that it is quite sufficient for any statement of life to lie outside his wife's accepted bias, to stamp it with insidious impropriety. There is at times something almost heroic in the resolution with which women like Pauline Mills defend themselves from whatever might shift the centers of their complacency. But even without Pauline, it interests me greatly to undertake this book, of which I have said in the title, as much as a phrase may, of the scope of the undertaking. For if I know anything of genius, it is wholly extraneous, derived, impersonal, flowing through and by. I cannot tell you what it is, but I hope to show you a little of how I was seized of it, shaped what resistances opposed to it, what surrenders. I mean to put as plainly as possible how I felt it fumbling at my earlier life like the sea at the foot of a tidal wall, and by what rifts in the structure of living its inundation rose upon me, by what practices and passions I was enlarged to it, and by what well-meaning of my friends I was cramped and hardened but of its ultimate operation, once it had worked up through my stiff clay, of triumphs, profits, all the intricacies of technique, gossip of rehearsals, you shall hear next to nothing. This is the story of the struggle between a genius for tragic acting and the daughter of a county clerk, with the social ideal of Taylorville, Ohioana, for the villain. It is a drama in which none of the characters played the parts they were cast for, and invariably spoke from the wrong cues, 
which nevertheless proceeded to a successful denouement. But if you are looking for anything ordinarily called plot, you will be disappointed. Plot is distinctly the province of fiction, though I have a notion there is a sort of order in my story, if one could look at it from the vantage of the gods, but I have never rightly made it out. What I mean to go about is the exploitation of the personal phases of genius, of which, when it refers to myself, you must not understand me to speak as of a peculiar merit, like the faculty for presiding at a woman's club or baking sixteen pies of a morning, which distinguished one Taylor Villian from another, rather as a seizure, a possession which overtook me unaware, like one of those insidious oriental disorders which you may never die of but can never be cured. You shall hear how I did successfully stave it off in my youth for the sake of a working tailor and men's outfitter, and was nearly intimidated out of it by the wife of a Chicago attorney who had something to do with stocks. How I was often very tired of it, and many times, especially in the earlier periods, when I was trying to effect a compromise between it and the aforementioned Taylor Villian predilections, I should have been happiest to have been quit of it altogether. I shall try to have you understand that I have not undertaken to restate those phases of autobiography which are commonly suppressed, because of an exception to what the public has finally and at large concurred in that it does not particularly matter what happens to the vessel of personality, so long as the essential fluid gets through. But from having gone so much farther to discover that it matters not a little to genius to be so scamped and retarded, I have arrived at seeing the uncritical acceptance of poverty and heartbreak as essential accompaniments of gift very much of a piece with the proneness of Christians to regard the early martyrdoms as concomitants of faith, when every thinking person knows they arose in the cruelty and stupidity of the bystanders. Hardly anyone seems to have recalled in this connection that the initial Christian experience is a baptism of joy, and it was only in the business of communicating it that it became bloody and tormenting. If you will go a little farther with me, you shall be made to see the miseries of genius, perhaps also the bulk of wretchedness everywhere, not so much the rod of inexplicable chastisement as the reaction of a purblind social complacency. I shall take you at the sincerest in admitting the function of art to be its reneeding of the bread of life until it nourishes us toward greater achievement as a basis for proving that much that you may be thinking about its processes is wrong, and most that you may have done for its support is beside the mark. If I have had any compunction about writing this book, it has been the fear that in the relation of incidents difficult and sordid, you might still miss the point of your being largely to blame for them. And even if you escape the banality of believing that my having lived for a week in Chicago on 85 cents was in any way important to my artistic development, and go so far as to apprehend it as it actually was, a foolish and unnecessary interference with my business of serving you anew with entertainment, you must go a little farther honestly to accept it, even when it came, this revitalizing fluid of which I was for the moment the vase the cup, in circumstances which, in the rule you live by, appear when not actually reprehensible, at least ridiculous. Looking back over a series of struggles that have left me in a frame when no man under forty interests me very much, still within the possibility of personal romance, and at an age when most women have the affectional value of a keepsake only, the arbiter and leader of my world, I seem to see my life not much else but a breach in the social fabric, sedulously bricked up from within and battered from without, through which at last pours light and the fluid soul of life. 
Something of all this I shall try to make plain to you, and incidentally how in the process I have perceived dimly this huge coil of social adjustment as a struggle against the invasive forces of blessedness, the smother of sheep in the lanes stupidly to escape the fair pastures toward which a large friendliness herds them. If you go as far as this with me, you shall avoid, who knows what indirection, and that not altogether without entertainment. End of Book One, Chapter One Book One, Chapter Two of A Woman of Genius by Mary Hunter Austin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Book One, Chapter Two Of Taylorville, where I grew up and was married, the most distinguishing thing was that there was nothing to distinguish it from a hundred towns in Ohiana. To begin with, it was laid out about a square, and had two streets at right angles known as Main and Broad. Broad Street, I remember, ran east and west between the high school and the railway station, and Main Street had the Catholic Cemetery on the south, and the tool and hoe works on the north to mark, there was no other visible distinction, the points at which it became country road. There were numerous cross streets east and west, called after the governors, or perhaps it was the presidents, and north and south set forth on official maps as avenues, taking their names from the trees with which they were falsely declared to be planted though I do not recall that they were ever spoken of by these names, except by the leading county paper, which had its office in one corner of the square over the cooperative store, was Republican in politics, and stood for progress. The square was planted with maples. A hitching rack ran quite around it and was, in the number and character of the vehicles attached to it, a sort of public calendar for the days of the week and the seasons. On court days and elections, I remember, they quite filled the rack and overflowed to the tie post in front of the courthouse, which stood on its own ground a little off from the square, balanced on the opposite side by the Methodist church. It was a perfect index to the country neighborhoods that spread east and north to the flat, black cornlands, west to the marl and clay of the river district, and south to the tall weeded oozy bottoms. Teams from the bottoms, I believe, always had cockleburs in their tails, and spanking dapple greys drove in with shining top buggies from the stock farms, whose flacking windmills on the straight horizons of the north struck on my childish fancy as some sort of mechanical scarecrow to frighten away the homey charms of the wooded hills. I recall this sort of detail as the only thing in my native town that affected my imagination. When I saw the flakes of black loam dropping from the tires, or the yellow clay of the river district caked solidly about the racked hubs, I was stirred by the allurement of travel and adventure, the movement of human enterprise on the forewent ways of the world. From my always seeming to see them so bemired with their recent passages, I gather that my observations must have been made chiefly in winter on my way to school. From other memories of Taylorville, arched in by the full-leaved elms and maples, smelling of dust and syringas, and never quite separable from a suspicion of boredom, I judge my summer acquaintance with its streets to have been chiefly by way of going to church, for until the winter I was eleven years old, Taylorville, the world in fact, meant Hadley's pasture. It lay back of that part of the town where our house was, contiguous to a common of abandoned orchard and cow lot, and if it lacked anything of adventurous occasion and delight, we, Forey and Effie and I, the McGee children, and the little Allinghams, did not know it. There was a sort of convention of childhood 
that we should never go straight to it by the proper path, but it must always be taken by assault or stealth, over the woodhouse and then along the top of the orchard fence as far as you could manage without falling off and then tagging the orchard trees. I remember there were times when we felt obliged to climb up every tree in our way and down on the other side, and so to the stump lot where the earliest violets were to be found. How blue it would be with them in April about the fairy ring of some decaying trunk. And beyond the stump lot, the alder brook and the stone pit pond where we caught a pike once, come up from the river to spawn. Up from the brook ranged a wood over the shallow hills, farther and darker than we dared, and along its banks was every variety of pleasantness. There was always something to be done there, springs to be scooped out, rills to be dammed, always something to eat. Sassafras root, minnows taken by hand and half cooked on surreptitious fires, red haws and hazelnuts. Always some place to be visited with freshness and discovery, dark, umbracious corners to provide that dreaded and delighted panic of the wild. But perhaps the best service the pasture did us was as a theater for the dramatization of the burgeoning social instinct. We played at church and school in it, at scalping and Robinson Caruso, and the three bears. We went farther and played at high priests and oracles and sacrifice. And what were we at Taylorville to know of such things? If this were to be as full an account of my art as it is of myself, I should have to stop here and try to have you understand how at this time I was all awash in the fluid stuff of it, buoyed and possessed by unknowledgeable splendors heroisms, tendernesses, a shifty, glittering flood. I am always checked in my attempt to render this submerged childhood of mine by the recollection of my mother in the midst of the annoyance which any reference to it always caused her, trying judicially to account for it on the basis of my having read too much, with the lurking conviction at the bottom of all comment that a few more spankings might have effectually counteracted it. But though I read more than the other children, there was never very much to read in Taylorville at any time, and no amount of reading could have put into my mind what I found there, the sustaining fairy wonder of the world. I was not, I think, different in kind from the other children, except as being more consistently immersed in it and never quite dispossessed. I have lost and rediscovered the way to it some several times, have indeed had to defend its approaches with violence and skill. This whole business of the biography has no other point, in fact, than to show you how far my human behavior has been timed to keep what I believe most people part with no more distressfully than with their milk teeth. Effie, I know, has no recollection of this period, other than that there was a time when the earth was hung with vestiges of splendor, and if my brother has kept anything of his original inheritance, he would sooner admit to a leftover appetite for jujubes and licorice. For Forrester is fully of the common opinion that the fevers, flights, and drops of temperament are the mere infirmity of gift. There was a time before I left off talking to Forrester at all about my work, when he visibly permitted his pity to assuage his disgust at the persistence of so patent a silliness in me, and still earlier, before I owned three motor-cars, an estate in Florida, and a house on the Hudson, there were not wanting intimations of its voluntary assumption as a pose. Pose and Forrester's vocabulary standing for any frame of behavior to which he is not naturally addicted. But there it was, the flux of experience rising to the surface of our plays, the reservoir from which later, without having personally contemplated such an act, I drew the authority for how Lady Macbeth must have felt about to do a murder, 
from which, if I had had a taste for it, I might have drawn with like assurance the necessity of the square of the hypotenuse to equal the squares of the other two sides. It is curious, though I cannot remember how my father looked, nor who taught me long division, I recall perfectly how the reddening blackberry leaves lay under the hoar-frost in Hadley's pasture, and the dew between the pale gold wires of the grass on summer mornings, and the very words and rites by which we paid observance to Snockerty. I am not sure whether Ellen McGee or I invented him, but first and last he got us into as much trouble as though we had not always distinctly recognized him for an invention. The McGees lived quite around the corner of the pasture from us, and as far as my memory serves, the whole seven of them had nothing to do but lie in wait for any appearance of ours in the stump lot. Though, in respect to their father being a section boss and the family Catholic, we were not supposed when we put on our good clothes and went out of the front gate— to meet them socially. I think there must have been also some parental restriction on our intercourse of play, for they never came to our house, nor we to theirs. The little Allinghams, in fact, never would play with them. They came to play with us and only included the McGees on the implication of their being our guests. If at any time we three Lattimores were called away, Pauline, who was the eldest, would forthwith marshal her young tribe in exactly the same manner in which she afterward held Henry Mills in the paths of rectitude, and march them straight out of the big gate to their home. I remember how I used perfectly to hate the expression of the little Allinghams on these occasions, and sympathize with the not always successfully repressed jeers of the McGee's. Mrs. Allingham was the sort of woman who makes a point of having the full confidence of her children, detestable practice, and I have always suspected, in spite of the friendliness of the families, that the little Allinghams used to make a sort of moral instance of us whenever they fell into discredit with their parents. At any rate, the report of our doings in Hadley's pasture as they worked around through to our mother— would lead to episodes of marked coolness in which we held ourselves each aloftly aloof from the other, until incontinently the spirit of play swirled us together again in a joyous democracy. At the time when the snockerty obsession overtook us, Alan McGee was the only real rival I had for the leadership of the pasture. If she had not had, along with all her Irish quickness, a touch of Irish sycophancy, I should have lost all my ascendancy after the advent of Snockerty. I feel sure now that Alan must have invented him. She was most enviably furnished in all the signs of lucky and unlucky, and what it meant if you put your stocking on wrong side out in the morning, with charms to say for warts and scraps of old-world song, that had all the force of incantations. Her fairy tales, too, had a more convincing sound, for she got them from her father, who had always known somebody who knew the human participators. It was commonly insisted by Mrs. Allingham that the McGee children would never come to anything, and I believe, in fact, they never did. But they supplied a healthful element of vulgarity in our lives that, Remembering Alfred Allingham's adolescent priggishness, I am inclined to think was very good for us. If I have said nothing of my parents until now, it is because the part they played in our lives for the first ten years was, from our point of view, negligible. Parents were a sort of natural appendage of children, against whose solidarity our performance had room and opportunity. They kept the house together. They staved off fear. No one, for instance, would think of sleeping in a place where there were no parents. They bulked large between us and the unknown. There was a general notion of our elders toward rubbing it into us 
that we ought to be excessively grateful to them for not having turned us adrift, sans food and housing, but I do not think we took it seriously. Parents existed for the purpose of rendering the world livable for children, and on the whole their disposition was friendly, except in cases like Mrs. Allingham, who contrived always to give you a guilty sense of having forgot to wipe your feet or tramped on the flower borders. I do not think we had a more active belief in our parents' profession of absorption in our interests than in my father's pretense to be desperately wounded by Forrester's popgun or scared out of his wits when Effie jumped at him from behind the syringa bush. It was admittedly nice of them, and it kept the game going, but there were also times when they did not manage it so successfully as we could have wished. I think that we never question their right to punish us for disobedience, perhaps because there is, after all, something intrinsically sound about the right of might, though we sometimes questioned the occasion, as when we had been told we might play in the pasture for an hour, of the passage of which we knew as much as wild pigeons. There was always, to me at least, an inexplicableness about such reprisals that mitigated against their moral issue. There was one point, however, upon which we all three opposed an unalterable front. We would not kiss and make up after our private squabbles. We fought or combined against neighboring tribes, or divided our benefits with an even-handedness that obtains nowhere as among children. But we would not be tricked into a status which it might be inconvenient to maintain. I am sure, though, that Mrs. Allingham used rather to put it over my mother for her inability to make little prigs of us. Mothers, she would say, on the rare occasions, when she came to call in the beaded dolman and black kid gloves, which other Taylor Villians wore only on Sunday, mothers, with the effect of making it all capitals, have an inestimable privilege in shaping their children's characters. This was when we had had our faces surreptitiously washed and been brought in for ceremonial inspection, and a little later she would add, with the air of having tactfully conveyed advice under the guise of information, I always insist, here Forrester would kick me furtively, insist on having the full confidence of mine, at which point my mother would make excuses to get me out of the room before I, who never could learn that people are not always of the mind they think they are, made embarrassing disclosures. Up to this time, my mother figures chiefly as a woman who tied up our hurts and overruled my father when he tried to beg us off from going to church. I suppose it was the baby always in arms, or expected, that kept us from romping all over her as we did with my father. And much of her profession of interest in us, which came usually at the end of admonitory occasions, had the cold futility of the family prayers that my mother tried to make appear part of the habitual order when Cousin Judd came to stay with us. I do not know whether he suspected the hollowness of our morning worship, but I am sure I was never in the least imposed upon by the high moral attitude from which my mother attempted to deal with my misbehaviors. She used to conduct these interviews on the prescription of certain books, by the reading of which I was afterward corrupted, on a basis of shocked solemnity that, as she was not without a sense of humor, often broke down under my raw disbelief. Forrester, always amenable to suggestion, was sometimes reduced to writhing contrition by these inquisitorial attempts, but I came away from them oftenest, not a little embarrassed, by her inability to bring anything to pass by them. I do not think our detachment was greater than is common with young children and families, where they are pushed out of their privilege of cuddling as fast as they were in ours. There was thirteen months between Forrester and me, another brother, early dead, before Effie, and two that came after. The children who died were always sickly. I think it probable in the country phrase 
so appalling in its easy acceptance, my mother had never seen a well day. And what was meant to be the joy of loving was utterly swamped for her in its accompanying dread. I seemed to have been born into the knowledge that the breast, the lap, and the brooding tenderness were the sole prerogative of babies. It was imperative to your larger estate not to exhibit the weakness of wanting them. There comes back to me in this connection an evening with us three, Forrester, Effie, and I, squeezed on to the lowest step of the stairs for company, my mother in the dusk, rocking and singing one of those wildly sweet and tragic melodies that the men brought back out of the South as seeds are carried in a sheep's coat. To this day I cannot hear it without a certain swelling to let in the smell of the summer dusk and the flitter of the bats outside and the quaver of my mother's voice. I could see the baby's white gown hanging over her arm. It was the next one after Effie, and already she must have been expecting the next, and the soft screech of the rocker on the deal floor. And all at once I knew, with what certainty it hurts me still to remember, how it felt to be held so close, close and safe, and the swell of the breast under the song, and the swing of the rocker, knew it as if I had been but that moment dispossessed, and the need, as I now know I have always needed to be so enfolded. I do not remember just what happened. I seem to have come to from a fit of passionate crying, climbed up out of it by a hand that gripped me by the shoulder and shook me occasionally by way of hastening my composure. I was struggling desperately to get away from it, away from the mother who held me so to the mother I had just remembered. And there was Jewel, the maid, holding up the lamp, ordering me to bed in the dark for having spoiled our quiet evening. Then after what seemed a long time, Effie snuggled up to me under the covers, terrified by my sudden accession of sobs, but too loyal to call down the household upon us. It came back, the need of mothering. There was a time when I had lain abed some days with the measles or whatever. I was small enough, I remember, to lie in the crib bed that was kept downstairs for the prevalent baby, and my mouth was dry with fever. I recall my mother standing over me and my being taken dreadfully with the need of that sustaining bosom and her stooping to my stretched arms divinely. And then I asked her to put me down again. I have had drops and sinkings, but nothing to compare with this. For there was nothing there, you understand. The release, the comforting. It wasn't there. It was never there at all. End of Book One Chapter Two Book One, Chapter Three of A Woman of Genius by Mary Hunter Austin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Book One, Chapter Three. But I began to tell you how Ellen McGee and I invented Snockerty and arrived at our first contact with organized society. At least Forey and Effie and I did for it led to our being interdicted the society of the McGee children for so long that we forgot to inquire what inconvenience, if any, they suffered on account of it. You will see for yourself that Ellen must have invented him, where, indeed, should a saint-abhorring Sunday-school Taylorville child get the stuff for it. God, we knew, and were greatly bored by his inordinate partiality for the Jews, as against all ancient peoples, and by the inquisitorial eye and ear forever at the keyhole of our lives, as Cousin Judd never spared to remind us, and personally I was convinced of a large friendliness brooding over Hadley's pasture, to the sense of which I woke every morning afresh, was called by it and to it. 
walking apart from the others, I vaguely prayed. But Snockerty was of the stripe of trolls, leprechauns, pucks, and hobgoblins. We began, I remember, by thinking of him as resident in an old hollow apple tree, down which, if small trifles were dropped, they fell out of reach and sound. There was the inviting hole, arm high in the apple trunk, into which you popped bright pebbles, bits of glass, and I suppose he might have sprung very naturally from the need of justifying your having parted with something you valued and couldn't get back again, at the prompting of an impulse you did not understand. Very presently the practice grew into the acknowledgment of a personality amenable to our desires. We took to dropping small belongings in the tree for an omen of the day, whether the spring was full or not, or if we should find any pawpaws in the wood, and drew the augury from anything that happened immediately afterward, say if the wind ruffled the leaves, or if a rabbit ran out of the grass. It was Ellen who showed the most wit in interpreting the signs and afterward reconciling their inconsistencies. But it was I conceived the notion of propitiating Snockerty, who by this time had come to exercise a marked influence on all our plays, by a species of dramatic entertainment made up of scraps of school exercises, Sunday hymns, recitations, and particularly of improvisations in which Ellen and I vied. There were times when, even in the midst of these ritualistic observances, we would go off at a tangent of normal play, quite oblivious of snockerty. Other times we were so worked upon by our own performance as to make sacrifices of really valuable possessions and variously to afflict ourselves. It was I, I remember, who scared one of the little Allinghams almost into fits by my rendering in the name of Snockerty of an anathema which I had picked up somewhere. But it was Ellen who contrived to extend his influence over the whole of our territory by finding in every decaying stump and hollow trunk a means of communication and deriving therefrom authority for any wild prank that happened to come into her head. It is curious that in all the escapades which were imposed on us in the name of our deity, for which we were duly punished, not one word of the real cause of our outbreaks ever leaked through to our parents. It was the only thing, I believe, the little Allinghams never told their mother, not even when the second youngest, in a perfect frenzy of propitiation, made a sacrifice of a handful of his careful curls, which I personally hacked off for him with Forrester's pocket-knife. He lied like a little gentleman and said he had cut them off himself because he was tired of looking like a girl baby. I think it must have been about the end of Snockerty's second summer that Ellen's wild humor got us all into serious trouble, which resulted in my first real contact with authority. Along the west side of Hadley's pasture, between it and the country road, lay the tilled fields of the Ross property, corn and pumpkins and turnips, against which a solemn trespass board advised us. It was that board, no doubt, which led to our always referring to the owner of it as Old Man Ross, for except as he was a tall, stooping, white-bearded, childless man, I do not know how he had deserved our disrespect. I have suspected since that the trespass sign did not originate wholly in the alleged cantankerousness of Farmer Ross, and that the McGees knew more of the taste of his young turnips and roasting ears than they admitted at the time when Snockerty announced to Ellen, through the hollow of a dark, gnarly oak at the foot of Hadley's Hill, that he would be acceptably served by a feast of green corn and turnips out of Ross's field. This was the first time the idea of such a depredation had occurred to us, I believe, for we were really good children in the main, but I do not think we had any notion of disobeying 
Personally, I rather delighted in the idea of being compelled to desperate enterprises. I recall the wild freebooting dash, the scramble over the fence, the rustle of the corn full of delicious intimations of ambush and surprise, the real fear of coming suddenly on old man Ross among the rows, where I suspect we did a great deal of damage in the search for ears suitable to roast, and the derisive epithets which we did not spare to fling over our shoulders as we escaped into the brush with our booty. There was a perfect little carnival of wickedness in the safe hollow where we stripped the ears for roasting. Fires, too, were forbidden us, where we dared old man Ross to come on, gave dramatic rehearsals of what we should do to him in that event, and reveled in forbidden manners and interdicted words. I remember the delightful shock of hearing Alfred Allingham declare that he meant to get his belly full of green corn anyway for belly was a word that no well-brought-up Taylorville child was expected to use on any occasion. And finally, how we all took hands in a wild dance around the fire and over it, crying, Snockerty, 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 in a sort of savage sing-song. Following on the heels of that, a sort of film came over the performance, an intimation of our disgust in each other at the connivance of wrongdoing. I remember as we came up through the orchard rather late, this feeling grew upon us, this sense of taint, of cheapness, which swelled into a most abominable conviction of guilt as we discovered old man Ross on the front porch talking to our father. And then with what a heaviness of raw turnips and culpability we huddled in and about our mother, going with brisk movements to and fro getting supper, and how she cuffed us out of her way, not knowing in the least what old man Ross had come about. Finally, the overwhelming consciousness of publicity swooped down upon us at my father's coming in through the door, very white and angry, wanting to know if this were true that he had heard. And it was the utmost limit of appropriateness that our father should get to know of our misdeeds at all. Times before, when we downrightedly transgressed by eating wild crabs, or taking off our stockings to wade in the brook too early in the season, we bore our mother's strictures according to our several dispositions. Forrester, I remember, was troubled with sensibility, and used fairly to give us over to wrath by the advertisement of guilty behavior. He had a vocation for confession, wept copiously under whippings which did him a world of good, and went about for days with a chastened manner which irritated me excessively. I believe now that he was quite sincere in it, but there was a feeling among the rest of us that he carried the admission of culpability too far. Myself, since I never entered on disobedience without having settled with myself that the fun of it would be worth the pains, scorned repentance, and endured correction with the philosophy which got me the reputation of being a hardened and froward child. That we did not on this basis get into more serious scrapes was due to Effie, who could never bear any sort of unpleasantness. Parents, if you crossed them, had a way of making things so very unpleasant. It was Effie who, if we went to the neighbors for a stated visit, kept her eye upon the clock, and if she found us yielding to temptation, was fertile in the invention of counter-exploits just as exciting and quite within the parental pale, and when we did fall, had a genius for extrication as great as foresters for propitiatory behavior. So it fell out that our piratical descent on Ross's field was our first encounter with an order of things that transcended my mother's personal jurisdiction. Up to this time, contact with our parents' world had got no farther than vainglorious imaginings of our proper entry into it, and now suddenly we found that we were in it, hailed there by our own acts in the unhappy quality of offenders. I think this was the first time in my life 
that I had been glad it was Forrester, who was the boy and not I, who was made to go with my father and Mr. Allingham to Ross's field to point out the damage for which they paid. It was this which sealed the enormity of our offense. Money was paid for it, and came near to losing its moral point with Forey, who felt himself immeasurably raised in the estimate of the other boys as a public character. It served along with my father's anger, which was so new to us, to raise the occasion to a solemn note against which mere switchings were inconsiderable. No doubt my brother has forgotten it by now, along with Effie, who got off with nothing worse than the complicity of having been one of us. But to me the incident takes rank as the beginning of a new kind of snockertism, which was to array itself indefinitely against the forces inappreciably sucking at the bottom of my life. It was as if, on the very first occasion of my swimming to the surface of my lustrous seas, I was taken with the line at the end of which I was to be played into shoals and shallows, to foul with my floundering some clear pools, and scatter the piece of many smaller fry. I mean the obligation of repute, the necessity of being loyal to what I found in the world, because it had been founded in sincerity with pains. For what my father made clear to us as the very crux of our transgression was that we had discredited our bringing up. Old man Ross could be paid for his vegetables, but there was nothing, I was given to understand, could satisfy our arrears to our parents' honor, which, it transpired, had been appallingly blackened in the event. Nothing in my whole life has so surprised me as the capacity of this single adventure for involving us in successive coils of turpitude and disaster. Though it was not until we followed my father into the best room the next morning, after he had seen Mr. Allingham, still rather sick, for the turnips had not agreed with us, that we realized the worst, rounding on us through a stream of dreadful, biting things that, as my father uttered them, seemed to float us clear beyond the pale of sympathy and hope. I remember my father walking up and down with his hands under his coat behind, a short man in my recollection, with a kind of swing in his walk, which curiously nobody but myself seems to have noticed, and a sort of electrical flash in his manner, which might have come, as in this instance, from our never being brought up before him except when we had done something thoroughly exasperating. I am not sure that I did not tell Ellen McGee, in an attempt to render the magnitude of our going over, that he rated us in full uniform, waving his sword which at that moment hung with his regimentals over the mantelpiece. "'Good heavens,' he said. "'You might have been arrested for it. My children. Mine. And I thought I could have trusted you. Good heavens!' Suddenly he reached out, as it were, over my brother's shoulder, to whom, in his capacity as the eldest son, most of this tirade was addressed, with a word for me that was to go tearing its way sorely to the seat of memory and consciousness, and lodging there become the one point of attachment to support the memory of him beyond his death. As for you, Olivia, I started at this, for I had been staying my misery for the moment, on a red and black table cover which my mother valued, and I was amazed to find myself still able to hate. As for you, Olivia May, he would never allow my name to be shortened in the least. I am surprised at you. He had expected better of me then. He had reached beyond my surfaces and divined what I was inarticulately sure of, that I was different. No, not better, but somehow intrinsically different. He was surprised at me. He did not say so much of Forrester, and he did say that it was exactly what he had expected of the McGees. But he had had a better opinion of me. I recall a throb of exasperation at his never having told me. I might have lived up to it. 
but with all the soreness of having dropped short of a possible estimate, that phrase, which might have gone no deeper than his momentary disappointment, is all I have on which to hang the faith that perhaps, perhaps some vision had shaped on his horizon of what I might become. I was never anything to my mother, I know, but a cuckoo's egg dropped in her creditable nest. But, said my father, I am surprised at you. He was, I believe, one of those men who make a specialty of integrity and of great dependability in public service, which is often brought to answer for the want of private success, an early Republican type fast being relegated to small towns and country neighborhoods. He had a brilliant war record, which was partly responsible for his office, and a string of debts pendant from some earlier mercantile enterprise, which, in the occasion they afforded of paying up under circumstances of great stringency, appeared somehow an additional burnish to his name. He was a man everybody liked. That he was extremely gentle and gay in his manner with us on most occasions, I remember very well and I think he must have had a vein of romance, though I do not know upon what grounds, except that among the few books that he left, many were of that character, and from the names of his children. Forrester, Olivia May, and Ephemia, called Effie for short, which were certainly not Taylor Villian. Forrester grew out of a heroic incident of a soldiering, of which I have forgotten all the particulars, except that the other man's name was Forrester, and my father's idea of giving it to his son who was born about that time was that when he should grow up and be distinguished, the double name of Forrester Lattimore should serve at once as a reminder and a certificate of appreciation. I recall that we children, or perhaps it was only I, used to abound in dramatic imaginings of what would happen when this belated recognition took place, though in fact nothing ever came of it, which might have been largely owing to my brother's turning out the least distinguished of men. Whether if my father had lived, he would have remained always as much in the dark as to the private sources of my behavior, I try not to guess. But this incident picked him out for me among the ruck of fathers, as a man distinguished for propriety, produced in the very moment of pronouncing me unworthy of it, the ideal of a personal standard. If he hadn't up to this time affected greatly my gratitude or affections, he began to shine for me now with some of the precious quality which inheres in dreams. And before the shine had gone off, I lost him. End of Book One, Chapter Three Book One, Chapter Four of A Woman of Genius by Mary Hunter Austin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Book One, Chapter Four. My father's death, which occurred the March following, came suddenly, wholly fortuitous to the outward eye and I have heard my mother say in its inconsequence, its failure to line up with any conceivable moral occasion, did much to shake her faith in a controlling providence, but affects me still as then, as the most incontrovertible of evidences of powers moving at large among men, occupied with other affairs than ours. A little while ago, as I sat riding here on my veranda, Looking riverward, an ant ran across my paper, which I blew out with my breath into space, and I did not look to see what disaster. It reminded me suddenly of the way I felt about my father's taking off. He was, he must have been, in the way of some god that March morning. That is one of the evidences by which you know that there are gods at all. You play happily about their knees, sometimes they play with you, then you stumble against a foot thrust out, or the clamor of your iniquity disturbs their proper meditations, and suddenly you are silenced. 
My mother was doubtless right. It would have been better if he had stayed with her and the children, certainly happier. But he got in the way of the powers. It is curious that until I began just now to reconstruct the circumstances in which the news of his death came to me, I never realized that I might have been looking on, but high above it, at the very instant and occasion, for from the window of my room in the second story of the Taylorville Grammar School, I could see the unfinished walls of the Zimnern block a glimmer with the light which the wind heaped up and shattered against their raw pink surfaces, and a loose board of the scaffolding allowed to remain up all winter, flacking like a torn leaf in the mighty current in which the school building, all the buildings, shook with the steady tremor of reeds and a freshet. Between them the tops of the maples, level like a shorn hedge, kept up an immensity of tormented motion that invaded even the schoolroom with the sense of its insupportable fatigues. I remember there were few at their desks that day, and all the discipline relaxed by the confusion of the wind. At the morning recess there had been some debate about dismissing the session, and one of the young teachers on the third floor had grown hysterical and been reprimanded by the principal. It must have been about eleven of the clock, while I was watching the little puffs of dust that rose between the planks of the flooring, whenever the building shuddered and ground its teeth, divided between an affectation of timorousness, which seemed to grow in favor as a suitable frame of behavior, and the rapid rise of every tingling sense to the spacious movement of the weather and my private dramatization of the demolition of the building from which only such occupants as I favored should be rescued by my signal behavior. Already several children had been abstracted by anxious parents, so that I failed to be even startled by another knocking until my attention was attracted by the teacher opening the door and opening it wide upon my uncle Alva. I saw him step back with the motion of his head sidewise, to draw her after him, but it took all the suggestive nods and winks that as she drew it shut behind her were focused on my desk to pull me up to the realization that his visit must have something to do with me. It was not, in fact, until I was halfway down the aisle after Miss Jessel called me that I recovered my surprise sufficiently to assume the mysteriously important air that was proper to the fifth grade on being privileged to answer the door. There was not, I am sure, in the brief information that I was wanted at home, one betraying syllable. Nothing sufficiently unusual in the way Miss Jessel tied me into my hood, nor in finding Effie tied into hers on the first floor, nor in the way her teacher kissed her. Everybody kissed Effie, who was allowed, nothing in Forrester's having already cleared out without waiting for us. We got into the town in the wake of Uncle Alva and between the business blocks where the tall buildings abated the wind. There was no traffic in the streets that day. Here and there a foot passenger with his hat held down by both hands and his coattails between his legs staggered into doorways which were snapped to behind him and from the glass of which faces looked out featureless in the blur of the wind. As we passed the side door of a men's clothing establishment, one of these pale human orbs approached to the pane, exhibited a peering movement, rapped on the glass, and beckoned. I know now this must have been the working of an instinct to which Taylorville was so habituated that it seemed natural to Uncle Alva, he was only my mother's half-brother, not my father's, to send us on with a word about overtaking us while he crossed the street at the instance of that beckoning finger to be chaffered with in the matter of my father's grave clothes. All this time there was not a word spoken that could convey to us children the import of our unexpected release. We drifted down the street, Effie and I, 
settling against the blast that drove furiously in the crossways. And finally, as we caught our breath under a long red sandstone building, I recall being taken violently, as it were, by knowledge, and crying out that my father was dead, that he was dead and I should never see him again. I do not know how I knew, but I knew, and Effie accepted it. She came cuddling up to me in the smother of the wind, trying to comfort me as if, as I think did not occur to her, he had been my father only, and not hers at all. I do not recall very well how we got across the town between the shut houses, high-shouldered with the cold, except that Uncle Alva did not come up with us, and the vast lapping of the wind that swirled us together at intervals in a community of breathlessness seemed somehow to have grown out of the occasion and be naturally commensurate with its desolating quality. I do not think it occurred to us as strange that we should have been left so to come to the knowledge that grew until, as we came in sight of our home, we were fairly taken aback to find it so little altered from what it had been when we left it three hours before. It had never been an attractive house, yellow-painted, with chocolate trimmings and unshuttered windows against which the wind contrived. It cowered in a wide yard full of unpruned maples, that now held up their limbs protestingly, that shook off from their stretched boughs disclaimers of responsibility. The very smoke wrenched itself from the chimney and escaped hurryingly upon the wind. The shrubbery wrung itself, whole flights of fallen leaves that had settled soddenly beside the borders all the winter, having at last got a plain sight of it, whirled up aghast and fled along the road. The blinds were down at the front windows, and no one came in or out. I remember our hanging there, on the opposite side of the street, for an appreciable interval, before trusting ourselves to a usualness which every moment began to appear more frightening, and being snatched back from the brink of panic by the rattle of wheels in the road behind us as a light buggy, all a glitter from point to point of its natty furnishings, drew up at our gate and discharged from the seat beside the driver a youngish man, all of a piece with the turnout, in the trim and shining blackness of his exterior, who with a kind of subdued tripping ran up the walk and entered at the door without a knock. I am not sure that Effie identified him as the man who had taken away the babies. Indeed, the two who came after Effie were so close together and went so soon that I have heard her say that she has no recollection of anything except a house enlivened by continuous baby. But she had the knowledge common to every Taylorville child of the undertaker as the only man who was let softly in at unknocked doors, with his frock coat buttoned tight and the rim of his black hat held against his freshly shaven chin. We snatched the knowledge from one another as we caught hands together and fairly dove into the side entrance that opened on the living room. The first thing I was aware of was the sound of forest or blubbering, and then of the place being full of neighbors, and my mother sitting by the fire in a chair out of the best room, crying heartily. We flung ourselves upon her, crying too, and were gathered up in a violence of grief and rocking, through which I could hear a great many voices and a kind of frightened and extenuating remonstrance. Come now, Mrs. Lattimore, now Sally, there, there, at every word of which my mother's sobbing broke out afresh. I remember getting done with my crying first, and being very hot and uncomfortable, and thinking of nothing but how I should wriggle out of her embrace and get away, anywhere to escape from the burden of having to seem to care, and then, but whether it was immediately after, I'm not sure, going rather heavily upstairs and being overtaken in the middle of it by the dramatic suggestion of myself as an orphan child toiling through the world. 
I dare say I had read something like that recently, and carrying out the suggestion with an immense effect on Uncle Alva, who happened to be coming down at that moment. And then the insidious spread through all my soul of cold disaster, out of which I found myself unable to rise even to the appearance of how much I cared. Of all that time my father lay dead in the best room, for by the usual Taylorville procedure the funeral could not take place until the afternoon of the second day. I have only snatches of remembrance, of my being taken in to look at him as he lay in the coffin in a very nice coat, which I had never seen him wear, and the sudden conviction I had of it somehow being connected with that mysterious summons which had taken Uncle Alva away from us that morning in the street, of the sitting up, which was done both nights by groups of neighbors, mostly young, and the festive air it had with the table spread, with the best cloth and notable delicacies, and mine and Forrester's reprisals against one another as to the impropriety of squabbling over the remains of a layer cake, and particularly of Cousin Judd. He came about dusk from the farm. He had been sent for, looking shocked, and yet with a kind of enjoyable solemnity, I thought, and the first thing he wished to do was to pray with my poor mother. "'We must submit ourselves to the will of God, Sally,' he urged. "'Oh, God! God!' said my mother, walking up and down. "'I am not so sure God had anything to do with it.' "'It's a wrong spirit, Sally, a wrong spirit, a spirit of rebellion.' My mother began to cry. Why couldn't God have left him alone? What had he done that he should be taken away? What have I done? You mustn't take it like this, Sally. Think of your duty to your children. The Lord giveth. Go tell him to give me back my husband, then. Effie and I cowered in our corner between the base burner and the sewing machine. It was terrible to hear them so, quarreling about God. My mother had her hands to her head as she walked, her figure, touched by the firelight, not quite spoiled by childbearing, looked young to me. Oh! 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 she cried with every step. You mustn't, Sally. You'll be punished for it. Cousin Judge shook with excitement. He was bullying her about her Christian submission. I went up to him suddenly and struck him on the arm with my fist. You let her alone, I cried. Let her alone. Somebody spoke out sharply, I think. A hand plucked me from behind, to my amazement my mother's. Olivia, Olivia May, I am surprised. And your father not out of the house yet. Go up to your room and see if you can't learn to control yourself. After all, there was some excuse for Cousin Judd. There was, in the general estimate, something more than fortuitous circumstance that went to my father's taking off. Early in the winter, when work had been stopped on the Zimmerned building, there had been a good deal of talk about some local regulations as to the removal of scaffolding and the security of foot passengers that the contractors had not been brought to book about it was thought to be due to official connivance. My father had written to the paper about it. But the scaffolding had remained until that morning of the high wind, when it came down altogether, and a bit of the wall with it. That my father should have been passing on his way to the courthouse at the moment was a leaping together of circumstances that seemed somehow to have raised it to the plane of a moral instance. It provided just that element of the dramatic and human affairs, which somehow wakens the conviction of having always expected it, though it hardly appeared why my father, rather than the contractor or the convincing city official, should have been the victim. If it wasn't an act of providence, it was so like one that it contributed to bring out to the funeral 
more people than might otherwise have ventured themselves in such weather. It was also thought that if anything of that nature could have made up to her, my mother should have found much to console her in the funeral. The Masons took part in it, as also the G.A.R. and the Republican Club, though they might have made a more imposing show of numbers if all the societies had not been so largely composed of the same members. In addition to all this, my mother's crepe came quite to the hem of her dress, and Effie and I had new hats. I remember those hats very well. They had very tall crowns and narrow brims and velvet trimmings, and we tried them on for Pauline Allingham after we had gone up to bed the night before the funeral. Mrs. Allingham had called, and Pauline had been allowed to come up to us. I remember her asking how we felt, and Effie's being as much impressed by the way in which I carried off the situation as if she had not been in the least concerned in it. And then we sat up in bed in our nightgowns and tried on the hats, while Pauline walked about to get the effect from both sides and refrained in respect to the occasion from offering any criticism. It was evening after the funeral, and everybody had gone away but one good neighbor. The room had been set in order while we were away at the cemetery. The lamp was lit, and there was a red glow on everything from the deep heart of the base burner. The woman went about softly to set a meal for us, and under the lamp there was a great bowl of quince marmalade, which she had brought over neighborly from her own stores, the color of it played through the clear glass like a stain upon the white cloth. It happened to have been a favorite dish of my father's. For the last year it had been a family use, he being delicate in his appetite, to make a point of saving for him anything which he might possibly eat, and taking the greatest satisfaction in his enjoyment. Therefore, it came quite natural for me to get a small dish from the cupboard and begin to serve out a portion of Mrs. Mason's preserves for my father. All at once it came over me, the meaning of bereavement, that there was nobody to be done for tenderly, the loss of it, the need of the heart for all its offices of loving, and the unavailing pain End of Book One, Chapter Four Book One, Chapter Five of A Woman of Genius by Mary Hunter Austin This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Book One, Chapter Five It followed soon on my father's death that we gave up the yellow house with the chocolate trimmings and took another near the high school, and that very summer my mother lengthened my skirts halfway to my shoe-tops and began to find fault with my behavior for a girl of your age. We saw no more of the McGee's after that, except as Ellen managed to keep on in the same class at school with me and Pauline and I found ourselves with a bosom friendship on our hands. I went on missing my father terribly, but in a child's inarticulate fashion, and it is only lately that I have realized how much of my life went at loose ends for the loss out of it of a man's point of view, and the appreciable standards which grow out of his relation to the community. Ever since the Snockerty episode, there had been glimmers on my horizon of the sort of rightness owing from a daughter of Henry Lattimore. But now that I had no longer the use of the personal instance, I lost all notion of what those things might be. For though I have often heard my mother spoken of as one of the best women in the world, she was the last to have provided me with a definite pattern of behavior. Pauline had struck out a sort of social balance for herself, grounded on the fear of what was common, 
Her mother had a day at home, from which seemed to flow an orderly perspective of social observances, for which my mother, never having arrived at the pitch of visiting cards, afforded me no criterion whatever. She had been a farmer's daughter in another part of the state, and had done something for herself in the way of school teaching before she married my father. My grandparents I never saw, but I seem to recall at such public occasions as county fairs and soldiers' reunions, certain tall farmer-looking men and their badly dressed wives, who called her cousin and were answered by their Christian names, whom I understand to be my mother's relatives without accepting them as mine. They were all soldiers, though, the men of our family. You saw it at once in the odd stiffness sitting on their farmer carriage like the firm strokes of a master on a pupil's smudge drawing. I think I got my first notion of the equality of experience in the way they exalted themselves in the memories of marches and battles. There had been a station of the Underground Railway not ten miles from Taylorville, and there had gone out from the town at the first call a volunteer company with so many Judds and Wilsons and Lattimores on the roster that it read like the record of a family Bible. They had gone out from, they had come back to, a life as little relieved by adventure as the flat horizon of their corn lands. But in the interim they had stretched themselves, endured, conquered, I have heard political economists of the crossroads account variously for the prosperity of Ohiana in the decade following the civil outbreak, but I have never heard it laid to the revitalization of our common stock by the shock of its moral strenuosities. To this day I question whether Cousin Judd got more out of his religion than out of his most unchristian experience from which he had come back silver-tipped, as it were, from that imperum into which men pass when they are, by great emotions, a little removed from themselves, to kindle in my young mind a realization of the preciousness of passion over all human assets. It came to me, however, in the years between twelve and fifteen, that my mother's relations did things with their knives and neglected others with their forks, that were not done in circles that by virtue of just such observances got themselves called good society. I was aware of a sort of gracelessness in their vital processes, in much the same way that I knew that the striped and flowered carpet in my mother's best room did not harmonize with the wallpaper, and that the curtains went badly with them both. I have to go back to this and to the fact that my clothes were chosen for wearing qualities rather than becomingness to account for a behavior that, as I began to emerge from the illumined mist of play, my mother complained of under the head of my not taking an interest. How else was I to protect myself from the thousand inharmonies that chafed against the budding instinct of beauty? the plum-colored ribbons I was expected to wear with my brown dress, the mottled Japanese pattern upon the gilt ground of the wallpaper, against which I had pushed out a kind of shell, hung within with the glittering stuff of dreams. For just about the time I should have been absorbed in Cousin Lydia's beaded dolman and the turning of my mother's one silk, I was regularly victimized by the fits and starts of temperament, instinctive efforts toward the rehearsal of greater passions than had appeared above my horizon, flashes of red and blue and gold thrown up on the plain Taylorville surface of my behavior, with the result of putting me at odds with the Taylorvillians. It was as if, being required to produce a character— I found myself with samples of a great many sorts on my hands, which I kept offering, hopeful that they might be found to match with the acceptable article, which, I may say here, they never did. They were good samples, too, considering how young I was, of the Magdas, Ophelias, Antigones I was yet to become, of the great lady, good comrade and lover, 
but the most I got by it was the suspicion of insincerity and affectation. I sensitively suffered the more from it as I was conscious of the veering of this inward direction, without being able to prove what I was sure of, its relevance to the shining destiny towards which I moved. If you ask how this assurance differed from the general human hope of a superior happiness, I can only say that the event has proved it, and as early as I was aware of it, moved me childishly to acts of propitiation. I wanted gratefully to be good, with the goodness acceptable to the powers from which such assurance flowed. But it was a long time before I could separate my notion of this from my earliest ideal of what would have been suitable behavior to my father, so that all the upward reach of adolescence was tinged by my sense of loss in him. It was when I was about thirteen, and had not yet forgotten how my father looked, that I made an important discovery. On the opposite side of the church, and close to the amen corner, sat a man with something in the cut of his beard, in the swing of his shoulders, at which some dying nerve started suddenly a throb. I must have seen him there a great many times without noticing, and perhaps the likeness was not so much as I had thought and I had had to wait until my recollection faded to its note of faint suggestion. But from that day I took to going out of my way to school to pass by Mr. Gower's place of business for the sake of the start of the memory that for the moment brought my father near again. I even went so far as to mention to my mother that I liked sitting in church where I could look at Mr. Gower because he reminded me of somebody— we were on our way home on Sunday night. We were always taken to church twice on Sunday. Forrester was on ahead with Effie, and just as we came along under the shadow of the spool factory, I had reached up to tuck my hand under my mother's arm and make my timid suggestion. "'Well, somebody who?' said my mother. "'Of my father.' "'Oh,' said my mother, "'that's just your fancy.' but she did not shake off my hand from her arm, as was her habit toward proffers of affection, and the moment passed for one of confidence between us. I was convinced that she must have taken notice of the likeness for herself. That was in the spring, and all that summer vacation I spent a great deal of time playing with Nettie Gower for the sake of seeing her father come at the gate about five in the afternoon, the way mine had done. Nettie was not an attractive child, and of an age better suited to Effie, who couldn't bear her. The relation, it seemed, wanted an explanation. But it never occurred to me that so long as I withheld my own, another would be found for it. Nettie's brother found it about the time that my friendship with the sister was at its most flourishing. He was no nicer than you would expect a brother of Nettie's to be, though he was good-looking in a red-cheeked way, with the flattened curl in the middle of his forehead, and of late he had taken to hanging about Nettie and me, looking at me with a curious sort of smirk that I was not quite arrived at knowing for the beginning gallantry. He knew perfectly well that I did not come to see Nettie because I was fond of her, but it was as yet for me to discover that he thought it was because I was fond of him. I remember I was making a bower in the asparagus bed. I was too old to play in the asparagus bed, but I was making a point of being good enough to do it on Nettie's account. And I had asked Charlie for his knife to cut the stems. Come and get it. He was holding it out to me hollowed in his palm, and he would not let go of my hand. You don't want no knife, he leered sickeningly. I know what you want. Suddenly I caught sight of Nettie's face with its straight thick plates of hair and nearsighted eyes narrowed at me behind her glasses, and it struck me all at once that she had never taken my interest in her seriously either. Well, what? I began defensively. This! He thrust out his face toward mine, but I was too quick for him. 
That was my first sex encounter, and it didn't somehow make it any the less exasperating to realize that what lay behind my sudden interest in Nettie couldn't now be brought forward in extenuation. But I am always glad that I slapped Charlie Gower before the paralyzing sense of being trapped by my own behavior overtook me. I hadn't found the words yet for the unimagined disgust of the boy's impertinence when, as I was helping to wipe the dishes that evening after supper, I tried to put it to my mother on a new basis which the incident seemed to have created, of our being somehow ranged together against such offenses. It was the time for us to have emerged a little from the family relation to the Freemasonry of sex, but my mother missed knowing it. I'm not going to Nettie Gower's any more, I began. No, said my mother, and of course I could not conceive that she had forgotten the confidence in which the connection with Nettie began. That Charlie, I just hate him. You know, he thought I was coming to see Nettie because of him. Well, said my mother, turning out the dishwater, perhaps you were. And that, I think it's safe to say, is as near as my family ever came to understanding the processes at work behind the incidents of my growing up. Yet I think my mother very often did know that the key to my behavior did not lie in the obvious explanation of it, and a sort of aversion toward what was strange, which I have come to think of as growing out of her unsophistication, kept her from admitting it, it was less disconcerting to have my springs of action accounted for on the basis of what Mrs. Allingham would have called common than to have it arraigned by her own standard as queer. There was always in Taylorville a certain cattishness toward innovations of conduct, which we youngsters railed at as countrified, which I now perceive to have been no worse than the instinctive movement to lessen by despising it, the terror, the deep, far-rooted terror of the unknown. The incident served, however, to supersede with resentment the sense of personal definite loss in which it had begun. Before the year was out, I had so far forgotten my father that I saw no resemblance to him in Mr. Gower and would not have recognized it had I met it anywhere though the want of fathering had its share, no doubt, in landing me, as I cast about for an appreciable rule to live by, in what I have already described as a superior sort of snockertism. The immediate step to it was my getting converted. That very winter, all Taylorville and the six townships were caught up in one of those acute emotional crises called a revival. It had begun in the Methodist and gradually involved the whole number of Protestant churches and had overflowed into the congregational building as affording the greatest seating room. By the middle of February, it was possible to feel through the whole community the ground swell of its disturbances. Night after night, the people poured into it to be flayed in spirit, stripped, agonized, exalted at the hands of a practiced evangelist, which they liked. As it had this cachet of being supernaturally good for them, they liked it with a deeper, more soul-stretching enjoyment than the operas, theaters, social adventure of cities, supposing they had been at hand. It hardly seems possible with all she had to do, and yet I think my mother could not have missed one of those meetings going regularly with Cousin Judd, who drove in from the farm more times than you would have thought the farm could have spared him, or with Forrester, who had been converted the winter before, though I think he must have regretted the smaller occasion. Left at home with Effie, who was thought too young to be benefited by the preaching and too old to be laid by in an overcoat on the Sunday school benches with dozens of others, heavy with sleep and the vitiated air. Late, when I had finished my arithmetic and was afraid to go to bed in the empty house, 
I would open the window a crack toward the blur on the night from the tall, shutterless windows of the church and catch the faint swell of the hymns and at times the hysteric shout of some sinner coming through, and I was as drawn to it as any savage to the roll of the medicine drums. The backwash of this excitement penetrated even to the schoolroom, as from time to time some odd whisper ran of this and that one of our classmates being converted and walking apart from us with the other saved in a chastened mystery. And finally, Pauline Allingham and I talked it over and decided to get converted too. Pauline, I remember, had not been allowed to attend the meetings and considered her spiritual welfare jeopardized in the prohibition. We knew by this time perfectly well what we had to do and had arranged to get excused from our respective rooms. Pauline was a grade behind me on a can of diphtheria the previous winter and to meet in the abandoned coal hole between the boys' and girls' basement. Pauline, who had always an aptitude for proselyting, brought another girl from the sixth grade who was also under conviction. We had the terms very pat a thin, hatchet-faced girl who joined the Baptist church and afterward married a minister, so that she might very easily have reckoned the incident at something like its supposititious value in her life. I remember that we knelt down in the dusty coal hole where the little children used to play I spy and prayed by turns for light, aloud at first, and then as we felt the approach of the compelling mood, silently, as we waited for the moment after which we might rather put it over our classmates on the strength of our salvation. It came, oh, it came, the sweep up and out, the dizzying lightness, not very different, in fact, from the breathless rush with which on a first night of Magda or Cleopatra I have felt my part meet me as I cross between the wings, the lift, the tremor of passion. Oh, I said, I'm saved, I'm saved, I know it. So am I, said Flora Haynes. I was a long time ago, but I didn't like to say anything. And if I hadn't just been converted, I should have thought it rather mean of her. In the dusk of the coal hole, we heard Pauline sniffling. I suppose it's because I'm so much worse a sinner, she admitted, but I just can't feel it. You must give yourself into the Lord's hands, Pauline, dear. Flora Haynes had heard the evangelist. I began to offer myself passionately in prayer as a vicarious atonement for Pauline's shortcomings. Don't you feel anything? Flora urged. Not the least thing? Well, sort of something, Pauline confessed. Well, of course, that's it. Yes, that's it, I insisted. Well, I suppose it is, Pauline gave in, mopping her eyes with her handkerchief, but it isn't the least like what I expected. We heard the school clock strike the quarter hour and got up, brushing our knees rather guiltily. Flora Haynes and I were kept in all that afternoon recess for exceeding our excuse, but Pauline saved herself by bursting into tears as soon as she reached her room and being sent home with a headache. That was on Thursday, and Saturday afternoon we were all to meet at our house and go together to a great children's meeting where we were expected to announce that we were saved. Pauline was a little late. I was explaining to Flora Haynes that I was to join our church on probation on Sunday, but Flora, being a Baptist, had been put off by her minister until the revival should be over and he could attend to all the baptisms at once. We naturally expected something similar from Pauline. I hardly think, she said, stroking her muff and looking very ladylike, that I shall take such an important step in life until I am older. But, I objected, how can anything be more important? It's your soul, Pauline, 
Flora Haynes was slightly scandalized. "'That's just the reason. It's so important. My mother thinks I ought not to take any steps until I can give it my most mature judgment.' Flora Haynes and I looked at one another silently. We might have known Pauline's mother wouldn't let her do anything so common as get converted. End of Book One, Chapter Five Book One, Chapter Six of A Woman of Genius by Mary Hunter Austin This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Book One, Chapter Six I was duly taken into the church on the following Sabbath, to the great relief of my family, having for once exhibited the normal reaction of a young person in my circumstances, and though I have laid much to the door of that institution of the retarding of my development, and the dimming of the delicate surface of happiness, I think now it was not wholly bad for me. If I hadn't up to this time found any way of being good by myself, I was now provided with a criterion of conduct toward which even those who hadn't been able to manage it for themselves moved a public approbation. I have heard my mother say that even Mr. Farley, the banker, who read books on evolution and was a free thinker, opprobrious term, had been known to pronounce the church an excellent thing for women. The church left you in no doubt about things. You attended morning and evening service, as soon as you were old enough for it, which was before you were fit. You taught in Sunday school. You waited on table at oyster suppers designed for the raising of the minister's salary and if you had any talent for it, you sang in the choir or recited things at the church sociables. And when you were married, and consequently middle-aged, you joined the WFMS and the Sewing Society. It was after the incident of the coal hole that I began to experience this easy irreproachability, and to build out of its ready-to-hand materials a sort of extra self, from which afterward to burst was the bitter wound of life. For my particular church went farther and provided a chart for all the by-lanes of behavior. You were never, said the evangelist, whose relish of the situation on the day that a score or so of us had renounced the devil in all his works gave me a vague sensation of having made a meal and licked his lips over us, you should never go anywhere that you could not take your Savior with you. And when I saw Cousin Judd wag at my mother and she smile and pat her hymn book, I was apprised that we had come to the root of the whole matter. I have wondered since to how many young converts in Ohioana that phrase has been handed out, and with what blighting consequences. For a Savior as I knew him at thirteen and a half was a solemn presence that ran in your mind with the bleakness of plain, whitewashed walls and hard benches and a general hush, a vague sensation of your chest being too tight for you, and a little of the feeling you had when you had gone to call at the Allinghams and had forgotten to wipe your feet. And it was manifest if you took that incubus everywhere you went you wouldn't have any fun. It was fortunate at the time that it was not the desire for entertainment that moved me so much as the need of my youth to serve, the unparented hunger for authority. But with the pressure of that environment, if there had been anybody with the wit to see where my gift lay, what anybody could have done about it, it is difficult to say. When all that Taylorville afforded of the proper food of gift, brightness, music, and the dance, was of so forlorn a quality, it has been a question if I do not owe the church some thanks for cutting out the possible cheapening of taste and the satisfaction of ill-regulated applause. That is, if gift can be hurt at all 
by what happens to the possessor. It can be cramped and enfeebled in expression, rendered tormenting in its passage and futile to the recipient. But to whom it comes, its supernal quality rises forever beyond all attainder. What happened to the actress during all the time I was undertaken by the church to be made into the sort of woman serviceable to Taylorville was inconsiderable. What grew out of it for Olivia was no small matter, and much of it I lay without bitterness to Cousin Judd, who from having got himself named adviser in my father's will was in a position to affect my life to the worse. And yet, in so far as I am not an unprecedented sport on the family tree, I had more in common with this shrewd-dealing, loud-praying, twice-removed soldier cousin than with any of my kin, though I should hardly say as much to him, for he has never been in a theater, and if he still considers me a hopeful subject for prayer, it is because his Christian duty rises superior to his conviction. He is pricked out in my earlier recollections by the difficulty he seems to have had in effecting a compromise between the traditional distrustfulness of the Ohiana farmer towards the powers in general, and particularly of the weather, and his obligation of Christian joy, and for a curious effect of not belonging to his wife, a large, uninteresting woman with the sense of her own merit which she never succeeded in imposing on anybody but Cousin Judd. She had a keen appreciation of worldly values, which led her always to select the best material for her clothes, and another feeling of their expensiveness, which resulted in her being always a little belated in the styles. She approved of religion, though not active in it, and in twenty years she and Cousin Judd had arrived at a series of compromises and excuses which enabled her to appear at church one Sunday in five and still keep up the interest of the clergyman and congregation as to why she didn't come the other four. Whenever the days were short or the roads too heavy, Cousin Judd would put up overnight at our house, and I remember how my mother would always be able to say, looking about the empty Democrat wagon, as though she expected her in ambush somewhere, "'And you didn't bring Lydia?' And Cousin Judd being able to reply to it as if it were something he had expected up to the last moment and had been keenly disappointed. "'Well, no, Lydia ain't feeling quite up to it,' which my mother received without skepticism. After this, they were free to talk of other things. What there was between Cousin Judd and me, with due allowance for the years, was a spark, the touch and go of vitality, that rose in me to a hundred beckonings of running flood and waving boughs, music and movement, and only the moral enthusiasms of war and religion raised through his heavy farmer stuff. We should have loved one another had we known how. As it was, all our intercourse was marked on his part by the gracelessness of rusticity and by the impertinence of adolescence on mine. I used regularly to receive his pious admonitions with what, for a Taylorville child, was flippancy. Nevertheless, there were occasions when we had set off of summer Sunday mornings together to early class, when the church was cool and dim and the smell of the honey locusts came in through the window, that I caught the thrill that ran from the pounding of his fist where he prayed at the other end of the long bench. And there was a kind of blessedness shed from him, as with closed eyes and lifted chin he swung from peak to peak of the splendid measure of how firm a foundation that I garnered up and hugged to myself in place of art and the joy of living. All of which was very good for me and might have answered if it had not come into Cousin Judd's head that he ought to overlook my reading." By this time I had worked through all my father's books, and was ready to satisfy the itch of imagination, even with the vicious inaccuracies of what was called Christian literature. 
The trouble all came, of course, of my not understanding the nature of a lie. Not that I couldn't tell a downright fib if I had to, or haven't on occasion. But a lie is to me just as silly a performance when it is about marriage or work as about the law of gravitation, and when it is presented to me in the form of human behavior, it makes me sick, like the smell of tuberoses in a closed room. And I failed utterly to realize then that there are a great many people capable of living sincerely and at the same time blandly misrepresenting the facts of life in the interests of what is called morality. I do not think it probable that Cousin Judd accepted for himself the rule of behavior prescribed by the books he recommended. I shall not tell you what they were, but if there are any Sunday school libraries in Ohiana, you will find them on the shelves. But I know that he and my mother esteemed them excellent for the young. So far as they thought of it at all, they believed that in surrounding me with intimations of a life in which there was nothing more important than settling with deity the minor details of living, and especially how much you would pay to his establishment, they had done their utmost to provide me with a life in which nothing more important could happen. If you were careful about reading the Bible and doing good to people, that is, persuading them to go to church and to leave off swearing, all the more serious details, such as making a living, marrying and having children, would take care of themselves. And the trouble was, as I have said, that I believed it. And that was how I found myself farthest from art and life at the time when I found myself a young lady. I had to make this discovery for myself, for there were no social occasions in Taylorville to give a term to your advent into the grown-up world, though there was a definite privilege which marked your achievement of it. There was a period prior to this in which you bumped against things you were too old for, and caroomed to the things for which you were quite too young, and about the end of your high school term, you had done with hair ribbons and begun to have company on your own account and the sort of things began to happen which marked the point beyond which, if you fell upon disaster, it was your own fault. They happened to me. By dint of my doing her compositions and of her doing my arithmetic, Pauline Allingham and I had managed to keep together all through the high school, and it was in our last year when we used to put in the long end of the afternoons at Pauline's playing croquet, that I first took notice of Tommy Bettersworth. The Bettersworth yard abutted on the Allinghams for the space of one woodshed and a horse chestnut tree, and it was along in October that I began to be aware that it was not altogether the view of the garden that kept Tommy on the woodshed or in the chestnut tree the greater part of the afternoon. It may be that the adventure with Charlie Gower had sharpened my perception. At any rate, it had aroused my discretion. I was carefully oblivious to the proximity of Tommy Bettersworth. But there came a day when Pauline was not, when she wanted to tell me something about Flora Haynes, which she was afraid he might overhear. "'Come around to the summer house,' she said. "'Tommy's always hanging about.' I can't think what makes him. Always, I suggested. Why, you know yourself he was there last Saturday and Thursday when we... Is he there when you and Flora are there, or only... Oh, Pauline gave a gasp. No, oh, I never thought. Olive, I do believe that's it. Well, what? It's you, Olive solemnly. It must be that he really is. Pauline's reading included more romance than mine. Well, he can't say I gave him any encouragement. Oh, of course not, darling. Pauline was sympathetic. You couldn't. It is so interesting. What would the girl say? <laughs> 
Pauline, if you ever, truly I never will, but just think. But we reckoned without Alfred Allingham. Alfred was not a nice boy at that age. He had come the way of curled darlings to be a sly, tail-bearing, offensive little cad, and the next Saturday, when Pauline turned him off the croquet ground for a ribaldry, he went as far as the rose border and jeered back at us. I know why you don't want me, he mocked. So's I can't see Olive and Tommy Bettersworth making eyes. He executed a jig to the tune of Olive's mad and I am glad and I know what'll please her. At this juncture, the wrist and hand of Tommy Bettersworth appeared over the partition fence armed with horse chestnuts which thudded with precision on the offensive person of Alfred Allingham. Pauline and I escaped to the summer house. I thought I was going to cry until I found I was giggling, at which I was so mortified that I did cry. He'll tell everybody in school, I protested. What do you care? soothed Pauline. Besides, you have to be teased about somebody you know, and have somebody to choose you when they play clap in and clap out. You just have to. Look at me. Pauline had been carrying on the discreetest of flirtations with Henry Glave for some months. Tommy Bettersworth is a nice boy, and besides, dear, we'll have so much more in common. Pauline was right, and thus you had somebody to be teased about, you were really not in things. I was furiously embarrassed by it, but I was resigned. Tommy sent me two notes that winter and a silk handkerchief for Christmas, which I pretended was from Pauline. I am not going to be blamed for this. It was at least a month earlier that I had observed Tommy Bettersworth's inability to get away from Niles Corner on his way home from school until I had passed there on mine. It struck me as a very interesting trait of masculine character. I would have liked to talk it over with my mother on the plane of human interest. It seemed possible she might have noted similar eccentricities. I remember I worked around to it Saturday morning when I was helping her to darn the tablecloths. My mother was not unprepared. She did her duty by me as it was conceived in Taylorville and did it promptly. You are too young to be thinking about the boys, she said. I don't want to hear you talking about such things until the time comes. This was so much in line with what was expected of parents that I blinked the obvious retort that the time for talking about such things was when they began to happen, and went on with the tablecloths. But I couldn't tell her about the handkerchief after that. It would have been positively unmaidenly. And after he had sent me a magnificent paper-laced valentine, I distinctly encouraged Tommy Bettersworth. This being the case, I do not know just how it began to be conveyed to me, as in the lengthening evenings of spring, Tommy took to church-going, that his hands were coarse and his ears too prominent, and as I confided solemnly to Pauline, though I had the greatest respect for his character, I simply couldn't bear to have him about. This was the more singular, since the church-going was the visible sign of the good influence that, according to the books, I was exercising. And though Tommy was as nearly inarticulate as was natural, I was in no doubt on whose account this new start proceeded. If I had not disliked Tommy very much at this period, why should I have taken to tucking myself between Forrester and Effie on the way home, embarrassedly aware of Tommy, whose way did not lie in our direction, scuffling along with the Lawrences on the other side of the street? I seemed to remember some rather heroic attempts on Tommy's part to account for his presence there on the ground of wanting to speak privately to Forrester, certain shouts and sallies toward which my brother displayed a derisive consciousness of their not being pertinent to the occasion. 
I have often wondered how much of these tentative ventures toward an altered relation were observed by our elders. Not much, I should think. At any rate, no mollifying word drifted down from their heights of experience to our shallows of self-consciousness. My mother adhered to her notion of my not being at an age for such things. Worn out, I believe, by the consensus of paternal opinion that she might too easily put notions in my head. Not inquiring what notions might, by the natural process of living, be already there. Perhaps they were not altogether wrong in this. So delicate is the process of sex development that nature herself obscures the processes. To this day, I do not know how much my taking suddenly to going home with Belle Ensley by a shortcut was embarrassment, and how much a discreet feminine awareness that in my absence Tommy would better manage to make the family take his walking with them as a matter of course. But I remember that I cried when my mother, who did not approve of Belle Ensley, scolded me. And then quite suddenly came the click and the loosened tension of the readjustment. Along about Easter, Alfred Allingham told Pauline that Tommy had thrashed Charlie Gower, and though it was supposed to be the strictest secret, it was because Charlie had teased him about me. Pauline was rather scandalized by my insistence that Charlie wouldn't have done it if Tommy hadn't rather conspicuously brought it on himself. I call it truly noble of him, like a knight. Pauline could always throw the glamour of her reading around the immediate circumstance. At any rate, after this, you can't do anything less than treat him politely, she urged. Whether it would have made any difference in my attitude or not, it did in Tommy's. I saw that when he came out of the church with us next Sunday. There was a certain aggressive maleness in the way he strode beside me that there was no mistaking. I looked about rather feebly for Belle. I don't see her anywhere, Tommy assured me. Besides, we don't want her. As I could see Tommy in the light that streamed from the church windows, it occurred to me that if he was not good-looking, he certainly looked good, and he had a mustache coming. Forrester, who was going through a phase himself, had gone home with Amy Lawrence. Effie lagged behind with Mother, talking to Mrs. Ensley about the prospects of the sewing society raising the money for repainting the parsonage. Looking back to see what had become of them, I tripped on the boardwalk. "'If you would take my arm,' suggested Tommy. I was aware of the sleeve of his coat under my fingers. The next turn took us out of sound of the voices. The street lamps flared far apart in the long, quiet avenue. The shed pods of the maple slipped and popped under us with the sweet smell of the sap. "'How did you like the sermon?' Tommy wished to know. What I had to say of it was probably not very much to the point. No one overtook us as we walked. There was a sense of tremendous occasions in the air, of things accomplished. I had established the privilege. I was walking home from church with a young man. I was a young lady. End of Book One Chapter Six Book One, Chapter Seven of A Woman of Genius by Mary Hunter Austin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Book One, Chapter Seven. As often as I think of Olivia Lattimore growing up, I have wondered if there was really no evidence of dramatic talent about, or simply no one able to observe it. There was no theater at Taylorville, and when from time to time third-rate stock companies performed in different plays at the town hall, Foray and Effie and I heard nothing of them except that they were presumably wicked. Occasionally, there were amateur performances in which 
when I had won a grudging consent to take part, I failed to distinguish myself. Effie had a very amusing trick of mimicry, and if you had heard her recite, Curfew shall not ring tonight, you would have thought that the gift, on its way from whatever high and unknowable source, in passing her, had lighted haphazard on the most unlikely instrument. I was not even clever at my books, except by starts and flashes. I graduated at the high school with Pauline, and afterward we had two years together at Montecito. This was the town next to Taylorville, and its bitter rival. Montecito had a young ladies' seminary, a business college, and the state institution for the blind, for which Taylorville so little forgave it that the new railroad was persuaded to leave Montecito four miles to the right and make its junction with the L and C at Taylorville. This carried the farmer shipping away from Montecito, but the victory was not altogether scatheless. Young ladies were still obliged to go to the seminary, and it enabled Montecito to put on the air of having retired from the vulgar competition of trade and become the Athens of the West. Pauline and I went over to school on Mondays and home on Fridays. The course of study was for three years, but because there was Effie to think of and my mother's means were limited, I had only two, and was never able to catch up with Pauline by the length of that extra year. She was always holding it out against me in extenuation and excuse. When she tried to account for my marriage having turned out so badly on the ground of my not having had advantages, I knew she was thinking of Montecito. She thinks of it still, I imagine, to condone as she does, I am sure, with an adorable womanliness, what in my conduct she no longer feels able to countenance. And yet I hardly know what I might have drawn from that third year more than I took away from the other two, which was, besides the regular course of study, an acquaintance with the style of furnishings not all gilt wallpaper and plush brocade, and a renewed taste for good reading. They made such a point of good reading at the seminary that I have always thought it a pity they could not go a little farther and make a practice of it. The difficulty with most of our reading was that it had no relativity to the processes of life in Ohiana. We had things as far removed from it as Dante and Euripides, things no nearer than the Scarlet Letter and David Copperfield, from which to draw for the exigencies of Taylorville was to cause my mother to wonder, with tears in her eyes, why in the world I couldn't be like other people. I read... I gorged, in fact, on the best books, but I found it more convenient to go on living by the shallow priggishness of Cousin Judd's selection. All that splendid stream poured in upon me and sank and lost itself in the shifty undercurrent that made still, by times, distracting eddies on the surface of adolescence. But whatever was missed or misunderstood of its evidences, the gift worked at the bottom, throve like a sea anemone under the shallows of girlishness, and nourished by the unsuspected means, was the source, no doubt, of the live resistance I opposed to all that grew out of Forrester's making a vocation of being a good son. I do not know yet how to deal with sufficient tenderness, and without exasperation, with the disposition of widowed women, bred to dependence, to build out of their sons the shape of a man proper to be leaned upon. It is so justified in sentiment, so pretty to see in its immediate phases, that though my mother was young and attractive enough to have married again, it was difficult not to concur in her making a virtue, a glorification of living entirely in her boy. I seem to remember a time before Forey was intrigued by the general appreciation when it required some coercion to present him always in the character of the most dutiful son. He hadn't, for instance, invariably fancied himself setting out for prayer meetings with my mother's hymn-book and umbrella, but the second summer after my father died, 
when he had worked on Cousin Judd's farm and brought home his wages, found him completely implicated. We were really not so poor there was any occasion for this, but Mother was so delighted with the idea of a provider, and Forrester was so pleased with the picture of himself in that capacity, that it was all, no doubt, very good for him. He always did bring home his wages after that, which led to his being consulted about meals, and the new curtains for the dining-room, and to being met in the evening as though all the house had been primed for his return, with merely gone on in that expectation while he was away. Effie, I know, had no difficulty in accepting him as the excuse for any amount of household ritual, making a fuss about his birthdays and trying on her new clothes for his approval. But Effie was five years younger than Forrester, and I was only twenty-two months. It was more, I think, than our community in the gaucheries and hesitancies of youth that disinclined me to take seriously my brother's opinions on window curtains and to sniff at my mother's affectionate pretense of his being the head of the family. At times, when I felt this going on in our house, there rose up like a wisp of fog between me and the glittering promise of the future, a kind of horror of the destiny of women. To defer and adjust, to maintain the attitude of acquiescence toward opinions and capabilities that had nothing more to recommend them than merely that they were a man's. I could be abased, I should be delighted to be imposed upon, but if I paid out self-immolation, I wanted something for my money, and I didn't consider I was getting it with my brother for whom I smuggled notes and copied compositions. It never occurred to my mother, until it came to the concrete question of spending money, that there was anything more than a kind of natural perverseness in my attitude, which only served to throw into relief the satisfactoriness of her relations to her son. Forrester, it appeared, was to have an allowance, and I wanted one too. But what, said my mother tolerantly, for she had not yet thought of granting it, would you do with an allowance? Whatever Forrester does. But Forrester, my mother explained, waving the stocking she had stretched upon her hand, is a boy, I expostulated. What has that got to do with it? Olivia! The ridiculousness of having such a question addressed to her brought a smile to my mother's lips, which hung fixed there as I saw her mind back away suddenly in fear that I was really going to insist on knowing what that had to do with it. I give you twenty-five cents a week for church money, she parried weakly. That's what you think I ought to give. I want an allowance, and then I can deny myself and give what I like. Forrester earns his, said my mother. She hadn't, of course, meant the discussion to get on to a basis of reasonableness. Well, I threatened, I'll earn mine. That was really what did the business in the end. All the boys in Taylorville worked as soon as they were old enough. But it was the last resort of poverty that girls should be put to wages. Before that possibility, my mother retreated into amused indulgence. She paid me my allowance, appreciably less than my brother's, on the first of the month, with the air of concurring in a joke which I think now must have covered some vague hurt at my want of sympathy with the beautiful fiction of Forrester's growing up to take my father's place with her. They had achieved by the time Forrester was twenty what passed for perfect confidence between them, though it was at the cost of Forrester's living shallowly or not at all in the courts of boyhood which my mother was unable to re-enter, and her voluntary withdrawal from varieties of experience from which his youth prevented him. My mother always thought it was made up to her in affection. What came out of it for Forrester is still on the knees of the gods. I began to say how it was that the gift 
took care of itself while Forrester was engrossing the family attention. He had had a year at the business college in Montecito, which was considered quite sufficient, and rather more, in fact, than his accepted vocation as the support of his mother seemed to call for. Any question that might naturally come up of a profession for him seemed to have been quashed beforehand by the general notion of an immediate salary as the means to that end. I do not recall a voice lifted on behalf of a life of his own. He had worked up from driving the delivery wagon in vacations to being dry goods clerk at the cooperative, where his affability and easy familiarity with the requirements of women made him immensely popular. Everybody liked to trade with Forrester because he took such pains in matching things, and he was such a good boy to his mother. He paid the largest portion of his salary for his board and took Effie, who adored him, about with him. I don't mean to say that he was not also good friends with Olivia, or that there was anything which prevented my doing my best with the three chocolate layer cakes and the angel's food I made for his party on his twenty-first birthday. The real unpleasantness on that occasion came of my mother's notion of distinguishing it among all other birthdays by paying over to Forrester a third of the not very considerable sum left by my father, derived chiefly from his back pay as an officer, which he had always held as particularly set aside for us children. It was owing, perhaps, to a form of secretiveness that an unprotected woman does duty for caution, that Effie and I had scarcely heard of this sum until it was flourished before us on the day before the birthday, much as if it had been my father's sword, supposing the occasion to have required it being girded on his son. Forrester was to have a third of that money in the form of a check under his plate on the morning of his birthday. Effie and I did full justice to the magnificence of the proposal. I was beating the whites of thirteen eggs by Pauline's recipe for angel food. Mine called for only eleven, and Effie was rubbing up Mrs. Enslay's spoons, which had been borrowed for the party. I was always happier in the kitchen than in any room of the house with its plain tinted walls, the plain painted woodwork, the parlor was hideously grained, and the red of Effie's geraniums at the window ledge. The stir of domesticity, all this talk of my father, intrigued me for the moment into the sense of being a valued and intrinsic part of the family. His father would have wanted Forrester to have that money, said my mother, now that he's of age. And when, I question raised by the mention of thirds to the joyous inclusion, are Effie and I to have ours? Oh, my mother's interest waned, when you are married, perhaps. It had grown in my mind as I spoke that I had been of age now more than a year and nothing had come of it. The suggestion that my father could have taken a less active interest in the event on my behalf pressed upon a dying sensibility. I resented his being so committed to this posthumous slight and meant to defend him from it. He'd have wanted me to have mine on my birthday, the same as Forrester, I insisted. Oh, Olivia! My mother's tone intimated annoyance at my claim to being supported by my father in my absurdities, but her good humor was proof against it. Girls have theirs when they are married, she soothed. I held up the platter and whisked the stiff froth with the air of doing these things very dexterously. I wasn't going to admit, by taking it seriously, that my brother's coming of age was any more important than mine. But I spare you the flippancies by which I covered the hurt of realizing that to everybody except myself it was. "'It is so like you, Olivia,' said my mother with tears in her eyes to want to spoil everything. What I had really spoiled was the free exercise of partiality by which she was enabled to distinguish Forrester over her other children according to her sense of his deserts. And besides, what in the world would the child do with all that money?' 
The same thing that Forrester does, I maintained, and then quickly to forestall another objection which I saw rising in her face. If you were old enough to be married at nineteen, I guess I am old enough to be trusted with a few hundred dollars. But there I had struck again on the structure of tradition that kept Taylorville from direct contact with the issues of life. Anybody was old enough to be married at eighteen, but money was a serious matter. Whenever I said things like that, I could see my mother waver between a shocked wonder at having produced such unnaturalness and the fear that somebody might overhear us. And I didn't know myself what I wanted with that money, except that I craved the sense of being important that went with the possession of it. And, of course, now that I had been refused it on the ground of sex, it was part of the general resistance that I opposed to things as they were, to have it on principle. Just when I had mother almost convinced that she ought to give it to me, she made it nearly impossible for me to accept by asking Forrester what she ought to do about it. When I had demanded it as evidence of my taking rank with my brother as a personage, it was insufferable that it should come to me as a concession of his amiability. What I really wanted, of course, was to have it put under my plate with an affectionate speech about its being the legacy of a soldier and the witness of his integrity, coupled with the hope that I would spend it in a manner to give pleasure to my dear father, who was no doubt looking on at this happy incident. There was nothing in me then, there is nothing now, which advised me of being inappropriately the object of such an address, or my replying to it as gallantly as the junior clerk of the cooperative. To do Forrester justice, he came out squarely on the question of my being entitled to the money if he was, but he contrived backhandedly to convey his sense of my obtuseness in not deferring sentimentally to a male ascendancy that I did not intrinsically feel and I can go back now to these disquieting episodes as the beginning of that maladjustment of my earlier years in not having a man about toward whom I could actually experience the deference I was expected to exhibit. Well, I had my check for the same amount and on the same occasion as my brother's, but the feeling in the air of its being merely a concession to my forwardness prevented me from making any return for it that interfered with Forrester's carrying off the situation of coming into his father's legacy on coming of age, quite to my mother's satisfaction. What it might have made for graciousness for once in my life to have been the center of that dramatic affectionateness, I can only guess. Firm in the determination that since no sentiment went to its bestowal, None should go to its acknowledgment. I carried my check upstairs and shook all of the rugs out of the window to account for my eyes being red at ten o'clock in the morning. And that was the way the powers took to provide against the complete submergence of the actress and the young lady. For though it turned out that I did spend the greater part of the money on my wedding clothes, a portion of it went for the only technical training I ever had. The real business of a young lady in Taylorville was getting married, but to avoid an obviousness in the interim, she played the piano or painted on satin or became interested in missions. If my money had fallen in eight months earlier, I should undoubtedly have spent it on the third year at Montecito. As it was, I decided to study allocution. It appeared a wholly fortuitous choice. I was not supposed to have any talent for it, but I burned to spend some of my money sensibly, and it was admittedly sensible for a young lady to take lessons in something. Effie was having music. Flora Haynes painted plaques. When Olivia joined Professor Winter's elocution classes at Temperance Hall, Mother said it looked like throwing money away, but of course I could teach in case anything happened which meant in case of my not being married or being left a widow with young children, 
Professor Winter was the kind of man who would have collected patch boxes and painted miniatures on ladies' fans. Not that he could have done anything of the sort on his income, but it would have suited the kind of man he was. He had small, neat ways and nice little tricks of discrimination, and microscopic enthusiasms that hovered and fluttered, enough of them when it came to the rendering of a favorite passage, to produce a kind of haze of appreciation like a swarm of midgets. Not being able to afford patch boxes or Louis the Fifteenth enamels, he collected accents instead. The man's memory for phonic variations was extraordinary. All our accustomed speech was a wild garden over which he took little flights and drops and humming poses, extracting, as it were, by sips, your private history. Things you would have probably told for the asking, but objected to having rested from your betraying tongue. He would come teetering forward on his neat little boots, upon the toes of which he appeared to elevate himself, by pressing the tips of his fingers very firmly together, and when you committed yourself no farther than to remark on the state of the weather, or the election outlook, he would want to know if you hadn't spent some time of your youth in the South, or if it was your maternal or paternal grandfather who was Norwegian, either of which would be true and annoying particularly as you weren't aware of speaking other than the rest of the world, for if there was anything quite and completely abhorrent to the Taylorville mind, it was the implication of being different from other Taylorvillians. Somewhere the professor had picked up an adequate theory and practice of voice production, though I never knew anything of his training except that he had been an instructor in a normal school and was aggrieved at his dismissal. After he had advertised himself as open for private instruction and try weekly classes at Temperance Hall, there was something almost like a concerted effort at keeping him in the town because of the credit he afforded us against Montecito. With the exception of a much whiskered personage who came over from the business college in the winter to conduct evening classes in penmanship, he was the only man addressed habitually as professor and the only one who wore evening dress at public functions. His dress coat imparted a particular touch of elegance to occasions when he gave readings from Evangeline and the Lady of the Lake, Taylorville choice, and thoroughly discredited a disgruntled Montesetan who, on the basis of having been to Chicago on his wedding trip, insisted that such were only worn by waiters in hotels. It would be interesting to record that Professor Winter lent himself with alacrity to the unfolding of my gift, but, in fact, his imagination hardly strayed so far. He taught phonics and voice production, and taught them very well. Probably he had no more practical acquaintance with the stage than I had. Certainly he never suggested it for me, and for my part I could hardly have explained why, with so little encouragement, I was so devoted to the rather tedious drill. Pauline was still at the seminary, and the regular hours of practice made a bulwark against an insidious proprietary air which Tommy Bettersworth began to wear. Besides the voice training, I had a system of physical culture, artificial and unsound as I have since learned, but serving to restrain my too exuberant gesture, and much memorizing of poems and plays for practice work. I hardly know if the professor had any dramatic talent or not. Probably not, as he made nothing, I remember, of stopping me in the middle of a great passion for the sake of a dropped consonant and deprecated original readings on my part. It was his relish for musical cadence as much as its intellectual appreciation, that led him to select the Elizabethan drama, in the great scenes of which I was letter-perfect by the time I had come to the end of the professor's instruction, and at the end, too, it seemed, of my devices for dodging the destiny of women. End of Book One, Chapter Seven
Book One, Chapter Eight of A Woman of Genius by Mary Hunter Austin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Book One, Chapter Eight. I have tried to sketch to you how in Taylorville we were allowed to stumble on the grown up consciousness of sex, but I can give you no idea of the extent to which we were prevented from the grown up judgment. Somewhere between the ages of sixteen and eighteen, one was loosed on a free and lively social intercourse, from which one was expected to emerge later, triumphantly mated. This was obligatory. Otherwise your family sighed and said that somehow Olivia didn't seem to know how to catch a husband, and then painstakingly refrained from the subject in your presence. Or your mother, if she was particularly loyal, said she had always thought there was no call for a girl to marry if she didn't feel to want to. But anything resembling maternal interference in your behalf was looked upon as worldly minded or, at the least, unnecessary. The custom of chaperonage was unheard of. Girls were supposed to be trusted. I do not recall now that I ever had any particular instruction as to how to conduct myself toward young men, except that they were never on any account to take liberties. Whatever else went to the difficult business of mating, you were supposed to pick up. That I did not pass through this period in entire obliviousness was due to Pauline, who had the keenest appreciation of her effect on the opposite sex. She was the sort of girl who is described as having always had a great deal of attention. She had a nice procrustean notion of the sort of young man to be engaged to. Our maiden imagination hardly went farther than that and her young ladyhood appeared to be a process of trying it on the greatest possible number of eligible Taylorvillians. When she came home from Montecito, she had already met Henry Mills at the house of a roommate where she had spent the Easter vacation, and he had sent her flowers at commencement and verses of his own composition. It was Pauline who explained to me that unless I had some young man like Tommy Bettersworth, who could be counted on, I could hardly hope to be in things. When they made up a party to go sleighing, for instance, or a picnic to Wilsden Lake, I liked being in things and did not altogether dislike Tommy Bettersworth. He was a thoroughly credible beau and required very little handling, for even as early as that I had an inkling of what I have long since concluded that a man who requires overmuch to be played and baited, held off and on, is rather poor game after you have got him. It worried Polly not a little that I forgave Tommy so lightly for small offenses. She was afraid it might appear that I liked him too much, when, in truth, it was only that I liked him too little. And for complacence, if I had had any disposition toward it, I was saved by the shocking example of Forrester, all of whose relations were tinged by his vocation of model son. He had acquired by this time a manner, by the intimacy greater than is common in boys, with which he lived into the feminine life of the household, and by his daily performance of measuring off petticoats and matching hose, which admitted him to families where we visited, on a footing that enabled him to flirt with the daughters under the very apron strings of their mothers. You couldn't somehow maintain a strict virginal severity with a young man who had just taken an informed and personal interest in your mother's flannelette wrappers, the credit of whose dutifulness was a warrant for his not meaning anything in particular. In short, for a spooned. I think now there was some excuse for him. He had been wrenched very early by his affections from the normal outbreaks of adolescence. He had never, to my knowledge, been out with the boys. Unless he got it in the business of junior clerk at the cooperative, he could hardly be said to have a male life at all. He was being shaped 
to a man's performance at the expense of his mannishness. But against his philandering rose up not only the fastidiousness of girlhood, but some latent sense of rightness, as keen in me as the violinist for the variation of tone, something that questioned the justice of pronouncing thoroughly moral, a young man who, if he never went over the brink, was willing to spend a considerable portion of his time on the edge of it. I should have admired Forrester more at this juncture if he had been a little wild, and I knew perfectly that my mother would have interdicted any social life for me whatever if I had permitted a tithe of the familiarities allowed to my brother. Among the other things which a girl was expected to pick up, along with the art of attracting a husband, was the vital information with which she was expected to meet the occasion of marrying one. It was all a part of the general assumption of the truth as something not suitable for the young to know, that nobody told us any of these things if they could help it. I do not mean to say that there was not a certain amount of half-information whispered about among the girls, who, by the avidity for such whisperings, established themselves as not quite nice. But Pauline Allingham and I were nice girls. What this meant was that nothing that pertained to the mystery of marriage reached us through all the suppression and evasions of the social conspiracy, except the obviousness of maternity. I remember how intimations of it, as part of our legitimate experience, began to grow upon us with a profound and tender curiosity toward very young children, and, particularly on Pauline's part, a great shyness of being seen in their company. But we were not expected to possess ourselves of accurate information until we were already involved in it. We had reached the age when matrons no longer avoided references to its most conspicuous phases in our presence, before we found words for mentioning it to one another. There was a young aunt of Pauline's lent something to that. She was a sister of Mr. Allingham, come to stay with them while her husband was absent somewhere in the West. Pauline told me about it one of the weekends she spent at home from Montecito. This was Saturday afternoon, and she had found the aunt in the house on her return the evening before. "'Do you know,' she said, it is very queer the way I feel about Aunt Alice. The way she is, you know. Mama hadn't told me, and when I came into the sitting room and saw her, I thought I was going to cry. And it wasn't that I was sorry either. I'm awfully fond of her. I just felt it. Yes, I know, I admitted. Aunt Alice is so sensible, Pauline explained a few weeks later. She talks to me a great deal. She's only a few years older than I am. She has shown me all her things for the baby. Mama didn't think she ought. You know how mothers are. They're in the bureau drawer in the best room. I'll show them to you sometime. Alice won't mind. Alice didn't mind, it appeared, so it must have been shyness that led us to select the afternoon when the married women were away and though I cannot forgive the conditions which led us so surreptitiously to touch the fringe of the great experience, I own still to some tenderness for the two girls with their heads together that bright hot afternoon over the bureau drawer in Mrs. Allingham's best room. Pauline showed me a little sack which she had crocheted. Mother thought I was too young, but Alice said I might. You must have liked to awfully, I envied. That's one of the nice things about having children, I should think. Pauline fingered a hemstitched slip. You can make things for them. Which would you rather have, boys or girls? I hazard. Oh, girls, you can always dress them so prettily. But boys, they can do so many things when they grow up. I felt rather strongly on that point. Alice says, Pauline folded the little frock, that she's so glad to have it she doesn't care which it is. Something perhaps an echo of my mother's experience pricked in me. They aren't always as glad as that. 
I suppose not. Alice is having this one because she wants it. We looked at one another. We would have liked to have spoken further, to have defined ourselves, despoiled ourselves of tenderness, nobilities, but around the whole subject lay the blank expanse of our ignorance. We locked the drawer again and went out and played croquet. And that was how we stood toward our normal destiny that summer, when Pauline was wondering if Henry Mills meant to propose to her, and I was wondering how much longer I could keep Tommy Bettersworth from proposing to me. I managed to stave it off until the end of September. On the 22nd of that month, there was a picnic at Wilsden Lake. There were ten couples of us and Flora Haynes, who was wanted to count even with a young man who was to join us at the lake, a stranger to most of us, nephew to one of the wealthiest farmers in the township. We had always wished there might have been young people at the Garrett farm, and there was some talk of this nephew, who was to come on a visit, being adopted. Some of our brothers had made his acquaintance, and Pauline, who had met him at Montecito, had warranted him as interesting. I believe Flora Haynes was invited to pair with him because every girl felt that Flora would be eminently safe to trust her own young man to in the event of Helmuth Garrett proving more worth while. Henry Mills, who was reading law at the county seat of the adjoining county, had come over for the picnic and was expected to bring matters to a crisis with Pauline, and Forrester had a day off to take Belle Ensley, who was at the point of pitying him, because, though he had such an affectionate disposition, so long as his mother depended on him, he couldn't think of marrying. We had no chaperone, of course. Several of the couples were engaged, and there were brothers. We wouldn't have to put up with the implication that we were not able to manage by ourselves. It was the sort of day, soft Indian summer, painted woodlands, gossamer glinting high in the windless air, on which Forrester found it necessary to hope brotherly that I should be able to get through it without being silly. By that he meant that the submerged Olivia, however interestingly she might read in a book, was highly incomprehensible and nearly always ridiculous to her contemporaries. Wilsden Lake was properly a drainage pond of four or five acres in extent, drawn like a bow about the contour of two hills. Water lilies grew at the head where a stream came in, and muskrats built at the lower end. The picnic ground was in the hollow between the two hills, by a spring, where the grass grew smooth, like a lawn to the roots of oaks burning blood red from leaf to leaf. As it turned out, though, we put off lunch for him for an hour. Young Mr. Garrett did not come. And as the party sat about on the mossy hummocks in the quiet of repletion, I thought nothing could be so much worth while as to leave Tommy in care of Flora Haynes and get away into the woods by myself. The soul of the weather had got into my soul, and I felt I should discredit myself with Forrester if I stayed. There was a little footpath that led down by a rill to the lake, and as I took it, there was scarcely a sound louder than the soft down rustle of the painted leaves. There were two or three old boats, half waterlogged, tied at the head of the lake, and one of these I found and paddled across to the opposite bank. I had not known there was a path there opening from the dewberry bushes that dipped along the border, but the spirit in my feet answered to its invitation. I followed it up the hill through the leaf drift that heaped whispering in the smoky wood. I spread out my arms as I went and began to move to the rhythm of chanted verse. Where the red and gold and russet banners brushed me, I was touched delicately as with flame. I had on a very pretty dress that day, I remember, a thin organdy with a leaf pattern made up over yellow sateen, and the consciousness of suitability worked happily on my mind. At the top of the hill I struck into an old wood road 
where it passed through a grove of young hickory, blazing yellow like a host. Here I went slowly and dropped the chanting to the measure of classic English verse. It was the only means of expression Taylorville had provided me. Scene after scene I went through happy and oblivious. I had been at it half an hour, perhaps, moving forward with the natural impetus of the play in the faint old wagon tracks, and has got as far as flowers that affrighted she let fall from dis wagon. When I was startled by the clapping of hands, and looked up to see a young man sitting on the top of a rail fence that ran straight across the way, as though he might have stopped there to rest in the act of climbing over. "'I knew you would see me the next minute,' he said, "'and I wanted to be discovered in the act of appreciation.' He sprang down from the fence and came toward me, taking off his hat. "'I suppose you are from the picnic?' I expected to find you somewhere about. I am Helmuth Garrett. There at the spring, we waited lunch for you. I am Miss Lattimore, Olivia May, I supplemented. I was a little doubtful about that point, for at Taylorville we called one another by our first names. I was pleased with the swiftness with which he struck upon a permissible compromise. I owe you all sorts of apologies, Miss Olivia, but the mare I was to ride went lame and Uncle couldn't spare me another, so I had an early lunch at the house and walked over. As he stood looking down at me, I saw that he had a crop of unruly dark hair and what there was in his face that Pauline had found interesting. He wore a soft red tie knotted loosely at the collar of a white flannel shirt and for the rest of him was dressed very nice as other young men. All at once a spark of irrepressible friendliness flashed up in smiles between us. It seemed the merest chance, then, that I had come across the wood to meet him. In the light of what has happened since, I see that the guardian of my submerged self was doing what it could for me, but against the embattled social forces of Taylorville, what could even the gods do? If you will take me to the others, he suggested, I can make my excuses, and then we can talk. It was remarkable, I thought, that he should have discovered so early that we would wish to talk. We began to move in the direction of the lake. Were you doing a play? he asked. I nodded. How long were you watching me? Since you passed the plum brush yonder, it was bully. Are you going on the stage? I explained about Professor Winter and the elocution lessons. They don't approve of the stage in Taylorville, I finished, touched by the vanishing trace of a realization that up to this moment the objection would have been stated personally. And with all your talent. Oh, I know what I'm saying. I lived in Chicago four years and saw a lot of the theater. He began to talk to me of the stage, probably much of it neither informed nor profitable, but I had never heard it talked of before in unembarrassed relevancy to living, and he had that trick of speech that goes with the achieving propensity of accelerating his own energy as he talked, so that its backwater fairly floated us into the ease of intimacy. There was no doubt we were tremendously pleased with one another. I was throbbing still with the measure of verse and moved half trippingly to the rhythm of my blood. Do you dance, too? What went with that implied something personal and complimentary. Oh, no, a few steps I've picked up at school. That's another of the things we don't approve at Taylorville. I say what a lot of old mossbacks there must be about here anyway. Take my uncle now. He went on to tell me how he had tried to induce his uncle, who could afford it, to advance the money for technical training and engineering. Uncle Garrett was of the opinion that Helmuth would do better to get a job with some good man and pick up things 
always managed to get along by rule of thumb himself, said the nephew, and thinks all the rest of us ought to. I said, how would it be with the doctor now just to scramble up his medicine? But you can't get through to my uncle. He thinks a man who can run a thrashing machine is an engineer. I remember that we found it necessary to sit down on the slope of the hill toward the pond while he sketched for me his notion of what an engineer's career might be. But you've got to have technical training, got to. Talk about rule of thumb, it's like going at it with no thumbs at all. In the midst of this, we remembered that we ought to be looking for the rest of the picnickers. Once in the boat, however, there was a muskrat's nest, which, as something new to him, had to be poked into, and we stopped to gather lilies, which I could not have done by myself without wetting my dress. When we came at last to the spring, we found the lunch baskets huddled under the oak and nobody about. I think we must have been very far gone by this time in the young rapture of intimacy. The wood was smokily still, and we scuffed great heaps of the leaves together as we walked about pretending to look for the others. I remember it seemed a singular flame-touched circumstance that the leaves flew up from under our feet and fell lightly on our faces and our hair. I suppose we can't help finding them. The wonder is they haven't been spoiling our good talk before now. Oh, I protested, if you hadn't been coming to look for them, you wouldn't have met me. And now that we have met, we are going to keep on. I'm coming to see you. May I? If you care so much. A little spiral of wind rising fountain-wise out of the breathlessness whirled up a smother of brightening leaves. It caught my skirts and whipped them against his knees. It seemed to have blown our hands together, too, though I'm at a loss to know how that was. Care, he said, if I care. Oh, you beauty, you wonder. All at once he had kissed me. The electric moment hung in the air, poised, took flight upward in dizzying splendor. Suddenly from within the wood came a little snigger of laughter. End of Book One, Chapter Eight Book One, Chapter Nine of A Woman of Genius by Mary Hunter Austin this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Book One, Chapter Nine I do not know how long it took for the certainty that I had been kissed by an utter stranger in the presence of the entire picnic to work through the singing flames in which that kiss had wrapped me. We must have walked on almost immediately in the direction of the snigger, I remember a kind of clutch of my spirit toward the mere mechanical act of walking to hold me fast to the time and place from which there was an inward rush to escape. We walked on. They were all sitting together under a bank of hazel, and the girls' laps were filled with the brown clusters. Out of my whirling dimness I heard Helmuth Garrett explaining, as I introduced him, how he had come across me in the wood looking for them. And, of course, suggested Charlie Gower, in such good company, you weren't in a hurry about looking for the rest of us. I remembered the asparagus bed and was glad I had slapped him. No, my companion looked him over very coolly. Now that I've seen some of the rest of you, I'm glad I didn't hurry. Plainly, it wasn't going to do to try to take it out of Helmuth Garrett. As we began by common consent to move back to the spring, Forrester drew me by the arm behind the hazel. He was divided between a brotherly disgust at my lapse and delight to have caught the prim Olivia tripping. Well, he exclaimed, you have done it. Considering what I knew of Forrester's affairs, this was unbearable. Oh, it isn't for you to talk, 
What I want to know is whether I am to thrash him or not. Thrash him, I wondered. Forgetting you talked about, off there in the woods all afternoon. We weren't, I began, but suddenly I saw the white bowls of the sycamores redden with the westering sun. We must have been three hours covering what was at most a half hour's walk. Don't be vulgar, Forrester, I went on with my chin in the air. Oh, well, was my brother's parting shot. I don't know as I ought to make any objection, seeing you didn't. That, I felt, was the weakness of my position. I not only hadn't made any objection, I hadn't felt any shame. The annoyance, the hurt of outraged maidenliness, whatever was the traditional attitude, hadn't come. Inwardly I burned with the woods of fire, the red west, the white star like a torch that came out above it. On the way home, Helmuth Garrett rode with us as far as the main road and was particularly attentive to Pauline and Flora Haynes. I remember it came to me dimly that there was something designedly protective in this. There was more or less veiled innuendo flying about, which failed to get through to me. Pauline put it quite plainly for me when she came to talk things over the day after the picnic. She was sympathetic. Oh, my dear, it must be dreadful for you, she cooed. A perfect stranger and getting you talked about that way. So I am talked about? My dear, what could you expect? And in plain sight of us, if you had only pushed him away or something. I couldn't, I said. I was so astonished. In the night, I had found myself explaining to Pauline how this affair of Helmuth Garrett had differed importantly from all similar instances. Now I saw its shining surfaces dimmed with comment like unwiped glass. That's just what I said. Pauline was pleased with herself. I told Belle Ensley you weren't used to that sort of thing. You were completely overcome. But, of course, he wasn't really a gentleman, or he wouldn't have done it. I do not know why, at this moment, it occurred to me that probably Henry Mills hadn't proposed to Pauline after all. But before I could frame a discreet question, she was off in another direction. What will Tommy Bettersworth say? Why, what has he got to do with it? Olivia, after the way you've encouraged him. You mean because I went to the picnic with him? Well, what can he do about it? Pauline gave me up with a gesture. Tommy is the soul of chivalry, she said, and anybody can see he is crazy about you. Simply crazy. What I really wanted was that she should go on talking about Helmuth Garrett. I wanted ground for putting to her that since all we had been sedulously taught about kissing and all that sort of thing, that it was horrid, cheapening, insufferable, had failed to establish itself, had in fact come as a sword, divining mystery. It couldn't be dealt with on the accepted Taylorville basis. I felt the quality of achievement in Helmuth Garrett's right to kiss me, a right which I was sure he lacked only the occasion to establish. But when the occasion came, it went all awry. It was the next Sunday morning, and all down Polk Street, the frost-bitten flower borders were a little made up for by the passage between the shoals of maple leaves that lined the walks of whole flocks of bright-winged new fall hats on their way to church. Mother and Effie were in front, and two of my Sunday school scholars had scurried up like rabbits out of the fallen leafage and tucked themselves on either side of my carefully held skirts. Suddenly there was a rattle of buggy wheels on the winter-roughed road. It turned in by Niles' corner and drove directly toward us. The top was down and I made out by the quick pricking of my blood, the garret bays, and Helmuth with his hat off, his hair tousled, and a bright soft tie swinging free of his vest. 
you saw heads turning all along the block in discreet censure of his unsabbatical behavior. He recognized me almost immediately and turned the team with intention to our side of the street. He was going to speak to me. He was speaking. My mother's back stiffened. She didn't know, of course, for I wouldn't have had the face to tell her. But how many eyes on us up and down the street did know? A Sunday school teacher in the midst of her scholars, and he had kissed me on Thursday. Olivia, said my mother, do you know that young man? Such manners. Sunday morning, too. Well, I am glad that you had the sense to ignore him. And I did not know until that moment that I had. It was because of my habit of living inwardly, I suppose, that it never occurred to me that the incident could have any other bearing on our relations than the secret one of confirming me in my impression of our intimacy being on a superior, excluding footing. He had come, as I was perfectly aware, to renew it at the point of breaking off, and this security quite blinded me to the effect my cold reception might have upon him. That he would fail to understand how I was hemmed and pinned in by Taylorville hadn't occurred to me, not even when he passed us again on the way home from church, driving recklessly. His hat was on this time, determinedly to one side, and he was smoking, smoking a cigar. I thought at first he had not seen me, but he turned suddenly when he was quite past, and swept me a flourish with it, held between two fingers of the hand that touched his hat. At that time in Taylorville, no really nice young man smoked, at least not when he would get found out. This offensiveness in the face of the returning churchgoers was too flagrant to admit even the appearance of noticing it. But that it would be noticed, taken stock of in the general summing up of our relation, I was sickeningly aware. Tommy Bettersworth put one version of it for me comfortingly when he came in in the evening to take me to church. I saw you turn down that Garrett fellow this morning. Served him right. That and the way you behaved Thursday. Just as if you did not find him worth rowing about. A lot of girls make a fuss, and it's only to draw a fellow on. And now you're going to church with me the same as usual. That'll show him what I think of it. Now, I had clean forgotten that Tommy might come that evening. I was whelmed with the certainty that Helmuth Garrett had gone back to the farm after all without seeing me, and the moment Tommy came through the gate I had one of those rifts of lucidity in which I saw him whole and limited, pasted flat against the background of Taylorville without any perspective of imagination, and was taken mightily with the wish to explain to him where he stood, once for all, outside and disconnected with anything that was vital and important to me. But quite unexpectedly, before I could frame a beginning, he had presented himself to me in a new light. He was cover, something to get behind in order to exercise myself more freely in the things he couldn't understand. Something more was bound to come out of my relation to Helmuth Garrett. The incident couldn't go on hanging in the air that way, and in the meantime here was an opportunity to put it out of public attention by going out with Tommy. It did hang in the air, however, for three days, during which I pulsed and sickened with expectancy. By Thursday it had reached a point where I knew that if Helmuth Garrett didn't come and kiss me again, I shouldn't be able to bear it. It was soon after sundown that I felt him coming. I took a great many turns in the garden, which carrying me occasionally out of reach of the click of the gate-latch afforded me the relief of thinking that he might have arrived in the interval when I was out of hearing. His approaching tread was within me, when it was just seven, my mother came out and called, Olivia, I promised Mrs. Ensley a starter of yeast. I have just remembered. Could you take it to her? 
The Ensley backyard was separated from ours by a vacant lot, the houses fronting on parallel streets. There was no sound at the gate, and Mother had the bowl in a white napkin held up to me, with a long message about where the sewing circle was to meet next Thursday. If anybody comes, for the life of me, I couldn't have kept that back. You can tell them I'll be back in a minute, I cautioned her. Are you expecting anybody? Only Tommy, I prevaricated instantly and unaccountably. I saw my mother look at me rather oddly over the tops of the glasses she had lately assumed. On the Ensley's back porch, I found Belle in evening dress, gathering ivy berries for her hair. Oh, she said to my plain appearance, aren't you going? Going where? Oh, if you don't know, to Flora's. Belle was embarrassed. I hadn't heard of it. It's just a few friends. Belle wavered between sympathy and superiority. Flora is so particular. I couldn't have gone anyway, I interpolated. I have an engagement. I had to find Mrs. Ensley after that and deliver my errand. When I reached home, Mother was sitting placidly just outside the circle of the lamp, knitting. She only looked up as I entered, and I had to drag it out of her at last. "'Has anybody been here?' "'Nobody that you would care to see.' "'But who?' "'That fast-looking young man who tried to speak to you on Sunday. "'I'm glad you have a proper feeling about such things. "'Mr. Garrett's nephew, didn't you say?' I told him you were engaged. Oh, mother! I was out in panting haste. At the gate I ran square into Tommy Bettersworth. Did you see anybody? Nobody. I came through by Davis's. I was coming in, he suggested, as I stood peering into the dark. I thought you'd be going to Flora's. A wild hope flashed to me that maybe he was going and I should be rid of him. Oh, I don't care much for that crowd. I told her I had an engagement with you. So he had known I was not to be invited. I resented the liberty of his defense. Let's go down to Niles and have some ice cream, Tommy propitiated. It's too cold for ice cream. I led the way back to the house. I was satisfied that there was no one in the street. When we stepped into the fan of light from the lit window, Tommy saw my face. Oh, I say, Ollie, you mustn't take it like that. Beastly cats, girls are. Flora's just jealous because she thought she was invited to the picnic for that Garrett chap, and you got him. She wants to have a chance at him herself tonight. There was a green-painted garden seat on the porch between the front windows. I sat down in it. It's not Flora I'm crying about. It is being so misunderstood. I was thinking that Helmuth Garrett would suppose I had stayed away from Flora's on his account. She would never dare to say she had not invited me. Tommy's arm came comfortingly along the back of the bench. It's just because they do understand that they are mad. They know a fellow would give his eyes to kiss you. Infernal cad, to snatch it like that. And I've never even asked you for one. His voice was very close to my ear. I tell you, Olivia, I've thought of something. If you were to be engaged to me, you know I've always wanted... Then nobody would have a right to say anything. They'd see that you just left it to me. Oh, I blurted, it's not so bad as that. You think about it, he urged. I don't want to bother you, but if you need it, why, here I am. It was because I was thinking of him so little that I hadn't noticed where Tommy's arm had got by this time. That unfulfilled kiss had seemed somehow to leave me unimaginably exposed, assailed. 
I was needing desperately then to be kissed again, to find myself revalued. It's awfully good of you, Tommy. I do not know how it was that neither of us heard Forrester come up from the gate. All at once there was his foot on the step. As he came into the porch a soft sound drew him. He stared blankly on us for a moment, and then laughed shortly. Oh, it's you this time, Bettersworth. I thought it might be that Garrett chap. That was unkind of Forrester, but there were extenuations. I found afterward that Bell had teased Flora to ask him, and he had refused, thinking it unbrotherly when I was not to be invited, and he and Bell had quarreled. I don't know as it matters to you. Tommy was valiant. Whom she kisses, if I don't mind it. You? What have you got to do with it? Well, a lot. I'm engaged to her. End of Book One, Chapter Nine. Book Two, Chapter One of A Woman of Genius by Mary Hunter Austin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Book Two, Chapter One. The first notion of an obligation I had in writing this part of my story was that if it was to be serviceable, no lingering sentiment should render it less than literal, and none of that egotism turned inside out, which makes a kind of sanctity of the personal experience, prevent me from offering it whole. And the next was that the only way in which it could be made to appear in its complete pitiableness would be to write it from the point of view of Tommy Bettersworth. For after all, I have emerged, retarded, crippled in my affectional capacities, bodily the worse, but still with wings to spread and some disposition toward flying. And when I think of the dreams Tommy had, how he must have figured in them to himself, large between me and all misadventure, adored, dependable, and then how he blundered and lost himself in the mazes of unsuitability. I find bitterness augmenting in me not on my account, but his. The amazing pity of it was that it might have all turned out very well if I had been what I seemed to him and to my family at the time when I let him engage himself to me to save me from imminent embarrassment. My mother, though she took on for the occasion an appropriate solemnity, was frankly relieved to have me so well disposed. Tommy had been brought up in the church, had no bad habits, and was earning a reasonable salary with Burton Brothers, tailors, and outfitters. There was nobody whose business it was to tell me that I did not love Tommy enough to marry him. I have often wondered— supposing a medium of communication had been established between my mother and me, if I had told her how much more that other kiss had meant to me than Tommy's mild osculation, she would have understood or made a fight for me. I am afraid she would only have seen in it evidence of an infatuation for an undesirable young man, one who smoked and drove rakishly about town in red neckties on Sunday morning but in fact I liked Tommy immensely. The mating instinct was awake. All our world clapped us forward to the adventure. If you ask what the inward monitor was about on this occasion, I will say that it is always and singularly inept at human estimates. If, often in search of companionship, its eye is removed from the mark, to fix upon the personal environment, it is still unfurnished to divine behind which plain exterior lives another like itself. I took Tommy's community of interest for granted on the evidence of his loving me, though indeed after all these years I am not quite clear why he, why Forrester and Pauline, couldn't have walked in the way with me toward the shining destiny. I was not conscious of any private advantage certainly so far as our beginnings were concerned. 
none showed, and I should have been glad of their company. And here, at the end, I am walking in it alone. About a month after my engagement, Henry Mills proposed to Pauline, and she began preparations to be married the following June. Tommy's salary not being thought to justify it so soon, the idea of my own marriage had not come very close to me until I began to help Pauline work initials on table linen. The chief difference between Pauline and me had been that she had lived all her life, so to speak, at home. Nothing exigent to her social order had ever found her out. But Olivia seemed always to be at the top of the house or somewhere in the back garden, to whom the normal occasions presented themselves as a succession of cards under the door. I do not mean to say that I actually missed any of these appointed visitors, but all my early life comes back to me as a series of importunate callers whose names I was not sure of and who distracted me frightfully from something vastly more pleasant and important that I wanted very much to do, without knowing very well what it was. But it was in the long afternoons, when Pauline and I sat upstairs together sewing on our white things, that I began to take notice of the relation of what happened to me to the things that went on inside, and to be intrigued away from the vision by the possibility of turning it into facts of line and color and suitability. It was the beginning of my realizing what came afterward to be such a bitter and engrossing need with me, the need of money. Much that had struck inharmoniously on me in the furnishings of Taylorville had identified it so with the point of view there that I had come to think of the one as being the natural and inevitable expression of the other. Now, with the growing appreciation of a home of my own as a medium of self-realization, I accepted its possibility of limitation by the figure of my husband's income without being entirely daunted thereby. For I was still of the young opinion that getting rich involved no more serious matter than setting about it. As I saw it then, men's tailoring and outfitting did not appear an unlikely beginning. If Tommy had achieved the magnificence I planned for him, it wouldn't have been on the whole more remarkable than what has happened. What I had to reckon with later was the astonishing fact that Tommy liked plush furniture and liked it red for choice. I do not know why it should have taken me by surprise to find him in harmony with his bringing up. There was no reason for the case being otherwise, except as I seemed to find one in his being fond of me. His mother's house was not unlike other Taylorvillian homes, more austerely kept. The blinds were always pulled down in the best room, and they never opened the piano except when there was company, or for the little girls to practice their music lessons. Mrs. Bettersworth was a large, fair woman with pale, prominent eyes, and pale hair pulled back from a corrugated forehead, and his sisters, who were all younger than Tommy, were exactly like her, their eyes, if possible, more protruded, which you felt to be owing to their hair being braided very tightly in two braids, as far apart as possible at the corners of their heads. They treated me always with the greatest respect. If there had been anybody who could have thrown any light on the situation, it would have been Mr. Bettersworth. He was a dry man, with what passed in Taylorville for an eccentric turn of mind. He had, for instance, been known to justify himself for putting Tommy to the men's outfitters rather than to his own business of building and contracting on the ground that Tommy wanted the imagination for it, just as if an imagination could be of use to anybody. So you are going to undertake to make Tommy happy? He said to me on the occasion of my taking supper with the family as a formal acknowledgment of my engagement. Don't you think I can do it? He was looking at me rather quizzically, and I really wished to know. Oh, I was wondering, he said, what you would do with what you had left over. 
but it was years before I understood what he meant by that. About the time I was bridesmaid for Pauline, Tommy had an advantageous offer that put our marriage almost immediately within reach. Burton Brothers was a branch house, one of a score with the head at Chicago, to whom Tommy had so commended himself under the stimulus of being engaged, that on the establishment of a new store in Hinkleston, they offered him the sales department. There was also to be a working tailor and a superintendent visiting it regularly from Chicago, which its nearness to the metropolis allowed. All that we knew of Higgleston was that it was a long-settled farming community, which, having discovered itself at the junction of two railway lines that approached Chicago from the southeast, conceived itself to have arrived there by some native superiority and awoke to the expectation of importance. It lay, as respects Taylorville, no great distance beyond the flat horizon of the north, where the prairie broke into wooded land again, far enough north not to have been fanned by the hot blast of the war and the spiritual struggle that preceded it, and so to have missed the revitalizing processes that crowded the few succeeding years. Whatever difference there was between it and Taylorville besides population was just the difference between a community that has fought wholeheartedly and one that stood looking on at the fight. It was not far enough from Taylorville to have struck out anything new for itself in manners or furniture, but the necessity of going south two or three hours to change cars and north again several hours more set up an illusion of change which led to a disappointment in its want of variety. Tommy went out in July, and in a month wrote me that he would be able to come for me as soon as I was ready, and hoping it would not be long. If I had looked, as in the last hesitancies of girlhood I believe I did, for my mother to have raised an objection to my going so far from home, I found myself instead almost with the feeling of being pushed out of the nest. It seemed as if in hastening me out of the family she would be the sooner free to give herself without reproach to a new and extraordinary scheme of foresters. What I guess now to have been in part the motive was that she already had been touched by the warning of that disorder which finally carried her off, which, with the curious futility of timid women, she hoped by not mentioning, to postpone. For a long time now, Forrester had found himself in the situation of having grown beyond his virtues. That assumption of mannishness, which sat so prettily on his nonage, was rendered inconspicuous by his majority. People who had forgotten that he had never had any boyhood found nothing especially commendable in the mild soberness of twenty-three. I have a notion, too, that the happy circumstance of my marriage lit up for him some personal phases which he could hardly have regarded with complacence, for by this time he had passed in his character of philanderer from being hopefully regarded as reclaimable to constancy to a sort of public understudy in the practice of the affections. However it had come about, the young ladies who still took on Forrester at intervals no longer looked on him so much as privileged, but as eminently safe, and the number of girls in a given community who can be counted on for such a performance is limited. That summer before I was married, after Bell Ensley had run away from home with a commercial traveler, who disappointed the moral instance by making her a very good husband afterward, my brother found himself as regards the young people's world, in a situation of uneasy detachment. And there was no doubt that the cooperative, where he had been seven years, bored him excessively. It was then he conceived the idea of reinstating himself in the atmosphere of importance by setting himself up in business. Adjacent to Niles Ice Cream Parlors, there was a small stationery and news agency which might be bought and enlarged to creditable proportions. 
There was, I believe, actually nothing to be urged against this as a matter of business. The difficulty was that to accomplish it, my mother would be obliged to hypothecate the whole of her small capital. What my mother really thought about her property was that she held it in trust for the family interest, and that, with the secret intimation of her end, which I surmise must have reached her by this time, she believed to be served by Forrester's plan. It was so much the general view that by marrying I took myself out of the family altogether, that I felt convinced that she meant, so soon as that was accomplished, to undertake what, in the face of my protesting attitude, she had not the courage to begin. I remember how shocked she was at my telling her that this tying up of the two ends of life in a monetary obligation would put her and Forrester very much in the situation of a young man married to a middle-aged woman. I mention this here because the implication that grew out of it, of my marriage being looked forward to as a relief, had much to do with the failure out of my life at this juncture of informing intimacy. A great deal of necessary information had come my way through Pauline's marriage, through the comment set free by Belle Ensley's affair, through the natural awakening of my mind toward the intimations of books. Marriage I began to perceive as an engulfing personal experience. Until now I hadn't been able to think of it except as a means of providing pleasant companionship on the way toward that large and shining world for which I felt myself forever and unassailably fit. It began to exhibit now, through vistas that allured, the aspect of a vast inhuman grin. Somewhere out of this prospect of sympathy and understanding arose upon you the tremendous inundation of life. Dimly beyond the point of Tommy's joyous possession of me, I was aware of an incalculable force by which the whole province of my being was assailed very different from the girlish provision of motherhood which had floated with the fragrance of orris root from Aunt Alice's bureau drawer in the Allingham's spare room. I don't say this is the way all girls feel about the approach of maternity, but I saw it then like the wolf in the fairy tale, which as soon as its head was admitted, thrust in a shoulder, and so came bodily into the room and devoured the Protestant. Long afterward, when I was in a position to know something of the private experience of trapeze performers, I learned that they came to a point sometimes in mid-spring, when the body apprised them of inadequacy, a warning sure to be followed in no long time by disaster. I have thought sometimes that what reached me then was the advice of a body instinctively aware of being unequal to the demands about to be imposed upon it. I hardly know now by what road I arrived at the certainty that some women, Pauline for instance, were able to face this looming terror of childbearing by making terms with it. Life, it appeared, waited at their doors with respect, modified the edge of its inevitableness to their convenience. If Pauline had been accessible, but she was living in Chicago with Henry Mills, going out a great deal, and writing me in frequent letters of bright complacency. It was only in the last frightened gasp I fixed upon my mother. You must imagine for yourself from what you know of nice girls thirty years ago how inarticulate the whole business was. The most I can do is to have you understand my desperate need to know, to interpose between marriage and maternity never so slight an interval in which to collect myself and leave off shrinking. About a week before my wedding, we were sitting together at the close of the afternoon. My mother had taken up her knitting, as her habit was when the light failed. Something in the work we had been doing, putting the last touches to my wedding dress, led her to speak of her own and of my father as a young man. The mentioned pricked me to notice what I recall now as characteristic of Taylorville women, that, with all that she had been through, 
the war, her eight children, so many graves, there was still in her attitude toward all these a kind of untutored virginity. It made my noticing it then and being touched by it a sort of bridge by which it seemed for the moment she might be drawn over to my side. On the impulse I spoke. Mother, I said, I want to know. It seemed a natural sort of knowledge to which any woman had a right. Almost before the question was out, I saw the expression of offended shock come over my mother's reminiscent softness the nearly animal rage of terror with which the unknown, the unaccustomed, assailed her. Olivia! Olivia! She stood up, her knitting rigid in her hands, the ball of it speeding away in the dusk of the floor on some private terror of its own. Olivia, I'll not hear of such things. You are not to speak of them, do you understand? I'll have nothing to do with them. I wanted to know, I said. I thought you could tell me. I went over and stood by the window. A little dry snow was blowing. It was the first week in November, beginning to collect on the edges of the walks and along the fences. The landscape showed sketched in white on a background of neutral gray. I heard a movement in the room behind me. My mother came presently, and stood looking out with me. She was very pale, scared but commiserating. Somehow my question had glanced in striking the dying nerve of long-since-encountered dreads and pains. We faced them together there in the cold twilight. I'm sorry, daughter, she hesitated. I can't help you. I don't no, I never knew myself. End of Book Two, Chapter One Book Two, Chapter Two of A Woman of Genius by Mary Hunter Austin This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Book Two, Chapter Two it is, no doubt, owing to the habit of life in Higgleston being so little differentiated from Taylorville that I was never able to get any other impression of it than as a place one put up at on the way to some other. Always it bore to my mind the air of a traveler's room in one of those stops where it is necessary to open the trunks, but not worth while to unpack them nor do I think it was altogether owing to what I left there that my recollection of it centers paganly about the cemetery. In Taylorville, love and birth, though but scantily removed from the savor of impropriety, were still the salient facts of existence. But in Higgleston a funeral was your real human occasion. It was as if the rural fear of innovation had thrown them back for a pivotal center upon the point of continuity with their past. It was a generous rolling space set aside for the dead, abutting on two sides on the boardwalks of the town, stretching back by dips and hollows to the wooded pastures. Near the gates which opened from the walk, it was divided off in single plots and family allotments, scattering more and more to the farthest neglected mounds that crept obscurely under the hazel thickets and the sapling oaks, happiest when named the least, assimilated quickliest to their native earth. It was this that rendered the pagan touch, for though nearly all Higgleston was church-going and looked forward to a hymn-book heaven, they seemed to me never quite dissevered from the untutored pastures to which their whole living and dying was a process of being reabsorbed. Higgleston, until this junction of railroads occurred, had been a close, settled farming community, and a vague notion of civic improvement 
had ripped through the center of its wide old yards and comfortable country-looking dwellings. A shadeless, unpaved street lined with what were known as business blocks, with a tendency to run mostly to front and a general placarded state of being to let or about to be opened on these premises. Beyond the railway station, there was a dingy region devoted to car shops and cheap lodgings, known locally as Track Town, whose inhabitants were forever at odds with the older rural population, withdrawing itself into a kind of aristocracy of priority and propriety. And between these, an intermediary group, self-styled, the leading businessmen of the town, forever and trivially busy to reconcile the two factions in the interests of trade. That Tommy was by reason of his position as managing salesman of Burton Brothers, generically of this class, might have had something to do with my never having formed any vital or lasting relations with either community. And it might have been for quite other reasons. For in the very beginning of my stay there, Life had seized me, that bubbling, frothing force, working forever to breach the film of existence. I was used by it, I was abused by it. For what does life care what it does to the tender bodies of women? My baby was born within ten months of my marriage, and most of that time I was wretchedly, depressingly ill. All my memories of my early married life are of Olivia in the morning still with frost cowering away from the kitchen sights and smells, or gasping up out of engulfing nausea to sit out the duty calls of the leading ladies of Higgleston in the cold, disordered house, of Tommy gulping unsuitable meals of underdone and overdone things, and washing the day's accumulation of dishes after business hours patient and portentously cheerful, with Olivia in a wrapper half hysterical with weakness, all the young wife's dreams gone awry. And Tommy, too, he must have had visions of himself coming home to a well-kept house, of delicious little dinners, and long hours in which he should appear in his proper character as the adored, achieving male." Not long ago I read a book of a man's life written by a man, in which he justified himself of unfaithfulness because his wife appeared before him habitually in curl papers. And there were days when I couldn't even do my hair. In the beginning we had taken, in respect to Tommy's position among those same live businessmen, a house rather too large for us, and we hadn't counted on the wages of a servant. Now, with the necessity upon us of laying by money for the great expense, we felt less justified in it than ever. This pinch of necessity was of the quality of corrosion on what must have been meant for the consummate experience. I have to dwell on it here because in this practical confusion of my illness was laid the foundation of our later failure to come together on any working basis. We hadn't, in fact, time to find it, no time to understand, none whatever in which to explore the use of passion and react into that superunion of which the bodily relation is the overt sign. Young things we were, who had not fairly known each other as man and woman before we were compelled to trace in one another the lineaments of parents all attention drawn away from the imperative business of framing a common ideal to center on the child. What this precipitance accomplished was that instead of being drawn insensibly to find in the exigencies of marriage the natural unfolding of that inward vitality, always much stronger in me than any exterior phase, I was, by the shock of too early maternity, driven apart from the usual, and I still believe the happier destiny of women. With all this, we were spared the bitterness of the unwelcoming thought. Little homely memories swim up beyond the pains and depressions to mark like twigs and leafage on a freshet the swelling of the new affection. 
Effie at Montecito, overruling all my mother's shocked suggestions as to her supposed obliviousness of my condition, sitting up nights to sew for me. The dress I tried to make myself. The bureau drawer from which I used to take the little things every night to look at them. The smell of Oris. See, Tommy, I've done so much today. Isn't it pretty? My dear, you've shown that to me at least forty times, and I've always said so. Yes, but isn't it? The little sleeves? Did you think anything could be so small? Tommy, don't you wish it would come? We had to make what we could of these moments of thrilled expectancy, of tender brooding curiosity. I scarcely recall now all the reasons why it was thought best for me to go back to my mother in August and to the family physician, but I find it all pertinent to my subject. Whatever was done there was mostly wrong, though I was years finding it out. I mean that whatever chance I had of growing up into the competent mother of a family was probably lost to me through the inexactitudes of country practice. We hadn't then arrived at the realization that the well or ill going of maternity is a matter of septics rather than sentiment. Taylorville was a town of ten thousand inhabitants, but at that time no one had heard of such a thing as a trained nurse. The business of midwifery was given over in general to a widow so little attractive that she was thought not to have a chance of marrying again and by the circumstance of having had two or three children of her own, believed to be eminently fit. To Olivia's first encounter with the rending powers of life, there went any amount of affectionate consideration and much old wives' lore of an extraordinary character. It seems hardly credible now, but in the beginning of things going wrong, there were symptoms concealed from the doctor on the ground of delicacy. My baby, too, poor little man, was feeble from birth, a bottle baby. The best that could have been done would hardly have been a chance for him. Lying there in the hot closed room, all the air shut out with the light in the midst of pains, I made a fight for him, tried to interpose such scraps of better knowledge as had come to me through reading but they made no headway against my mother's confidential, well, I ought to know I've buried five, and against Forrester, who by the added importance of having invested all her fortune, had gained such way with my mother that she listened respectfully to his explication of what should be done for the baby. It was Forrester who overbore with ridicule my suggestion that he should be fed at regular hours, for which I never forgave him. But I had enough to do to fortify my racked body against the time when I should be obliged to get up and go on again, as it seemed privately I never should be able. And they were all so fond and proud of my little Thomas Henry. He was named so for his father and mine. Effie simply adored him, the wonder of his smallness, the way in which he moved his limbs and opened and shut his eyes, quite as if there had never been one born before, the way they hung over him and the wrong things they did. Even cousin Lydia drove into church the first Sunday after for the purpose of holding him for a quarter of an hour in her large silk poplin arms, at the end of which time she had softened almost to the point of confidence. I thought I was going to have one once, she admitted, but somehow I couldn't seem to manage it. She looked over to where Cousin Judd sat with my mother. He was always fond of young ones. It occurred to me then that Cousin Lydia was probably a much misunderstood woman. Of the next six months at Higgleston, after I returned to it with a three-months-old baby, I have scarcely any recollection that is not mixed up with bodily torment for myself and anxiety for the child. I think it probable that most of that time 
my husband found the house badly kept, the meals irregular and his wife hysterical. I hadn't anything to spare with which to consider what figure I might have cut in the eyes of the onlooker. Tommy shines out for me in that period by reason of the unwearying patience and cheerfulness with which he successfully ignored the general unsatisfactoriness of his home, and at times for a certain exasperation I had with him, as if, by being somehow less quiescent, he might have opposed a better front to the encroachments of distress. We did try help in the kitchen after our finances had a little recovered from the strain of my confinement. A Higgleston girl of no great competence, and a sort of backdoor visiting acquaintance with two-thirds of the community. Her chief accomplishments while she stayed with us were concocted out of the scraps and fag-ends of our private conversations. I could always tell that Ida had overheard something by the alacrity with which she banged the pots about in the kitchen in order that she might get through with her work and go out and tell somebody. In the end, Tommy said that when it came to a choice between getting his own meals and losing his best customers, he preferred the former. All this time I did not know how ill I was because of the consuming anxiety for the baby. I remember times in the night, the dreadful momentary revolt of my body rousing to this new demand upon it, before the mind wake to the selfless consideration and the failure of composure, which was as much weakness as fear, the long watching, the walking to and fro, and the debates as to whether we ought or ought not to venture on the expense of the doctor. And for long years afterward, what is the bitterest of bitterness finding out that we had done the wrong thing? To this day I cannot come across any notices of the more competent methods for the care of delicate children without a remembering pang. All the time this was going on, I was aware by a secondary detached sort of self that there was a point somewhere beyond this perplexity of pain at which the joyful possession of my son should begin. I was anxious to get at him, to have speech with him, to realize his identity, any woman will understand. And along about the time the blue flags and the live forevers and the white bridal wreaths were at their best in the cemetery, it came upon me terrifyingly that I might, after all, have to let him go without it. We were walking there that day. The first we had thought it safe to take the baby out, for it was customary to walk in the cemetery on Sunday and almost obligatory to your social standing. The oaks were budding, and the wind in the irises and the shadow of them on the tombstones, and the people all in their Sunday best, walking in the warm light, gave an effect of more aliveness than the somber yards of the town could afford. Tommy had taken the baby from me, for though I could somehow never get enough of the feel of him, his head in the hollow of my shoulder, his weight against my arm, I was so little strong myself that I was glad to pretend that it was because he was really getting heavy. And just then we passed a little mound, so low, where a new headboard had been set up with the superscription, only son of blank and blank, aged eight months. And it was the age, and the little mound was just the length of my boy. I think there was a rush of tears to cover that, the realization by a kind of prevision that it was just to that he was to come. Tears checked in mid-course by the swift uprush of the certainty of the reality of the absoluteness of human experience for by whatever mystery or magic he had come to identity through me, he was my son as I knew, and not even death could so unmake him. I dwell upon this and one other incident which I shall relate in its proper place, as all that was offered to me of the traditional compensation for what women are supposed to be. If a sedulous social ideal has kept them from the world touch through knowledge and achievement, it has been because, sincerely enough, 
they have not been supposed to be prevented from world processes so much as directed to find them in a happier way. This would be reasonable if they found them. What society fails to understand or dishonestly fails to admit is that marriage as an act is not invariably the stroke that ushers in the experience of being married. Whatever proportions the change in my life had assumed to the outward eye, it was only by the imagined pain of loss that I began to perceive that I could never be quite in the same relation to things again, and to identify my experience with the world adventure. I had become, by the way of giving life and losing it, a link in the chain that leads from dark to dark. I had touched for the moment a reality from which the process of self-realization could be measured. It was the most and the best I was to know of the incident called maternity, that whether it were most bitter or most sweet, it was irrevocable. I suppose, though he was always so inarticulate, that Tommy must have caught something of my mood from me. He didn't seem to see anything ridiculous in my holding on to a fold of the baby's skirt all the way home, and when we had come into the house and the boy was laid in his crib again, so wan and so little, I sat on my young husband's knee and cried with my face against his, and he did not ask me what it was about. I think, though, that we had not yet appreciated how near we were to losing him until my mother came to visit us along in the middle of the summer. She was quite excited as she walked up from the station with Tommy, and for her almost gay with the novelty of spending a month with a married daughter. And then, as soon as she had sight of the child, I saw her checked and startled inquiry travel from me to Tommy and back to the child's meager little features, and a new and amazing tenderness in all her manner to me. That night after I was in bed, she came in her nightdress and kissed me without saying anything, and I was too surprised to make any motion of response. That was the first time I remember my mother having kissed me on anything less than an official occasion, but she had buried five herself. Notwithstanding, my mother's coming and the care she took of the baby seemed to make me, if anything, less prepared for the end. There were new remedies of my mother's to be tried, which appeared hopeful. I recovered composure, thought of him as improving, when in fact it was only I who was stronger for a few nights' uninterrupted sleep. Then there was a day on which she was very quiet, and she scarcely put him down from her lap at all. I do not know what I thought of that, nor of the doctor coming twice that day unsummoned. I suppose my sensibilities must have been blunted by the strain, for I recall thinking when Tommy came home in the middle of the afternoon how good it was we could all have this quiet time together. It was the end of June. I remember the blinds half drawn against the sun and the smell of lawns newly cut and the damask rose by the window. I was going about putting fresh flowers in the vases, a thing I had of late little time to do. Suddenly I noticed Tommy crying. He sat close to my mother, trying to make the boy's poor little claws curl around his finger, and at the failure tears ran down unwiped. I had never seen Tommy cry. I put down my roses, uncertain if I ought to go to him. And, all at once, my mother called me. End of Book Two, Chapter Two Book Two, Chapter Three of A Woman of Genius by Mary Hunter Austin This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Book Two, Chapter Three Very closely on the loss of my baby, of which I have spared you as much as possible, came crowding the opening movement of my artistic career. Within a month I was in a hospital in Chicago 
recovering from the disastrous termination of another expectancy that had come, scarcely regarded in the obsession of anxiety and overwork during the last weeks of my boy's life, and had failed to sustain itself under the shock of his death. And after the hospital there was a month of convalescence at Pauline's. It was the first time I had seen her since her marriage. I found her living in one of those curious compressed city houses, one room wide and three deep, which after the rambling scattered homes of Higgleston induced a feeling of cramp, until I discovered a kind of spaciousness in the life within. It was really very little else than relief from the accustomed inharmonies of rurality, a sort of scenic air and light that answered perfectly, so long as you believed it real. Pauline's wallpapers were soft, unpatterned, with wide borders. Her windows were hung with plain scrim, and the furniture coverings were in tone with the carpets. When ladies called in the afternoon, Pauline gave them tea, which she made in a brass kettle over a spirit lamp. You can scarcely understand what that kettle stood for in my new estimate of the graciousness of living, a kind of sacred flame round which gathered unimagined possibilities for the dramatization of that eager inward life which now that the strictures of bodily pain were loosed, began to press toward expression. It rose insistently against the depressing figure my draggled and defeated condition must have cut in the face of Pauline's bright competency and the quality of assurance in her choice of the things among which she moved. Whatever her standards of behavior or furniture, they were always present to the eye, not sunk below the plane of consciousness like mine. And she could always name you the people who practiced them or the places where they could be bought and at what price. My expressed interest in the tea kettle led at once to the particular department store where I saw rows of them shining in the ticketed inaccessibility of seven dollars and ninety-eight cents. From point to point of such eminent practicability, I was pricked to think of preempting some of these new phases of suitability for myself, finding myself debarred by the flatness of my purse. The effect of it was to throw me back into the benumbing sense of personal neglect with which the city had burst upon me. From the first, as I began to go about still in my half-invalided condition, I had been tremendously struck with the plenitude of beauty. Here was every article of human use made fair and fit, so that nobody need have lacked a portion of it, save for an inexplicable error in the means of distribution. I, for instance, who had within me the witness of heirship, had none of it. That I should have felt it so was no doubt a part of that Taylor Villian fallacy in which I had been reared, that all that was precious and desirable was shed as the natural flower and fruit of goodness. Here, confronted with the concrete preciousness of the shop windows, I realized that if there had been anything originally sound in that proposition, I had at least missed the particular kind of goodness to which it was chargeable. I wanted, I absurdly wanted, just then to collect my arrears of privilege and consideration in terms of hardwood furniture and afternoon tea kettles, in graceful feminine leisure, all the traditional sanctity and enthronement of women for which I had paid with my body, with maternal anxieties and wifely submission. What glimmered on my horizon was the realization that it was not in such appreciable coin the debt was paid, the beginning of knowledge that seldom, except by accident, is it paid at all. What I learned from Pauline was that most of it came by way of the bargain counter. Not even the shining destiny was due to arrive merely by reason of your own private conviction of being fit, but demanded something to be laid down for it, though if you had named the whole price to me at that juncture, I should have refused to pay. Besides all this, the most memorable thing that came of my visit to Pauline was that I went to the theater. It was Henry's suggestion, 
He thought I wanted cheering. Pauline was not going out much that season, and her reluctance to claim my attention in the face of my bereavement to her own approaching event threw at times a shadow of constraint on our quiet evenings. Henry had fallen into a way of taking me out for timid and Higglestonian glimpses of the night sights of the city, but I am not sure it was the obligation of hospitality which led him to propose the theatre. I recall that he displayed a particular knowingness about what he styled the attractions. What surprised me most was that I discovered no qualms in myself over a proceeding so at variance with my bringing up. And the piece, a broad comedy of Henry's selection, made no particular impression on me other than the singular one of having known a great deal about it before. My criticism of the acting brought Pauline around with a swing from the city cousin attitude in which she had initiated the experience for me to one aesthetically sympathetic. The things men choose, my dear, and to anybody who has been saturated in Shakespeare as you have. You really must see Majeska. It will be an inspiration to you. Henry, you must take her to see Majeska. I had not yet made up my mind as to whether I liked Henry Mills, but I was willing to go and see Majeska with him. We had orchestra seats, and Pauline insisted on my wearing her black silk wrap. On the way, Henry told me a great deal about Madame Mojeska, with that same air of knowingness which fitted so oddly with his assumption of the model husband. I had accustomed myself to think of Henry as an attorney, which in Taylorville meant a man who could be trusted with the administration of widows' property and Fourth of July orations. Henry, it transpired, was a sort of junior partner in one of those city firms whose concern is not with people who have broken the law, but with those who are desirous to sail as close to the wind as possible without breaking it. They had a great deal to do with stock companies, in connection with which Henry had found some personal advantage. He always referred to it as our office, so that I am in doubt still as to the exact nature of his connection with it. Its only relation to his private life was to lead to his habitually appearing in what is known as a business suit and an air of shrewd reliability. If, in the beginning, he had any notions of his own as to what a husband ought to be, he had discarded them in favor of Pauline's, and if as early as that he had devised any system of paying himself off for his complicity in her ideals, I didn't discover it. I saw Majeska with Henry in Romeo and Juliet, and afterwards stole away to a matinee by myself, and saw her as Rosalind. I do not know now if she was the great artist she seemed. It is so long since I have seen her. But she sufficed. I had no words in which to express my extraordinary sense of possession in her, the profound excluding intimacy of her art. Long after Henry Mills had gone to his connubial pillow, I remained walking up and down in my room in a state of intense, inarticulate excitement. I did not think concretely of the stage, nor of acting. What I had news of was a country of large impulses and satisfying movement. I felt myself strong, had I but known the way to set out for it. When I found sleep at last, it was to dream not of the theater, but of Helmuth Garrett. I was made aware of him first by a sense of fullness about my heart and then I came upon him looking as he had looked last in the Wilsden Woods, writing at a table, a pale blur about him of the causeless light of dreams. I recognized the carpet underfoot as a favorite Taylor Villian selection, but overhead red boughs of sycamore and oak depended through the dream-fogged atmosphere. I stood and read over his shoulder what he wrote, and though the words escaped me, the meaning of them put all straight between us. He turned as he wrote and looked at me with a look that set us back in the rapt intimacy of the flaming forest. 
Somehow we had got there and found it softly dark. In the interval between my dream and morning, that kiss which had been the source of so much secret blame and secret exultation was somehow accounted for. It was a waif out of the country of Rosalind and Juliet. The sense of a vital readjustment remained with me all that day. There had been, after all, in the common phrase, something between us. But I explained the recrudescence of memory on the basis that it was from Helmuth Garrett that I had first heard of Chicago and Mojeska. I came back to Higgleston reasonably well with some fine points of achievement twinkling ahead of me, to have my new-found sense of direction put all at fault by the trivial circumstance of Tommy's having papered the living room. The walls when we took the house had been finished hard and white, much in need of renewing, from the expense of which our immediate plunge into the cares of a family had prevented us. Casting about for any way of ridding it against my return of the sadness of association, Tommy had hit upon the idea of papering the room himself in the evenings after closing hours, and by way of keeping it a pleasant surprise, had chosen the paper to his own taste. Anyone who kept house in the early eighties will recall a type of paper then in vogue, of large unintelligent arabesques of a liverish, bronzy hue, parting at regular intervals upon Neapolitan landscapes of pronounced pinks and blues. Tommy's landscapes achieved the added atrocity of having Japanese ladies walking about in them, and though the room wanted lighting, the paper was very dark. It must have cost him something, too. From the amount of his salary which he had remitted for my hospital expenses— he could hardly have left himself money to pay for his meals at Higgleston's one doubtful restaurant. The appearance of the kitchen, indeed, suggested that he had made most of them on crackers and tinned ham. I was glad to have discovered this before I said to him how much better it would have been for him to send me the money and let me select the paper in Chicago. What leaped upon me as he waved the lamp about to show me how cleverly he had matched the borders was the surprising, the confounding certainty that after all our shared sorrow and anxiety we hadn't in the least come together. I had lived in the house with him for two years, had borne him a child and lost it, and he had chosen this moment of heart-rending return to give me to understand that he couldn't even know what I might like in the way of wallpapers. I suppose all this time when the surface of my attention was taken up with the baby, I had been making unconscious estimates of my husband. But that night, just as we had come from the station, the moment of calculating that on a basis of necessary economy I should have to live at least three years with the evidence of his ineptitude, was the first of my regarding him critically as the instrument of my destiny, and I hadn't primarily selected him for that purpose. I do not know now exactly why I married Tommy, except that marriage seemed a natural sort of experience, and I had taken to it as readily as though it had been something to eat, something to nourish and sustain. I hadn't, at any rate, thought of it as entangling. I did not then, but certainly it occurred to me that for the enlarged standard of living I had brought home with me, a man of Tommy's taste was likely to prove an unsuitable tool. Slight as the incident of the wallpaper was, it served to check my dawning interest in domesticity and set my hungering mind looking elsewhere for sustenance. We were still a little in arrears on account of the funeral expenses and my illness, and no more improvements were to be thought of. Tommy and I were of one mind in that we had the common Taylorvillian horror of debt. There were other things which seemed to put off my conquest of the harmonious environment, things every woman who has lost a child will understand. Starting awake at night to the remembered cry, 
the blessed weight upon the arm that failed and receded before returning consciousness. I recall going into the bedroom once where a shawl had been dropped on the pillow, like, so like, and the memories of infinitesimal neglects that began to show now preposterously blamable. In my first year at Higgleston, I had been rather driven apart from the community by the absorption of my condition and the intimation that instead of being the crown of life, it merely saved itself by not being mentioned. Now, in my desperate need of the social function, I began to imagine, for want of any other likeness between us, a community of lack. I thought of Higgleston as aching for life as I ached, and began to wonder if we mightn't help one another. As the colder weather shut me more into the haunted rooms, Tommy thought it might be a good thing if I took an interest in the entertainment which the IOOF, of which he was a fellow, was undertaking for the benefit of their new hall. As the sort of service counted on from the wives of prominent members— it might also be beneficial to trade. On this understanding I did take an interest, with the result that the entertainment was an immense success. It led naturally to my being put in charge of the annual public school library theatricals, and a little later to my being connected with what was the acute dramatic crisis of the Middle West. There should be a great many people still who remember a large, loose melodrama called The Union Spy, or The Confederate Spy, accordingly as it was performed north or south of Mason and Dixon's line, participated in by the country at large, a sort of localized passion play lifted by its tremendous personal interest, free of all theatrical taint. There was a Captain McQuirter who went about with the scenery and accessories, casting the parts and conducting rehearsals, sharing the profits with the local G.A.R. The battle scenes were invariably executed by the veterans of the order, with horrid realism. Effie wrote me that there had been three performances in Taylorville, and Cousin Judd had been to every one of them. With the reputation I had acquired in Higgleston, it came naturally when the town, by its slighter hold on the event, achieved a single performance, for me to be cast for the principal part, unhindered by any convention on behalf of my recent mourning. Rather so close did the subject lie to the community feeling, there was an instinctive sense of dramatic propriety in my sorrow in connection with the anguish of war-bereaved women. One can imagine such a sentiment operating in the choice of players at Oberammergau. In addition to my acting, I began very soon to take a large share of the responsibility of rehearsals. I do not know where I got the things I put into that business. Where, in fact, does gift come from, and what is the nature of it? I found myself falling back on my studies with Professor Winter, on slight amateurish incidents of Taylorville, on my brief Chicago contact even, to account to Higgleston for insights, certainties that they would not have accepted without some such obvious backing. Nevertheless, the thing was there, the aptitude to seize and carry to its touching, its fruitful expression, the awkward eagerness of the community to relive its most moving actualities. Never in America have we been so near the democratic drama. In the final performance I surprised Tommy and myself with my success. Most of all I surprised Captain McWhirter. He was arranging a production of the spy at the twin towns of Newton and Canfield, about two hours south of us, and asked me to go down there for him and attend to alternate rehearsals. Tommy was immensely flattered, pleased to have me forget my melancholy, and the money was a consideration. I saw the captain through with two performances in each town, and three at Waterbury. All this time I had not thought of the stage professionally. I returned to Tommy and the wallpaper after the final performance with a vague sense of flatness, 
to try to pull together out of Higgleston's unwilling materials the stuff of a satisfying existence. Suddenly, in April, came a telegram and a letter from Captain McWhirter at Kincaid to say that on the eve of production his leading lady had run away to be married, and could I, would I, come down and see him through? The letter contained an enclosure for traveling expenses and a substantial offer for my time. No reasonable objection presenting itself, I went down to him by Monday's train. End of Book Two, Chapter Three Book Two, Chapter Four of A Woman of Genius by Mary Hunter Austin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Book Two, Chapter Four. On the morning between the second and third performance of The Spy, for McWhorter never let the people off with less than three if he could help it, as I was sitting in the dining room of the Hotel Metropole at Kincaid, enjoying the sense of leisure a late breakfast afforded, I saw the captain making his way toward me through an archipelago of whitish island upon which the remains of innumerable breakfast appeared to be cast away without hope of rescue from the languid waiters, steering as straight a course as was compatible with a conversation kept up over his shoulder with the man, who for a certain closed-crop, clean-shaven, ever-ready look might have been bred for the priesthood and given it up for the newspaper business. It was a type and manner I was to know very well, as the actor-manager, but as the first I had seen of that species, I failed to identify it. What I did remark was the odd mixture of condescension and importance which the captain managed to put into the fact of being caught in his company. He introduced him to me as Mr. O'Farrell, Mr. Seamus O'Farrell, as though there could be but one of him, and that one fully accredited and explained. He defined him further, after some remarks on the performance of the evening before in a key which seemed to sustain the evidence of Mr. O'Farrell's name in favor of his nationality, as manager of the Shamrock Players Company, billed for the first of the week in Kincaid. It turned out in the course of these remarks, which the captain delivered with a kind of proprietary air in us, that Mr. O'Farrell, he called himself the O'Farrell in his posters, had a proposition to make to me. He put it with an admirable mix of compliment and deprecation, as though either was a sort of stopcock to meet a too reluctant modesty on my part, or a too exorbitant demand for payment. I was afterward to know many variations of this singular blend, and to acquaint myself definitely how far it is safe to trust it in either direction before the stop was turned. But for the moment I was under the impression, as no doubt a feral meant I should be, that a thing so perfectly asked for should not be refused. What he asked was that I should come over to the opera house, where the rest of the company awaited us, to assist at a rehearsal in the part left open by the illness of the star. I do not now recall if the manager actually made me an offer in this first encounter, but it was in the air that if I suited the part and this part suited me, I was to regard myself as temporarily engaged in Miss Dean's place. So naturally had the occasion come about, that I cannot remember that I found any particular difficulty in reconciling myself to a possible connection with the professional stage. There had been no church of my denomination at Higgleston, and I had affiliated with one made up of the remnants of two or three other houseless sects, under the caption of the United Congregations, and there was nothing in its somewhat loose and disciplined that positively forbade the theatre. In my work with McWhirter, the play had come to mean so much the intimate expression of life, so wove itself with all that had been profound and heroic in the experience of the people, 
that it seemed to come quite as a matter of course for me to be walking out between the captain and the manager toward the opera house. O'Farrell, too, must have beguiled me with that extraordinary Celtic faculty for the sympathetic note, for I am sure I received the impression as we went that his play, The Shamrock, meant quite as much to the Irish temperament as the spy could mean to Ohiana. The manager and Mr. McWhorter had crossed one another's trails on more than one occasion, which seemed to give the whole affair the color of neighborliness. It transpired in the course of our walk that Lorene Dean, America's greatest emotional actress, it was a feral called her that, had been taken down at Waterbury with bronchitis, and the cast, having been already disarranged by an earlier defection, he had been obliged to cancel several one-night stands and put in at Kincaid to wait until a substitute could be procured from St. Louis or Chicago, which difficulty was happily obviated by the discovery of Mrs. Olivia Bettersworth. All this, as I was to learn later, was not so near the truth as it might be, but it served. I could never make out, so insistent was each to claim the credit of it, whether it was O'Farrell or McWhorter first thought of offering the part to me, but there it was for me to take it or leave it as I was so inclined. Our own performance was in the Armory Hall, and this was my first entrance of the back premises of a proper stage. I recall as we came in through the stage door having no feeling about it all, but an odd one of being entirely habituated to such entrances. They were all there waiting for us, the shamrocks, grouped around the prompter's table in a dimly lit, dusty space, with a half-conscious staginess even in their informal groupings, men and women regarding me with a queer mixture of coldness and ingratiation. I had time to take that in, and an impression of shoppy smartness, before manager O'Farrell, with a movement like the shuffling of cards, drew us all together in a kind of general introduction, and commanded the rehearsal to begin. Well, I went on with it as I suppose it was foregone I should, as soon as I had smelled the dust of action, which was the stale and musty cloud that rolled up on our skirts from the floor and shook down upon our shoulders from the wings, too unsophisticated even to guess at the situation which the manager's air of genial hurry was so admirably planned to cover. I read from the prompter's book, O'Farrell had sketched the plot to me on the way over, and did my utmost to keep up with his hasty interpolations of the business. I was feeling horribly amateurish and awkward in the presence of these second-rate folk, whom I took always far too seriously, and suddenly swamped in confusion at hearing the manager call out to me from the orchestra what was meant for instruction in an utterly unintelligible professional jargon. McWhorter, through some notion, I suppose, of keeping his work innocuously amateurish, had used no sort of staginess, and the phrase froze me into mortification. With the strain of attention I was already under, I could not even make an intelligent guess at his meaning, as O'Farrell, mistaking my hesitation, repeated it with growing peremptoriness. I could see the rest of the cast who were on the stage with me, aware of my embarrassment, and letting the situation fall with a kind of sulky detachment, which struck me then, and still, as vulgar rather than cruel. Suddenly. From behind me a voice smooth and full translated the clipped jargon into ordinary speech. I had not time, as I moved to obey it, for so much as a grateful glance over my shoulder, but I knew very well that the voice had come from a young woman of about my own age, who, as I entered at the beginning of the rehearsal, had been sitting in the wings, taking in my introduction with the gaze of a tethered cow, quiet and curious, oblivious of the tether. As soon as I was free from the first act, I got around to her. "'Thank you so much,' I began. "'You see, I am not used—' "'Why do you care?' she wondered. 
It is only a kind of slang. They all had to learn it once. I could see that she sprang from my own class. Taylorville, the high school, the village dressmaker, might have turned her out that moment. And by degrees I was aware that she was beautiful. Pale, tanned complexion, thick, untaught masses of brown hair, and pale brown eyes of a profound and unfathomed rurality. As she moved to cross the stage at the prompter's call, with her skirts bunched up on her hip with a safety pin out of the dust, as if she had just come from scrubbing the dairy, I fairly started with the shock of her bodily perfection and her extraordinary manner of going about with it, as though it were something picked up in passing for the convenience of covering. It provoked me to the same sort of involuntary exclamation as though one should see a child playing with a rare porcelain. By contrast, she seemed to bring out in the others streaks and flashes of cheapness, of the stain and wear of unprofitable use. She came to me at the end of her seam. Where do you live? she wished to know. I can come around with you and coach you with your part. I'm not sure, I hesitated. I don't know if I shall go on with it. She took me again with her slow and curious gaze. Why, what else are you here for? That, in fact, appeared to be Mr. O'Farrell's view of it, and though I went through the form of taking the day to think it over and telegraph to Tommy, I did finally engage myself to the Shamrock Company for the term of Miss Dean's illness. My husband made no objection, except that he preferred that I should not use my own name, as indeed O'Farrell had no notion of my doing, as the posters and programs stood in Miss Dean's name already. We had from Thursday to Monday to get up my part. With all my quickness I could not have managed it, except for the alacrity with which, after the first day, all the company played up to my business, prompted me in my lines, and assisted in my make-up. There was, if I had but known it, a reason for this extra helpfulness, which, remembering the way the ladies of the United Congregations had pulled and hauled about the Easter entertainment, went far with me toward raising the estimate of professional acting among the blessed privileges. Several members of the cast had felt themselves entitled to Miss Dean's place, for the manager had refused to pay an understudy, and found it easier to concede it to me, a brilliant society woman as I had been figured to them. I suspected McWhorter there, a talented amateur who would return to privacy and trouble the profession no more, rather to one who might be expected to develop tendencies to keep what she had got. Moreover, they had played to small houses of late, most of the salaries were in arrears, and from the first of my taking hold of it, it began to be certain that the piece would go. For I not only played the part of the gay, melodramatic Irish Eileen, but I played with it. There was all my youth in it, the youth I hadn't had. There was wild Ellen McGee, and the wet pastures and the woods aflame. With Tommy and a home to fall back upon, with no professional standing to keep, with no bitterness and rancors, I adventured with the part, tossed it up and made sport of it, played it as a stupendous lark. The rest of the company took it from me that it was a lark, and were as solicitous to see it through for me as though I had been an only child among a lot of maiden ants. And I did not know, of course, that this charm of good fellowship was based more directly on the box office returns than on the community of art. Incidentally, a great deal that went on in my behalf threw light on the character and disposition of the star. I most wore my fingers off hooking her up, confided the dresser who took in her gowns for me. But she won't let out an inch, not she. Well, this spell'll pull her down a bit. That's one comfort. Cecilia Brune made me up. She was the youngest member of the company, and that she was distractingly and unnecessarily pretty didn't obviate the certainty 
that in Milwaukee, where she was born, she had been known as Sissy Brown. You don't really need anything but a little color and black around the eyes, she insisted. Dean is a sight when she's made up. Got so much to cover. I'll bet she's no sicker than me. She's just taking the slack time to get her wrinkles massaged. Gee, if I had a face like hers, I'd take it off and have it ironed. Cecilia, I may remarked, lived for her prettiness. She lived by it. She had a speaking part of half a dozen lines and a dance in the village green act, and her mere appearance on the street of any town where we were billed was good for two solid rows clear across the house. In Cecilia's opinion, this was the quintessence of art, to attract males and keep them dangling, and to eke out her personal adornment by gifts which she managed to extract from her admirers without having yet paid the inestimable price for them. Married woman as I was, I was too countrified to understand that inevitably she must finally pay it. She had all the dewy, large-eyed softness of look that one reluctantly disassociates from innocence, and a degree of cold, grubby calculation which she mistook, flaunted about, in fact, for chastity. It was she who told me as much as I got to know for a great many years of Sarah Croydon, who had already taken me with the fascination of her gift, the inordinate curiosity to know, to touch and to prove, which makes me still the victim of its least elusive promise and the dupe of any poor pretender to it. I wanted something to account for, except when she was under the obsession of a part, her marked inadequacy to her perfect exterior, for the rich, full voice that, caught in the wind of her genius, gripped and threatened, but ran through her ordinary conversation as flaccid as a velvet ribbon. She was, by Cecilia's account, the daughter of a Baptist elder in a small New York town, strictly brought up. I could measure the wheels of the strictness upon my own heart, and had run away with an actor named Lawrence, after one wild brief encounter when O'Farrell had been playing in the town. That was before Cecilia's time, and she had no report of the said Lawrence, except that he was as handsome as they make them, and a regular rotter. She'd ought to have known, opined Cecilia, though where in her nineteen years she could have acquired the groundwork of such knowledge was more than I could guess. She ought to have known what she was up against by his being so willing to marry her. He wouldn't have put his head in a noose like that without he had hold of the loose end of it himself. That he had so held it transpired in less than a year, in the reappearance of a former wife, who turned up at his lodging one night to wait his return from the theatre, where, no one knew by what diabolical agency, Lawrence had word of her, and made what Cecilia called a getaway. What passed between the two women on that occasion must have been noteworthy, but it was sunk forever under Sarah's unfathomable rurality. O'Farrell, who of his class was a very decent sort, had been so little able to bear the sight of beauty in distress that he offered the poor girl an unimportant part as an alternative to starvation, and Sarah had very quickly settled what was to become of her by developing extraordinary talent. I think no one of us at that time quite realized how good she was. Cecilia Brune, I know, did not even think her beautiful. No style she said, settling her corset at the hips and fluffing up her pompadour with my comb, and no figure. But myself, I seemed to see her the mere embodiment of a gift which had snatched at this chance encounter with an actor to swing into opportunity regardless of its host. Whenever I watched her acting, some living impulse deep within me reared its head. I have set all this down here because, with the exception of manager O'Farrell and Jimmy Vantine, the comedian, who was thirty-five, objectionable, and in love with Cecilia, 
These two women were all I ever saw again of the shamrock players. Miss Dean I did not meet on this occasion, for though at the end of three weeks, before I had time to tire of travel and new towns and nightly triumphs, she wrote she would return to her work. It fell out that she did not actually return until I was well on my way home. I thought she would have a quick recovery when she found out what a sweep you'd been making, remarked Cecilia. That was all the comment that passed on the occasion. If Mr. O'Farrell made no motion toward making me a permanent member of his company, there were reasons for it that I understood better later. I had to own to a little disappointment that nobody came to the station to see me off except Cecilia and Sarah Croydon. It is true Jimmy Vanting was there, but he left us in no doubt that he only came because Cecilia had promised to spend the interval between their train and my own in his company. He fussed about with my luggage in order to get me off as quickly as possible. The very bread-and-buttery relation of the shamrocks to what was, for me, the community of art, had never struck so sourly upon me as at the casual quality of their goodbyes. I remembered noticing that morning how very little hair there was on top of Jimmy Van Teen's head, and that he did not seem to me quite clean. I found myself so let down after the three weeks' excitement that I thought it necessary at Springfield, where I changed, to interpose two days' shopping between me and Hickleston. Among other things I bought there was a spirit lamp and a brass tea kettle. End of Book Two, Chapter Four. Book Two, Chapter Five of A Woman of Genius by Mary Hunter Austin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Book Two, Chapter Five. Understand that up to this time I had not yet thought of the stage as a career for myself. I hadn't yet needed it. I had not then realized that the insight and passion which have singled me out among women of my profession couldn't be turned to render the mere business of living beautiful and fit. I hardly understand it now. Why should people pay night after night to see me loving, achieving, suffering, in a way they wouldn't think of undertaking for themselves? Life as I saw it was sufficiently dramatic charged, wonderful. I at least felt at home in the great moments of kings, the tender hours of poets, and I hadn't thought of my participation in these things rendering me in any way superior to Higgleston or even different. If I had, I shouldn't have settled there in the first place. If I had glimpsed even at Tommy's exclusion from all that mattered passionately to me, I shouldn't have married him, it was because I had not yet begun to be markedly dissatisfied with either of them that I presently got myself the reputation of having trampled both Tommy and Higgleston underfoot. I must ask your patience for a little until I show you how wholly I offered myself to them both and how completely they wouldn't have me. The point of departure was, of course, that I didn't accept the Higglestonian reading of married obligations to mean that my whole time was to be taken up with just living with Tommy. It was as natural, and in the view of the scope it afforded for individual development, a more convenient arrangement than living with my mother, but not a whit more absorbing. I couldn't, anyway, think of just living as an end and accordingly I looked about for a more spacious occupation. I thought I had found it in the directing of that submerged spiritual passion which I had felt in the sustaining drama of the war. I had a notion there might be a vent for it in the shape of a permanent dramatic society, by means of which all Higgleston, and I with them, could escape temporarily from its commonness into the heroic movement. It was all very clear in my own mind, but it failed utterly in communication. I began wrongly in the first place 
by asking the Hickleston ladies to tea. Afternoon tea was unheard of in Hickleston, and I had forgotten, or perhaps I had never learned, that in Hickleston you couldn't do anything different without implying dissatisfaction with things as they were. You were likely on such occasions to be visited by the inquiry as to whether the place wasn't good enough for you. As a matter of fact, afternoon tea was almost as unfamiliar to me as to the rest of them, but I had read English novels and I knew how it ought to be done. I knew, for instance, that people came and went with a delightful informality and had tea made fresh for them, and were witty or portentous as the occasion demanded. My invitations read from four to five, and the Higgleston ladies came solidly within the minute and departed in phalanxes upon the stroke of five. They all wore their best things, which, from the number of black silks included and black kid gloves not quite pulled on at the fingertips, gave the affair almost a funereal atmosphere. They had, most of them, had their tea with their midday meal, and Mrs. Dinklespiel said openly that she didn't approve of eating between meals. They sat about the room against the wall and fairly hypnotized me into getting up and passing things, which I knew was not the way tea should be served. In Hickleston, the only occasion when things were handed about were church sociables and the like, when the number of guests precluded the possibility of having them all at your table. And by the time I got once around, the tea was cold, and I realized how thin my thin bread and butter and chocolate wafers looked in respect to the huge, soft slabs of layer cake, stiffened by frosting and filling, which in Hickleston went by the name of light refreshments. The only saving incident was the natural way in which Mrs. Ross, our attorney's wife who visited East every summer and knew how things were done, asked for two lumps, please, and came back a second time for bread and butter. I think they were all tremendously pleased to be asked, though they didn't intend to commit themselves to the innovation by appearing to have a good time. And that was the occasion I chose for broaching my great subject without, I am afraid, in the least grasping their incapacity to share in my joyous discovery of the world of art, which I so generously held out to them. It hadn't been possible to keep my professional adventure from the townspeople, nor had I attempted it. What I really felt was that we were to be congratulated as a community in having one among us privileged to experience it, and I honestly think I should have felt so of anyone to whom the adventure had befallen. But I suspect I must have given the impression of rather flaunting it in their faces. I put my new project on the ground that though we were dissevered by our situation, there was no occasion for our being out of touch with the world of emotion, not, at least, so long as we had admission to it through the drama. And it wasn't in me to imagine that the world I prefigured to them under those terms was one by their standards never to be kept sufficiently at a distance. Mrs. Miller put the case for most of them with the suggestion thrown out guardedly that she didn't no, as she held with plays for church members. She was a large, tasteless woman whose husband kept the lumberyard and derived from it an extensive air of being in touch with the world's occupations. And I don't know, she went on relentlessly, that I ever see any good come of play-acting to them that practice it. Mrs. Ross, determined to live up to her two lumps, came forward gallantly with, "'Oh, but Mrs. Miller, when our dear Mrs. Bettersworth... "'That's what I was thinking of,' Mrs. Miller put it over her. "'Well, for my part,' declared Mrs. Dinklespiel, "'with the air of not caring who knew it, "'I don't want my girls to sell tickets or anything. "'It makes them too forward.' "'Mrs. Harvey, whose husband was in hardware, "'began to tell discursively about a perfectly lovely entertainment "'they had had in Newton Center for the Missionary Society, "'which Mrs. Miller took exception to on the ground of its frivolity. "'I don't know,' she maintained, 
if the Lord's work ain't hindered by them sort of comicalities as much as it's helped. I am not sure where this discussion mightn't have landed us if the general attention had not been distracted just then by my husband, an hour before his time, coming through the front gate and up the walk. He had evidently forgotten my tea party, for he came straight to me and backed away precipitately through the portiers as soon as he saw the assembled ladies sitting about the wall. It was not that which disturbed us. Any Higgleston male would have done the same, but it was plain in the brief glimpse we had of him that he looked white and stricken. A little later we heard him in the back of the house, making ambiguous noises, such as not one of my guests could fail to understand as the precursor of a domestic crisis. I could see the little flutter of uneasiness which passed over them, between their sense of its demanding my immediate attention and the fear of leaving before the expressed time. Fortunately, the stroke of five released them. The door was hardly shut on the last silk skirt, when I ran out and found him staring out of the kitchen window. Well, I questioned. I thought they would never go, he protested. Come in here. He led the way to the living room as if somehow he found it more appropriate to the gravity of what he had to impart, and yet failed to make a beginning with his news. He shut the door and leaned against it with his hands behind him for support. Has anything happened? Happened? Oh, I don't know. I've lost my job. Lost? Burton Brothers? I was all at sea. He nodded. They're closing out. The manager's in town today. He told us. By degrees, I got it out of him. Burton Brothers thought they saw hard times ahead. They were closing out a number of their smaller establishments, centering everything on their Chicago house. Suddenly my thought leaped up. But couldn't they give you something there, in Chicago? I was dizzy for a moment with the wild hope of it. Never to live in Hinkleston any more. But Tommy cut me short. They've men who've been with them longer than I have to provide for. I asked. Oh, well, no matter. The world is full of jobs. Looking for one appealed to me in the light of an adventure but because I saw how pale he was, I went to him and began to kiss him softly. By the way he yielded himself to me, I grasped a little of his lost and rudderless condition once he found himself outside the limits of a salaried employment. I began to question him again as the best way of getting the extent of our disaster before us. What does Mr. Rathbone say? Rathbone was our working tailor, a thin, elderly, peering man, of a sort you could scarcely think of as having any existence apart from his shop. He used to come sidling down the street to it and settle himself among his implements with the air of a brooding hen taking to her nest. The sound of his machine was a contented clucking. He was struck all of a heap. They're better fixed than we are. Tommy added this as an afterthought, as likely to affect the tailor's attitude when he came to himself. They were old Rathbone and his daughter, one of those conspicuously blonde and full-breasted women who seemed to take to the dressmaking and millinery trades by instinct. As she got herself up on Sunday in her smart tailoring, with a hat from the city, and her hair amazingly pompadoured, she was to some of the men who came to our church, very much what the brass tea kettle was to me, a touch of the unattainable but not unappreciated elegancies of life. Tommy admired her immensely and was disappointed that I did not have her at the house oftener. They've got her business to fall back on, Tommy suggested now with an approach to envy. He had never seen Miss Rathbone as I had, professionally going about with her protuberant bosom stuck full of pins, a tape line draped about her collarless neck, and her skirt and belt never quite together in the back, 
so he thought of her establishment as a kind of stay in affliction. And I have the stage, I flourished. It was the first time I had thought of it as an expedient, but I glanced away from the thought in passing, for to say the truth, I didn't in the least know how to go about getting a living by it. I creamed some chipped beef for Tommy's supper, a dish he was particularly fond of, and opened a jar of quince marmalade, and all the time I wasn't stirring something or setting the table, I had my arms around him, trying to prop him against what I did not feel so much terrifying as exciting. We talked a little about his getting his old place back in Taylorville, and just as we were clearing away the supper things, we saw Miss Rathbone, with her father tucked under her arm, pass the square of light "'rain out into the spring dusk from our window. "'And a moment later they knocked at our door. "'It was one of the things that I felt bound to like Miss Rathbone for, "'that she took such care of her father. "'She did everything for him, it was said, "'even to making up his mind for him. "'And this evening, by the flare of the lamp Tommy held up to welcome them, "'it was clear she had made it up to some purpose.' It must have been what he saw in her face that made my husband put the lamp back on the table from which the white cloth had not yet been removed, as if the clearing up was too small a matter to consort with the occasion. I was relieved to have my husband take charge of the visit, especially as he made no motion to invite them into the front room, where the remains of the bread and butter and the chairs against the wall would have apprised Miss Rathbone of my having entertained company on an occasion to which she had not been invited. It was part of Tommy's sense of social obligation that we ought never to neglect Mr. Rathbone, whom, though his connection with the business was as slight as my husband's, he insisted on regarding as in some sort of partner. So we sat down rather stiffly about the table, still shrouded in its white cloth, as though upon it were about to be laid out the dead enterprise of Burton Brothers, and looked, all of us, I think, a little pleased to find ourselves in so grave a situation. Miss Rathbone, who had always a great many accessories to her toilet, bags and handkerchiefs and scarves and things, laid them on the table as though they were a kind of insignia of office, and made a poor pretense to keep up with me the proper feminine detachment from the business which had brought them there. We neither of us, Miss Rathbone and I, had the least idea what the other might be thinking about or presumably interested in, though I think she made the more gallant effort to pretend that she did. On this evening I could see that she was full of the project for which she had primed her father, and was nervously anxious lest he shouldn't go off at the right moment or with the proper pyrotechnic. I remember the talk that went on at first, because it was so much in the way of doing business in Higgleston, and impressed me even then with its facetious shrewdness, based very simply on the supposition that capitalist, it was under that caption that Burton Brothers figured, never meant what they said. Capitalists were always talking of hard times. It was part of their deep-laid perspicacity. Burton Brothers wished to sell out the business. Was it reasonable to suppose they would think it good enough to sell and not good enough to go on with? Father thinks, said Miss Rathbone, and I am sure he had done so dutifully at her instigation that they couldn't ask no great price after talking about hard times the way they have. It was not in keeping with what was thought to be woman's place that she should go on to the completed suggestion. In fact, so far as I remember it never was completed, but was talked around and about, as if by indirection we could lessen the temerity of the proposal that old Rathbone and Tommy should buy out the shop on such favorable terms as Burton Brothers in view of their own statement of its depreciation, couldn't fail to make. You could live over the store, Miss Rathbone let fall into the widening rings of silence that followed her first suggestion. 
Your rent would be cheaper, and it would come into the business. I felt that she made it too plain that the chief objection that my husband could have was the lack of money for the initial adventure. But because I realized that much of my instinctive resistance to a plan that tied him to Higgleston as to a stake was due to her having originated it, I kept it to myself. I had a hundred inarticulate objections, chief of which was that I couldn't see how any plan that was acceptable to the Rathbones could get me on toward the shining destiny. But when you remember that I hadn't yet been able to put that concretely to myself, you will see how impossible it was that I should have put it to my husband. In the end, Tommy was talked over. I believe the consideration of going on in the same place and under the same circumstances without the terrifying dislocation of looking for a job, had more to do with it than Miss Rathbone's calculation of the profits. We wrote home for the money. Effie wrote back that everything of mother's was involved in the stationary business, which was still on the doubtful side of prosperity. But Tommy's father let us have $300. The necessity of readjusting our way of life to Tommy's new status of proprietor and moving in over the store kept my plans for the dramatic exploitation of Higgleston in abeyance. It seemed, however, by as much as I was now bound up with the interest of the community to put me on a better footing for beginning it, and on Decoration Day, walking in the cemetery under the bright boughs between the flowery mounds, the gift stirred in me, played upon by this touching dramatization of common human pain and loss. I recalled that it was just such solemn festivals of the people that I had had in mind to lay hold on and make the medium of a profounder appreciation, and the next one about to present itself as an occasion was the 4th of July. I detached myself from Tommy long enough to make my way around to two or three of the ladies who usually served on the committee. "'We ought to have a meeting soon now,' I suggested. "'It will take all of a month to get the children ready.' "'That's what we thought,' agreed Mrs. Miller heavily. "'They was to our house Thursday.' She went on to tell me who was to read the declaration and who deliver the oration. "'But,' I protested, "'that's exactly what they've had every fourth these twenty years.' "'Well, I guess,' said Mrs. Harvey, "'if Higgleston people want that kind of a celebration, "'they've a right to have it.' I guess they have, Mrs. Miller agreed with her. They had always rather held it out against me at Higgleston that I had never taken the village squabble seriously, that I was reconciled too quickly for a proper sense of their proportions, and they must have reckoned without this quality in me now, for I was so far from realizing the deliberateness of the slight that I thought I would go around on the way home and see our minister. Perhaps he could do something. It appeared simply ridiculous that Higgleston shouldn't have the newest of this sort of thing when it was there for the asking. I found him raking the garden in his third best suit and the impossible sort of hat affected by professional men in their more human occasions. The moment I flashed out at him with my question about the committee, he fell at once into a manner of ministerial equivocation the air of being man enough to know he was doing a mean thing without being man enough to avoid doing it. Er, yes, he believed there had been a meeting. He hadn't realized that I was expecting to be notified. I wasn't a regular member, was I? No, I admitted, but last year... The intention of the slight began to dawn on me. You see, the program is usually made up from the children of the United Sunday Schools. I know, of course, but what has that... He did know how mean it was. I could see by the dexterity with which he delivered the blow. A good many of the mothers thought they'd rather not have them exposed to, er, uh, professional methods. 
As an afterthought, he tried to give it the cast of a priestly remonstrance, which he must have seen didn't in the least impose on me. I suppose it was the fear of how I might put it to one of his best-paying parishioners that led him to go around to the store the next morning and make matters worse by explaining to Tommy that though the children weren't to be contaminated by my professionalism, it could probably be arranged for me to recite something. To do Tommy justice, he was as mad as a hatter. Being so much nearer to village-mindedness himself, I suppose my husband could better understand the mean envy of my larger opportunity, but his obduracy in maintaining that I had been offended led to the only real initiative he ever showed in all the time I was married to him. "'I'd just like to show them,' he kept sputtering. All at once he cheered up with a snort. "'I'll show them!' He was very busy all the evening with letters, which he went out on purpose to post, with the result that when a few days later he made his contribution to the fireworks fund, he made it a little larger, as became a live businessman, on the ground that he wouldn't be able to participate, as his wife had accepted an invitation to take charge of the program at Newton Center. Newton Center was ten miles away, and though I couldn't do much on account of the difficulty of rehearsals, I managed to make the announcement of it in the county paper convey to them that what they had missed wasn't quite to be sicklied over with Mrs. Miller's asseveration of a notable want of moral particularity at Newton Center. The very first time I went out to a Sunday school social thereafter, it was made plain to me that if I wanted to take up the annual library entertainment, it was open to me. And I always will say, Mrs. Miller conceded, that there's nobody can make your children seem such a credit to you as Mrs. Bettersworth. It's a regular talent you have, Mrs. Harvey backed her up, like a person in the Bible. This scriptural reference came in so aptly that I could see several ladies nodding complacently. Mrs. Ross sailed quite over them and landed on the topmost peak of approbation. I've always believed, she asserted, that a Christian woman on the stage would have an uplifting influence. But by this time my ambition had slacked under the summer heat and the steady cluck of old Rathbone's machine and the mixed smell of damp woolen under the iron and creosote shingle stains. There had been no loss of social standing in our living over the store. Such readjustments in Higgleston went by the name of bettering yourself, and were commendable. But somehow I could never ask ladies to tea when the only entrance was by way of a men's furnishing store. The four rooms, opening into one another so that there was no way of getting from the kitchen to the parlor except through the bedroom, I found quite hopeless as a means of expressing my relation to all that appealed to me as inspiring, dazzling. Because I could not go out without making a street toilet, I went out too little, and suffered from want of tone. And suddenly, along in September, came a letter from O'Farrell, offering me a place in his company, and a note from Sarah, begging me to accept it. If up to that time I had not thought of the stage as a career, now at the suggestion, the desire of it, ravened in me like a flame. End of Book Two, Chapter Five Book Two, Chapter Six of A Woman of Genius by Mary Hunter Austin This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Book Two, Chapter Six "'And you never seem to think I might not want my wife to go on the stage?' "'I do not know what unhappy imp prompted Tommy to take that tone with me, "'but whenever I tried to fix upon the point of reprehensibleness, "'which led on from my writing to O'Farrell, 
that I would join him in ten days in Chicago, to the tragic termination of my marriage, I found myself whirled about this attitude of his in the deep-seated passionate why of my life. Why should love be tied to particular ways of doing things? What was this horror of human obligation that made it necessary, since Tommy and I were so innocently fond of one another, that one of us should be made unhappy by it? Why should it be so accepted on all sides that it should be I? For my husband's feeling was but a single item in the total of social prejudice, by which, once my purpose had gone abroad by way of the Rathbones, I found myself driven apart from the community interest as by a hostile tide, across which Higgleston gazed at me with strange, begrudging eyes. I recall how the men looked at me the first time I went out afterward, a little aslant, as though some eradicable taint of impropriety attached in their minds to any association with the stage. Whatever attitude Tommy finally achieved in the necessity of sustaining the situation he had created for himself by his backing of my first professional venture, was no doubt influenced by the need of covering his hurt at realizing, through my own wild rush to embrace the present opportunity, how far I was from accepting life gracefully at his hands, the docile creature of his dreams. Little things come back to me, words, looks, sticks and straws of his traditions made wreckage by the wind of my desire, which my resentment at his implication in the general attitude prevented me from fully estimating. My mother, too, to whom I wrote my decision as soon as I had arrived at it, in a long letter designed to convince me that a wife's chief duty and becomingness lay in seeing that nothing of her lapped over the bounds prescribed by her husband's capacity, contributed to the exasperated sense I had of having every step toward the fulfillment of my natural gift dragged at by loving hands. Poor mother, I am afraid I never quite realized what a duckling I turned out to her, nor with what magnanimity she faced it. But I suppose you think you are doing right, she wrote at the end, and then in a postscript. I read in the papers there is a church in New York that gives communion to actors, but I don't expect you will get as far as that. It was finally Miss Rathbone who relieved the situation by pulling Tommy over to a consenting frame of mind in consideration of the neat little plumlet she extracted from it for herself by making me a traveling dress in three days. She brought it down to the house for me to try on, and it was pathetic to see the way my husband hung upon the effect she made for him of turning me out in a way that was a credit to them both. "'You'll see,' she seemed to be saying to him by nothing more explicit than an exclamation full of pins and a clever way of squinting at the hang of my skirt." that when we two take up a hand at the affairs of the great world, we can come up to the best of them. And all the time I could hear the Higgleston ladies drumming up trade for her out of Newton Center with their, Stylish? Oh, very. She makes all her clothes for Mrs. Buttersworth, Olivia Lattimore, the actress, you know. Just at the end, though, when we were lying in bed the last morning, afraid to go to sleep again lest we shouldn't get up early enough to catch the train, I believe if Tommy had risen superior to his traditional objection to a married woman having interests outside her home, and claimed me by some strong personal need of his own, I should have answered it gladly. The trouble with my husband's need of me was that it left too much over. But of course, he reminded me at the station, you can give it up any minute if you want to. I think quite to the last he hoped I would rise to some such generous pretense and come back to him, but we neither of us had much notion of the nature of a player's contract. I had arranged to stay with Pauline until I could look about me, and from the little that I had been able to tell her of my affairs, I could see she was in a flutter what to think of me. During the five days I was in her house, 
I watched her swing through a whole arc of possible attitudes to settle with truly remarkable instinct on the one which her own future permitted her most consistently to maintain. You dear, ridiculous child! She hovered over the point with indulgent patronage. What will you think of next? Pauline herself was going through a phase at the time. They had moved out to a detached house at Evanston on account of its being better for the baby, and there was a visible diminution of her earlier effective housewifely efficiency in view of Henry's growing prosperity. You could see all Pauline's surfaces like a tulip bed in February, budding toward a new estimate of her preciousness in terms of her husband's income. When she took me by the shoulders, holding me off from her to give play to the pose of amused, affectionate bewilderment, I could see just where the consciousness of a more acceptable femininity, as evinced by her being provided with a cook and a housemaid, prompted her to this gracious glozing of my not being in quite so fortunate a case. I was to be the wonder, the sport on the feminine bush, dear and extenuated, made adorably not to feel my excluding variation, an attitude not uncommon in wives of well-to-do husbands toward women who work. It was an attitude successfully kept up by Pauline Mills, for as long as I provided her the occasion. Just at first, I suspect I rather contributed to it by my own feeling of its being such a tremendous adventure for me. Olivia Lattimore, with Taylorville, Hadley's Pasture, and the McGee children behind me, to be going on the stage. How I exulted in it all. The hall bedroom where I finally settled across from Sarah Croydon, the worry of rehearsals, the baked smell of the streets bored through by the raw lake winds, the beckoning night lights, the vestibule of doors opening on the solemn splendor of the world. At the rehearsals I met Cecilia Brune, if anything prettier than before, and quite perceptibly harder, and Jimmy Vantine, still in love with her, still with his bald crown not quite clean, and the same objectionable habit of sidling about, fingering one's dress, laying hands on one as he talked. I met Manager O'Farrell, not a whit altered, and Miss Lorene Dean. I liked and I didn't like her. She drew by a certain warm charm of personality that repelled in closer quarters by its odors of sickliness. There was a quality in her beauty as of a flower kept too long in its glass, not so much withered as ready to fall apart. She had small appealing hands, such as moved one to take them up and handle them, and served somehow to mitigate a subtle impression of impropriety conveyed by her slight sideways smile. She was probably good-natured by temperament and peevish through excessive use of cigarettes. She made a point of always speaking well of everybody, but it was a long time before I learned that no sort of blame was so deadly as her commendation. Such a beautiful woman Miss Croydon is, she would say. Isn't it a pity about her nose? And though I had never thought of Sarah's nose as mitigating against her perfection, I found myself after that thinking of it. You could see that magnanimity, which was her chosen attitude, was often a strain to her. I do not think she had any gift at all, but she had a perception of it that had enabled her to produce a very tolerable imitation of acting and kept her, in a covert way, inordinately jealous of the gift in others. She was jealous of mine. It was not all at once I discovered it. In the beginning, because I never detected her in any of the obvious snatchings of lines and positions that went on at rehearsals, but even making a stand for me against incursions into my part, which I was too unaccustomed to forestall, I thought of her as being of rather better strain than most of the company.' 
I was probably the only member of it unaware of her deliberate measures not to permit me such a footing as might lead to my supplanting her with manager O'Farrell, toward whom I began to find myself in what, for me, was an interesting and charming relation. It was a relation I should have been glad to maintain with any member of the company, but it was only O'Farrell who found himself equal to it. I was full and effervescing with the joy of creation. Night by night, as I felt the working of the living organism, we should have been, transmitting supernal energies of emotion to the audience, who by the very communicating act became a part of us, I felt myself also warming toward my fellow players. I was so charged I should have struck a spark from any one of them when we met, but for the fact that by degrees I discovered that they presented to me the negative pole. I was aware of such communicating fluid between particular pairs of them. I saw it spark from eye to eye, heard it break in voices. It flashed like sheet lightning about our horizons on occasions of great triumph, but I was distinctly alive to the fact that the medium by which it was accomplished was turned from me. At times I was brushed by the wing of a suspicion that among the men there was something almost predetermined in their denial of what was, for me, the sympathetic creative impulse. I was a little ashamed for them of the gaucherie of withholding what seemed so important to our common success, and yet I seemed always to be surprising all of them at it, except Jimmy Van Teen and the manager. I couldn't, of course, on account of his propensity for laying hands on one, take it from Jimmy, but between Mr. O'Farrell and me it ran with a pleasant, profitable warmth. I was conscious always of acting better the scenes I had with him. The thrill of them was never quite broken in off-the-stage hours. I felt myself sustained by it. For one thing the man had genuine talent— and I think besides Sarah Croydon and Jimmy Vanteen, no one else in the company had very much. Jimmy had a gift, besmeared and discredited by his own cheapness, but O'Farrell had a real flowing genius and a degree of personal vitality that sketched him out as by fire from the flat Taylorville types I had known. We used to talk together about my own possibilities— and I had many helpful hints from him, but in spite of this friendliness I never made any way with him against Miss Dean. Not that I tried, but by degrees I found that suggestions made and favors asked were granted or accepted on the basis of their non-interference with our leading lady. I was not without intimations, which I usually disregarded because I found their conclusions impossible to maintain that she even triumphed over me in little matters too inconsiderable to have been taken into account, except on the understanding that we were pitted in a deliberate rivalry. I was hurt and amazed at times to discover that we presented this aspect to the rest of the company. I felt that I was being judged by my conduct of a business in which I was not engaged." The situation, however, had not developed to such a pitch by the time we played in Kincaid that it could affect my pleasure in the visit Tommy paid me there. I was overjoyed to have the arms of my own man about me again. I was proud of his pride in my success as Polly Eccles, and pleased to have him and Sarah pleased with one another. I thought then that if I could only have Tommy and my work, I should ask no more of destiny. I do not now see why I couldn't, but I like best to think of him as he seemed to me then, wholesome and good, raised by his joy of our reunion almost to my excited playing, generous in his sharing of my triumphs. It seemed for the moment to put my feet quite on solid ground. I knew at last where I was." It was about a month after this that I began to find myself pitted against Miss Dean in a struggle for some dimly grasped advantage, with the dice cogged against me. I saw myself in the general estimate, 
convinced of handling my game badly, and could form no guess even at the expected moves. I smarted under a sense that Manager O'Farrell was not backing up the friendliness of our relations, and I remember saying to Sarah Croydon once that I suspected Miss Dean was using her sex attraction against me, but I missed the point of Sarah's slow, commiserating smile. At the time we were all more or less swamped by the discomforts of our wintry flights from town to town, execrable hotels, irregular and unsatisfying meals. One and another of us went down with colds, and finally toward the end of February I was taken with a severe neuralgia. It reached its acutest stage the first night we played at Louisville. I had hurried home from the theater the moment I was released from my part, to find relief from it in rest, but an hour or two later, still suffering and discovering that I had taken all my powders, I decided to go down to Sarah's room on the lower floor to ask for some that I knew she had. I slipped on my shoes and a thick gray dressing gown, and taking the precaution of wrapping my head in a shawl against the drafty halls, I went down to her. I was returning with the box of powders in my hand when I was startled by the sound of a door lifting carefully on the latch. The hotel was built in the shape of a capital T, with the stair halfway of the stem. I was almost at the foot of it, facing the cross-hall, that gave me a view of the door of Miss Dean's room, and I saw now that it was slightly ajar. I shrank instinctively into the shadow of the recess where the stair began, for I was unwilling that anybody should see the witch I looked in my dressing-gown and shawl. In the interval before the door widened, I heard the tick of a tin-faced clock just across from me. Part of the enamel was fallen away from the face of it so that it looked as if eaten upon by discreditable sores. A chandelier holding two smoky kerosene lamps hung slightly awry at the crossing of the T and cast a tipsy shadow. The door swung back slightly, it opened into the room, and a man came out of it and crossed directly in front of me, probably to his room in the other arm of the T. Once out of the door, it snapped softly to behind him, and the man fell instantly into a manner that disconnected him with it to a degree that could only have been possible to an accomplished actor. If I had not seen him come out of it, I should have supposed him abroad upon such a casual errand as my own. But there was no mistaking that it was Manager O'Farrell, by the tin-faced clock it was a quarter past one, and he would have been home from the theatre more than an hour. I got up to my room somehow. I think my neuralgia must have left me with the shock. I can't remember feeling it any more after that. You have to remember that this was my first actual contact with sin of any sort. Generations of the stock of Methodism revolted in me. I had liked the man. I had thought of our relation as something precious, to be kept intact because it nourished the quality of our art, and I had all the conventional woman's horror of being brought in touch with looseness. It was part of the admitted business of the men of my class to keep their women from such contacts, and Manager O'Farrell had allowed me to enter into a sort of rivalry with the shameless woman, with his mistress. I have always been what the country people in Ohiana call a knowledgeable woman. I have not much faculty of getting news of a situation through the facts as they present themselves, but I have instincts which, under the stimulus of emotion, work with extraordinary celerity and thoroughness. Now suddenly the half-apprehended suggestion of the last few months took fire from the excitement of my mind and exploded into certainties. I sensed all at once intolerable things, the withholden eyes, the covert attention fixed on my relations with the manager and Miss Dean. I lay on the bed and shuddered with dry sobs. Other times I lay still, awake and blazing. About daylight, Sarah came up to inquire how my neuralgia did. She found me with the unopened box 
clutched tightly in my hand. She turned up the smoky gas and noted the dark circles under my eyes. What has happened? Something I know, she insisted gently. I blurted it out. Mr. O'Farrell, I saw him come out of Miss Dean's room. At a quarter of one, he was... Oh, Sarah, he was... I relapsed again into the horror of it. Oh, she said. She turned out the light and came and forced me gently under the covers and got into bed beside me. Didn't you know? she questioned. Did you? No one really knows these things. I didn't want to be the first to suggest it to you. Do the others know? As much as we do. It has been going on a long time. And you put up with it? You go about with them? I was astonished at the welling up of disgust in me. Sarah felt for my hand and held it. My dear, in our business you have to learn to take no notice. It is not that these things are so much worse with actors, but it is more difficult to keep them covered up. You must know that a great many people do such things. I know, wicked people. I never thought of its being done by anybody you liked. Oh, yes, she was perfectly simple. You can like them. You can like them greatly. I remembered that I oughtn't to have said that to Sarah Croydon. You mustn't think Mr. O'Farrell such a bad man. He is probably fond of her. In some respects, he is a very good man. When I was left without a penny, he might have made terms with me. Some managers would. But he gave me a living salary and left me to myself. He has been very kind to me. But she... I choked back my sick resentment to get at what had been tearing its way through my consciousness for the last three hours. She must have thought that that was what I wanted of him. Well, it is natural she should be anxious with other women about. She is in love with him. Did you think so? About me, I mean? No, said Sarah. No, I didn't think so. It was light enough now to show the outline of the drifts along the sills and the fine gritty powder which the wind dashed intermittently against the panes. The filter of day under the scant blinds brought out in the affair streaks of vulgarity as evident as the pattern of the paper on the wall. It seemed to borrow cheapness from the broken castor of the bureau as from my recollection of the eaten face of the clock and the leaning chandelier. I sat up in the bed and laid hold of Sarah in my eagerness to get clear of what, by my mere knowledge of it, seemed an unbearable complicity. I had a feeling for him, I admitted. I could act better with him, but it was different from that. You know it was different. Yes, said Sarah, I know. I know because I am that way myself. It is like that, but it isn't that. I was still, holding my breath, while she considered. We were very close upon the twined roots of sex and art. There is a feeling that goes with acting, with other sorts of things, painting and music maybe, a feeling of your wanting to get through to something and lay hold of it, and your not being able to leaves you aching somehow, and you think if there's a particular person, I think O'Farrell would understand, it is being able to act makes you know the difference, I suppose. He really can act, you know, and you can, but Dean wouldn't understand, nor the others. My Mr. Lawrence didn't understand. It was the first time she had ever mentioned him to me. Sometimes I think they might have felt the difference just at first, but nobody told them and they got used to thinking it is the other thing. She drew me down into the bed again and covered me. You mustn't take it too hard. We all go through it once. And you are safe so long as you know. But I can't go on with it. I was positive on that point. 
Sarah, Sarah, don't say I have to go on with it. I know you can't, but you just have to. I should never be able to face either of them again without showing that I know. And then the others will know, and they will think... I threw out my arms, seeing how I was trapped. I wanted to cry out on them, to despise the woman openly. And they will think that I'm jealous, that I wanted it myself. I rolled in the bed and bit my hands with shame and anger. Sarah caught me in her arms and held me until the paroxysm passed. I was quieted at last from exhaustion. You can stay in your room today, she suggested. I can bring your meals up to you. This neuralgia will give you an excuse, and you needn't see anyone until you go to the theater. That will give you one day, maybe by tomorrow. But I had no confidence that tomorrow would bring me any sensible relief. The moral shock was tremendous. All my pride was engaged on the side of never letting anybody know. To have been misunderstood in the quality of my disgust would have been the intolerable last thing. Sarah brought up my breakfast before she had her own. She reported nobody about yet except Jimmy Vantine, who had inquired for me. About half an hour later, she came softly in again with a yellow envelope open in her hand. I saw by her face that it was for me, and that the news it contained put the present situation out of question. "'Is it from my husband?' I demanded. I hardly knew what I hoped or expected. A possibility of release flashed up in me. "'It has been forwarded.' She sat down on the bed beside me. "'My poor Olivia, you must try to think of it as anything but a way out. Mr. O'Farrell will let you go for this. If it had to happen, it couldn't have happened better. "'Give it to me.' Remember, it is a way out. I read it hastily. Mother had a stroke. Come at once. Signed, Forrester. End of Book Two, Chapter Six. Book Two, Chapter Seven of A Woman of Genius by Mary Hunter Austin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Book Two, Chapter Seven It was a common practice in Taylorville never to send for the doctor until you knew what was the matter with you. So long as the symptoms failed to align themselves with any known disorder, they were supposed to be amenable to neighborly advice, to the common stock of medical misinformation, to the almanac or some such repository of science, and though this practice led on too many occasions to the disease getting past the curable stages before the physician was called, I never remember to have heard it questioned. You see, people remarked to one another at the funeral, they didn't know what was the matter with her until it was too late, and it passed for all extenuation. It was natural, then, that my mother should have kept any premonitory symptoms of her indisposition even from Forrester. Close as they were in their affections, she would have thought it indelicate to have spoken to him of her health. The first determinate stroke of it came upon her sitting quietly in her usual place at prayer meeting on a Wednesday evening. It had been Forrester's habit to close the shop a little early on that evening, going around to the church to walk home with her, getting in before the last hymn to save his face with the minister by a show of regular attendance. But on this evening customers detained him beyond his usual hour, so that by the time he reached the corner opposite the church he saw the people dribbling out by twos and threes across the lighted doorway and noted that my mother was not with them. He thought she might have slipped out earlier and gone around to the shop for him, as occasionally happened, but seeing the lights did not go out at once in the church, he looked in to make sure and saw her sitting in her accustomed place. The sexton and the organist, who were fussing together about a broken pedal, 
appeared not to have observed her there, and one of them was reaching up to put out the light when Forrester touched her on the shoulder. She started and seemed to come awake with an effort, and on the way home she stumbled once or twice in a manner that led him, totally unaccustomed as he was to think of my mother as ill in any sort, to get a little entertainment out of it by gentle rallying, which was dropped when he discovered that it caused her genuine pained embarrassment. The following Tuesday he came home to the midday meal to find her lying on the floor, inarticulate and hardly conscious. There must have been two strokes in close succession, for she had managed, after falling, to get a cushion from the worn sitting-room lounge under her head and to pull a shawl partly over her. Effie, who was at Montecito, was summoned home, and that evening, by the doctor's advice, the telegram was sent which separated me so opportunely from the shamrocks. By the time I reached her, speech had returned in a measure, and by the end of a fortnight she was able to be lifted into the chair which she never afterward left. I remember as if it were yesterday the noble outline of her face and of her head against the pillows, the smooth hair parted Madonna-wise and brought low across her ears, the blue of her eyes looking out of the dark, swollen circles for all her fifty-two years with the unawakened clarity of a girl's. Stricken as I was from my first realizing contact with sin and my identification with it through the assumed passions of the stage, it grew upon me during the days of my mother's illness that there was a kind of intrinsic worth in her which I, with all my powers, must forever and inalienably miss. With it there came a kind of exasperation, never quite to leave me, of the certainty of not choosing my own values, but of being driven with them aside and apart. It was responsible in part for a feeling I had of being somehow less related to my mother's house than many of her distant kin who were continually arriving out of all quarters, in wagons and top-buggies, to express a continuity of interest and kind which had the effect of constituting me definitely outside the bond. The situation was furthered, no doubt, by the whisper of my connection with the stage, which got about and set up in them an attitude of circumspection, out of which I caught them at times regarding me with a curiosity unmixed with any human sympathy. Yet I recall how keen an appetite I had for what this illness of my mother's had thrown into relief, the web of passionate human interactions, bone and body of the spirituality that went clothed as gracelessly in the routine of their daily lives as the figures of the men under the unyielding ugliness of store clothing. It came out in the talk of the women sitting about the base burner at night with their skirts folded back carefully across their knees, in the watches we found it necessary to keep for the first fortnight or so. I remember one of these occasions as the particular instance by which my mother emerged for me from her condition of parenthood to the common plane of humanity, by way of an old romance of hers with Cousin Judd. Cousin Lydia sat up with her that night, and Almara Jewett, a brisk country-clad woman of the scaldic temperament, who from long handling of the histories of her clan had acquired an absolute art of it. She was own sister to the woman who married my mother's half-brother, and the saga of the Judds and the Wilsons and the Jewetts and the Lattimores ran off the points of her bright needles as she sat with her feet on the fender, with a click and a spark. Cousin Lydia never knitted. She sat with her hands folded in her large lap, and time seemed to rest with her. It will be hard on Judd, Almira offered to the unspoken reference forever in the air as to the possible fatal termination of my mother's illness. Yes, it'll be hard on him. A faint, so faint nuance of assent in Cousin Lydia's voice seemed to admit the succeeding comment, shorn of impertinence. I guessed that the several members of the tribe 
were relieved rather than constrained to, to drop their intimate concerns into Almira Jewett's impartial histories. I never, Almira invited, did get the straight of that. Sally was engaged to him, weren't she? Not to say engaged. Cousin Lydia paused for just the right shade of relation. But so as to want to be. Judd set store by her. He'd have had it that way, anyway. But Sally couldn't make up her mind to it on account of their being own cousins. I reckon she had the right of it. The Lord don't seem no way pleased with Kin Marion. I don't know. I don't know. Cousin Lydia dropped the speculation into the pit of her own experience. It looks like he wouldn't have made him to care about it then. But being as she saw it that way, they couldn't have done different. Not that Judd didn't see it in the light of his duty, too. There was evidently nothing in the annals of the Judds and the Lattimores which allowed a violation of the inward monitor. Well, I must say, he has turned it into grace, if ever a man has. Not to say but what you've helped him to it. It was in the manner of Almira's concession of not in the matter that Cousin Judd had chosen Lydia chiefly for her capacity not to offer any distraction to his profounder passion, and nothing in Cousin Lydia's comment to deny it. From the room beyond we could hear the inarticulate, half-conscious notice of my mother's pain. Cousin Lydia moved to attend her. All those years, I whispered to Elmira, she has loved him, and he has loved my mother. I was pierced through with the pure sword of the spirit which had divided them. But Elmira was more practical. She was better off, Elmira insisted. Lydia had no knack with menfolk ever. She knew Judd wouldn't have loved her, but so long as he loved your mother she was safe. They got a good deal out of it, her knowing and sympathizing. She could sympathize, you see, for she knew how it was herself, loving Judd that way. It was no more than right they should get what they could out of it. It was the only thing they had between them. All those years, I said again, I felt myself immeasurably lifted out of the mists and mires of the shamrocks into clear and aching atmospheres. I will say this for Lydia, extenuated the scald, that though she had no gift to draw a man to her, she knew how to hold her hand off and let him go on his own thought. It was religion kept your mother and Judd apart, and yet it was in religion they comforted one another. Lydia never put herself forward like she might, claiming it was her religion, too, and she was one that appreciated church privileges. But I wondered where my father came in. It had been, I knew, a passionate attachment. Like a new house, said Elmira, built up where the old one has been, but the cellars of it don't change. Real lovin' is never really got over, I felt the phrase sounding in some subterranean crypt of my own. With this new light on it, it came out for me wonderfully in my mother's face, as I watched her through the anxious days, how much her life had been stayed in renunciations. I suppose my new appreciation must have shown out for her as well, for I could see rising out of her disorder, like a drowned person out of the sea, a bond of our common experience. We were two women, together at last, my mother and I, and could have speech with one another. Something no doubt contributed to this new understanding by an affair of foresters, which, as I began to be acquainted with the incidents preceding it, I believed to be partly responsible for my mother's stroke. I have already sketched to you how Forrester had grown up in the need of finding himself always at the center of feminine interest, without the opportunity of satisfying it normally by marriage, and how the too early stimulation of sentiment and affection had led to his being handed about from girl to girl in the attempt to gratify his need without transgressing any of the lines marked out by his profession as an eminently nice young man. 
It came naturally out of the mere circumstance of there being a limited number of girls at hand whom he might conceivably court without the intention of marrying, for him to fall into the society of others whom he might not court, but who might nevertheless find it much to their advantage to marry him. I do not know how and when it came to my mother's ears that he was calling frequently at the Jastrows. Very likely they brought it to her notice themselves. They were a poor pushing sort, forever exposing themselves to the slights arising from their own undesirability, which they forever tearfully attributed to an undeserved and paraded poverty. They paraded it now as the inseparable bar to all that they might have done for my mother, all that they actually had it in their hearts to do on their assumption of a right of being interested, an assumption which, even in her weakness, before she could trust herself to talk very much, I felt her dumbly imploring me to deny. The girl, Lily, they called her, was not without a certain appeal to the senses, and knowing rather more of my brother's methods, I did not find Mrs. Jastrow's pretension to a community of interest in what might be expected to come of his attention altogether unjustified. But in view of mother's condition and what Effie told me of the way business was going, rather was not going at all, any kind of marriage would have been out of the question— it was the way I put the finality of that into my dealings with Mrs. Jastrow that drew mother over into the only relation of normal human interdependence I was ever to have with her. Whenever Mrs. Jastrow would come to call with that air she had, in her dress and manner, of being pulled together and made the best of, I could see my mother's fears signaling to me from the region of tremors and faintness in which she had sunk, and I would set my wits up as a defense against what, considering all there was against her, was a really gallant effort on Mrs. Jastrow's part to make out of Forrester's philanderings a basis for a family intimacy. It was plain that neither my mother nor Mrs. Jastrow dared put the question to Forrester, but rested their case on such mutual admissions of it as they could wring from one another. I could never make out on my mother's part whether she was really afraid of the issue, or if in the preoccupation of their affection both she and Forrester had overlooked his young man's right to a woman and a life of his own. Through all her dumb struggle against it, never but once did my mother openly face the ultimate possibility of his marriage with Lily Chastrow. It was about the third week of her illness, and Mrs. Jastrow, making one of her interminable calls, had been brought so nearly to the point of tears by my imperiousness that Effie had been obliged to draw her off into the kitchen to have her opinion about a recipe for a mincemeat, such as she knew the Jastrows couldn't afford to be instructed in, and so had gotten her out of the side door and started down the walk before the situation could come to a head. My mother watched her go. "'Do you think,' she hazard suddenly, "'that Forrester really is engaged to her?' "'To Lily? Oh, no. Forrester doesn't get engaged to girls. He just dangles.' It was characteristic of my mother's partiality that even damaging insinuations such as this slid off from it as too far from the possibility to be even entertained." Perhaps a trace of my old exasperation with the whole situation, and the glimpse I had of Mrs. Jastrow letting herself out of our gate with her assumption of being as good as anybody, still to the fore but a little awry, prompted me to add, "'And it is only natural for her mother to make the most of it. She's looking out for her own, just as you are.' "'A mother has a right to do that,' she protested." to keep them from making themselves miserable. It is no more than her duty. Yes, I said. The remark had the effect of a challenge. Young people don't know how to choose for themselves. They make mistakes. She revolved something in her mind, 
You, now, you're unhappy, aren't you, Olivia? Yes. Oh, yes. I had not thought of myself as being so particularly, but I did not see my way to deny it. I've been afraid, sometimes, since you wrote me about going on the stage. Maybe you weren't exactly satisfied. But it isn't that, is it? No, mother, it isn't that. There, you see? She shook off her weakness with the conviction. And you mightn't have been if I hadn't looked out for you a little. Why, mother, what could you possibly... She triumphed. You remember that Garrett boy that was visiting at his uncle's? He called that night, the night you were engaged to Tommy. Yes, I remember. You sent him away? He wasn't suitable at all. Smoking and driving about on Sunday that way? Her tone was defensive. He left a letter that night. Mother, you didn't tell me. I was thinking it over. I had a right. You were too young. Mother, did you read it? I looked at it. You hadn't met him but once, and I had a right to know. And that night you were engaged. I took it for a sign. And the letter? It seemed all at once an immeasurable and irreparable loss. I sent it back, and anyway it turned out all right. I was possessed for the moment with the conviction that it was all dreadfully, despairingly wrong. I couldn't have borne for you to marry anybody but a Christian, Olivia. I thought of Tommy's exceedingly slender claim to that distinction, and I laughed. Tommy smokes, I said. He says he has to do it with the customers. Oh, but not as a habit, Olivia. I overrode that. Tell me what became of him, of Mr. Garrett. Did you ever hear? He went west, she recollected. I asked his aunt. He quarreled with them because his uncle wouldn't send him to school. At his age, they thought it wasn't suitable. I wouldn't have wanted you to go west, Olivia. I took her worn hands in mine. It's all right, mother. I'm not going west. And I'm not going on the stage any more. I'm done with it. I felt so passionately at the time. We sat quietly for a time in that assurance and listened to Effie singing in the kitchen. Olivia, she began timidly at last, aren't you ever going to have any more children? Oh, I hope so, mother. I haven't been strong, you know, since the first one. We didn't think it advisable. Well, if you can manage it that way. There was a trace in her tone of the woman who hadn't been able to manage. I wished to reassure her. When I was in the hospital, the doctor told me. I could see the deep flush rising over her face and neck. There were some things which her generation had never faced. I let them fall with their hands and sat gazing at the red core of the base burner, waiting until she should take up her thought again. I used to think those things weren't right, Olivia, but I don't know. Sometimes I think it isn't right either to bring them into the world when there is no welcome for them. She struggled with the admission. You and I, Olivia, we never got on together. But that's all past now, Mother. She clung to me for a while for reassurance. I hope so, I hope so, but still there are things I've always wanted to tell you. When you wrote me about going on the stage, there are wild things in you, Olivia, things I never looked for in a daughter of mine, things I can't understand nor account for unless... unless it was I turned you against life, my kind of life, before you were born... Many's the time I've seen you hating it, and I've been harsh with you. But I wanted you should know I was being harsh with myself. Mother dear, is it good for you to talk so? Yes, yes, I've wanted to. You see, it was after your father came home from the war, and we were all broken up. Forrester was sickly, and there was the one that died. So when I knew you were coming, I hated you, Olivia. I wanted things different. I hated you until I heard you cry. 
You cried all the time when you were little, Olivia, and it was I that was crying in you. I have expected some punishment would come of it. Oh, hush, hush, mother. I shouldn't have liked it either in your place. Besides, they say, the scientist, that it isn't so that things before you are born can affect you as much as that. She moved her head feebly on the pillows in deep-rooted denial. They can say that, but we've never got on. There's things in you that aren't natural for any daughter of mine. They can say that, Olivia, but we... we know. Yes, mother, we know. I took her hands again and nursed them against my cheek. After a time, tears began to drip down her flaccid cheeks, and I wiped them away for her. Don't, mother, don't. We get along now, anyway. And as for the things in me which are different, do you know, mother, I'm getting to know that they are the best things in me. I honestly thought so, and after all these years I think so now. I wheeled her into the bedroom presently, where she fell into the light slumber of the feeble, and seemed afterward hardly to remember, but I was glad then to have talked it all out with her, for though she lived nearly two years after, before I saw her again another stroke had deprived her of her articulateness. End of Book Two, Chapter Seven Book Two, Chapter Eight of A Woman of Genius by Mary Hunter Austin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Book Two, Chapter Eight. I went home to my husband after it began to seem certain that my mother's condition would not change for some time but I knew in the going that neither Tommy nor Higgleston could ever present themselves to me again in the aspect of an absolute destiny. By the incidents of the past few weeks I had been pulled free from the obsession of inevitableness with which my life had clothed itself until now. I stood outside of it and questioned it in the light of what it might have been, what it might yet become. Suppose I had received Helmuth Garrett's letter— Suppose my interest in Mr. O'Farrell had wavered a hair's breadth out of the community of work into that more personal and particular passion. I quaked in the cold blasts which blew on me out of unsuspected doors opening on my life. And still I went back to Hickleston. There seemed nothing else to do. I think I deceived myself with the notion that there was something in Tommy's resistance to a more acceptable destiny that could be resolved and dissipated by the proper stimulus. But I knew, in fact, that he and Higgleston suited one another admirably. To my husband, that he should keep a clothing store in a town of five thousand inhabitants was part of the great natural causation. The single change to which our condition was liable was that the business might take a turn which would enable us to move out of the store into a house of our own. It had not occurred to Tommy to take a turn himself. The men's tailors and outfitters lay like most business in Higgleston, in the back water, rocking at times in the wake of the world traffic, but never moving with it. There was a vague notion of progress abroad, which resulted in our going through the motions of the main current. The live businessmen organized a board of trade and rented a room to hold meetings in, but I do not remember that when they had met anything came of it. The great tides of trade went about the world and our little fleet rocked up and down. If I had ever had any hope that Tommy and I might out of our common stock somehow hoist sail and make a way out of it, in that spring and summer I completely lost it. I believe Tommy thought we were perfectly happy. Considering how things turned out, I am glad to have it so. But the fact is, there was not between us so much as a common taste in furniture. In the five years of married life, our home had filled up with articles which by color and line and unfitness jarred on every sense. Tommy had what he was pleased to call an ear for music, 
and if the warring discords of our furnishings could have been translated into sound, he would have gone distracted with it. Being as it was, he bought me a fire screen for my birthday. Miss Rathbone hand painted it for the Baptist Bazaar, and Tommy had bought it at three times what we could have afforded for a suitable ornament. It was his notion of our relations that we and the Rathbones should do things like that by one another. I suppose you can find the like of that fire screen at some county fair still in Ohioana, but you will find nothing more atrocious. Tommy liked to have it sitting well out in the room where he could admire it. He would remark upon it sometimes with complacency, evenings after the store was shut up, before he sat down in his old coat and slippers to read the paper. Occasionally I read to him out of a magazine or a play I had picked up, in the intervals of which I used to catch him furtively keeping up with his newspaper out of the tail of his eye. Now and then we went out to a sociable or to the Rathbones for supper. Less frequently we had them to a meal with us. It was characteristic of business partnerships in Hickleston that they involved you in obligations of chicken salad and banana cake and the best tablecloth. Tommy enjoyed these occasions, and if he had allowed himself to criticize me at all, it would have been for my ineptitude at the happy social usage. Things went on so with us month after month. And if you ask me why I didn't take the chance life offers to women to justify themselves to the race, I will say that though the hope of a child presents itself sentimentally as opportunity, it figures primarily in the calculation of the majority as a question of expense. The hard times foreseen by Burton Brothers hung black-winged in the air. We had not, in fact, been able to do more than keep up the interest on what was still due on the stock and fixtures, nor had I even quite recovered the bodily equilibrium disturbed by my first encounter with the rending powers of life. There was a time when the spring came on in a fullness, when the procreant impulse stirred awake. I saw myself adequately employed shaping men for it, maybe, but the immediate deterring fact was the payment to be made in August. I went on living in Higgleston, where human intercourse was organized on the basis that whatever a woman has of intelligence and worth, over and above the sum of such capacity in man, is to be excised as a superfluous growth, a monstrosity. Does anybody remember what the woman's world was like in small towns before the days of women's clubs? There was a world of cooking and making over. There was a world of church-going and missionary societies and ministerial cooperation, half-grudged and half-assumed as a virtue, which, since it was the only thing that lay outside themselves, was not without extenuation. And there was another world which underlay all this, colored and occasioned it, sicklied over with futility. It was a world all of the care and expectancy of children overshadowed by the recurrent monthly dread, crept about by whispers, heretical but persistent, of methods of circumventing it, of a secret practice of things openly condemned. It was a world that went half the time in faint-hearted or unwilling or rebellious anticipation, and half on the broken springs of what, as the subject of the endless, objectionable discussions went by the name of female complaints. In all this there was no room for Olivia. Somehow the ordering of our four rooms over the store didn't appeal to me as a justification of existence, and I didn't care to undertake again matching the adventures of my neighbors in the field of domestic economy with mine in the department of self-expression. Let any one who disbelieves it try, if he can, assure the acceptance of his art on its merit as work, free of the implication of egotism. You may talk about a new frosting for cake or an aeroplane you have invented, but you must not speak of a new verse form or a plastic effect. All this time, in spite of my recent revulsion from it, I was consumed with the desire of acting— 
My newfound faculty ached for use. It woke me in the night and wasted me. I had wild thoughts such as men have in the grip of an unjustifiable passion. All my imaginings at that time were of events, untoward, fantastic, which should somehow throw me back upon the stage without the necessity on my part of a moral conclusion. Sarah Croydon, to whom I wrote voluminously, could not understand why I resisted it. There was, after all, no actual opposition except what lay inherent in my traditions. Sarah had such a way of accepting life. She used it and her gift. Mine used me. I saw that it might even abuse me. She went, by nature, undefended and unharmed from the two-edged sword that keeps the gates of creative art. But me it pierced even to the dividing of soul and spirit. My husband stood always curiously outside the consideration. I think he was scarcely aware of what went on in me. If any news of my tormented state reached him, he would have seen, except as it was mollified by affection, what all Higgleston saw in it, the restlessness of vanity, a craving for excitement, for praise, and a vague taint of irregularity. He was sympathetic to the point of admitting that Higgleston was dull. He thought we might join the Chautauqua Society. "'Or you might get up a class,' he suggested hopefully. "'It would give you something to think about.' "'Teach!' I cried. "'Teach? When I'm just aching to learn?' "'Well, then,' he achieved a triumph of reasonableness. "'If you don't know enough to teach in Higgleston, "'how are you going to succeed on the stage?' It was not Tommy, however, but a much worse man who made up my mind for me. He had been brought out from Chicago during my absence to set up in Higgleston's one department store that fictitious air of things being done which passed for the evidence of modernity. He had, in the set of his clothes, the way he made the most of his hair and the least of the puffiness about his eyes, the effect of having done something successfully for himself which I believe was the utmost recommendation he had for the place. He preferred himself to my favor on the strength of having seen more than a little of the theater. Very soon after my return, he took to dropping into my husband's store, which, in view of its being patronized by men who were chiefly otherwise occupied during the day, was kept open rather late in the evenings. From sheer loneliness, I had fallen into the habit of going down after supper to wait on a stray customer while Tommy made up the books. Mr. Montague, who went familiarly about town by the name of Monty, would come in then and loll across the counter chatting to me while Tommy sat at his desk with a green shade over his eyes, and Mr. Rathbone, who never came more than a step or two out of his character as working tailor, clattered about with his irons in the back, half screened by the racks of custom-made knobby suits, nine dollars ninety-eight cents, which made up most of our stock and trade. I had already, without paying much attention to it, become accustomed to the shifting of men's interest in me the moment my connection with the stage became known. A certain speculation in the eye, a freshening of the wind in the neighborhood of adventure, but by degrees it began to work through my preoccupations that Mr. Montague's attention had the quality of settled expectation. The suggestion of a relation apart from the casual social contact, which it wanted but an opportunity to fulfill. It took the form very early, when Tommy would look up from his entries and adding up, to make his cheerful contribution to the conversation, of an attempt to include me in a covert irritation at the interruption. If, by any chance, he found me alone, his response to the potential impropriety of the occasion awoke in me the plain vulgar desire to box his ears. But no experience so far served to reveal the whole offensiveness of the man's assurance. The week that Tommy went up to Chicago to do his summer buying— we made a practice of closing rather early in the long, enervating evenings, since hardly any customer could have been inveigled into the store on any account, 
I found it particularly irritating then to have Mr. Montague leaning across the counter to me with a manner that would have caused the dogs in the street to suspect him of intrigue. The second or third time this happened, I made a point of slipping around to Mr. Rathbone with the suggestion that if he would shut up and go home, I would take the books upstairs with me and attend them. I was indifferent whether or not Mr. Montague should hear me, but I judged he had not, for far from accepting it as a hint that I wished to get rid of him, that air he had of covert understanding appeared to have increased in him like a fever. He made no attempt to resume the conversation, but stood tapping his boot with a small cane he affected, a flush high up under the puffy eyes, the corners of his mouth loosened, every aspect of the man fairly bristling with an objectionable maleness. I made believe to be busy putting stock in order, and in a minute more I could hear old Rathbone come puttering out of his corner to draw the dust cloths over the racks of ready-made suits, and after what seemed an interminable interval, fumbling at the knobs of the safe. Oh, I snatched at the opportunity. I changed the combination. Let me show you. I was around beside him in a twinkling. Good night, I called to Montague over my shoulder. Good night, he said. The tone was charged. The fumbling of the locks covered the sound of his departure. I got Mr. Rathbone out at the door at last and locked it behind him. I turned back to lower the flame of the acetylene lamp and in the receding flare of it between the shrouded racks I came face to face with Mr. Montague. He stood at the outer ring of the light, and in the shock of amazement I gave the last turn of the button, which left us in a sudden blinding dark. I felt him come toward me by the sharp irradiation of offensiveness. "'Oh, you clever little joker, you!' The tone was fatuous. I dodged by instinct and felt for the button again to throw on the flood of light. It caught him standing square in the middle of the aisle, in plain sight from the street. Almost unconsciously he altered his attitude to one less betraying, but the response of his mind to mine was not so rapid. "'I'm going to shut up the store.' I was very quiet about it. "'You'll oblige me by going.' Oh, come now, what's the use? I thought you were a woman of the world. I got behind the counter, past him toward the door. You, an actress, you don't mean to say. By Jove, I'm not going to be made a fool of after such an encouragement. I'm not going without... Mr. Montague, I said. Tilly Hemingway is coming to stay with me nights. She will be here in a few minutes. You better not let her find you here. I unbarred the door and threw it wide open. Oh, come now! He struggled for some footing other than defeat. Of course, if you can't meet me like a woman of the world, you're a nice actress, you are. I looked at him. The steps and voices of passers-by sounded on the pavement. He went out with his tail between his legs. I locked the door after him and double-locked it. I climbed up to my room and locked myself in that. The boiling of my blood made such a noise in my ears that I could not hear Tilly Hemingway when she came knocking, and the poor girl went away in tears. After a long time I got to bed and sat there with my arms about my knees. I did not feel safe there. I knew I should never be safe again except in that little square of the world upon which the footlights shone, from which the tightening of the reins of the audience in my hands should justify my life to me. I was sick with longing for it, aching like a woman abandoned for the arms of her beloved. I fled toward it with all my thought from illicit solicitation. But it was not the husband of my body I thought of in that connection, but the choice of my soul." People wonder why sensitive, self-respecting women are not driven away from the stage by the offenses that hedge it. They are driven deeper and farther into its enfoldment. There is nothing to whiten the burden of its shames 
but the high whiteness of its ultimate perfection. It is so with all art, not back in the press of life, but forward on some overtopping headland. One loses behind the yelping pack and eases the sting of resentment. I did not agree in the beginning to make you understand this. I only tell you that it is so. All that night I sat with my head upon my knees and considered how I might win back to it. I tried, when my husband came home, to put the incident to him in a way that would stand for my new-found determination. I did not get so far with it. I saw him shrink from the mere recital with a man's timorousness. Oh, come, he couldn't have meant so bad as that. His male dread of a situation pled with me not to insist upon it. And he went just as soon as you told him to. Of course, if he had tried to force you, but you say yourself he went quietly. He was seeing and shrinking from what Higgleston would get out of the incident in the way of vulgar entertainment if I insisted on his taking it up. By the code there, I shouldn't have been subject to it if I hadn't invited it. Of course, he enforced himself, you did right to turn him down, but I don't believe he'll try it again. He won't have a chance. I'm going back on the stage so soon. The implication of my tone must have got through even Tommy's unimaginativeness. He said the only bitter thing that I ever heard from him. Well, if you hadn't gone on the stage in the first place, it probably wouldn't have happened. He came round to the situation in another frame when he learned that I had written to Sarah, putting matters in train for an engagement. You will probably be away all winter, he said. It seems to me, Olivia, that you don't take any account of the fact that I am fond of you. We were sitting on a little shelf of a back balcony we had, for the sake of coolness, and I went and sat on his knee. I'm fond of you, Tommy, ever so, but I can't stand the life here. It smothers me, and we don't do anything. We don't get anywhere. I don't know what you mean, Olivia. We're building up quite a business. We'll be able to make a payment this year, and as the town improves— Oh, Tommy, come away. Come away into the world with me. Let us go out and do things. Let us be part of things. Higgleston's good enough for me. We're building up trade, and everybody says the town is sure to go ahead. Oh, Tommy, Tommy, what do I care about a business here if we lose the whole world? And we'll be old and gray before we get the business paid for. Oh, it isn't because I don't care about you, Tommy, because I am not satisfied with you. It is the glory of the world I want, and the wonder of art, and great deeds going up and down in it. I want us to have that, Tommy, to have it together, you and I and not another. It's all there in the world, Tommy, all the color and the splendor, great love and great work. Let us go out and take it. Let us go. I had slipped down from his knees to my own as I talked, pleading with him, and I saw by the light of the lamp from within his face, charged with pained bewilderment, settle into lines of habitual resistance to the unknown, the unknowable. My voice trailed out into sobbing. Of course, Olivia, I don't want to keep you if you are not happy here but I have to stay myself. His voice was broken, but determined, with the determination of a little man not seeing far ahead of him. I have to keep the business together. I went, as it was foredoomed I should, about the middle of September. Sarah and I had been so fortunate as to get engagements together. My going, upheaving as it had been in respect to my own adjustments, made hardly a ripple in the life around me. Even Miss Rathbone failed to rise to her former heights, but was obliged to piece out her interest with her customary dressmaker's manner of having temporarily overlaid her absorption in your affair with an unwilling distraction. 
The rest of Higgleston received the announcement with the air of not supposing it to be any of their business, but that, in any case, they couldn't approve of it. Mrs. Harvey put a common feminine view of it very aptly. "'I shouldn't think,' she said, "'your husband would let you.' It was not a view that was likely to have a deterrent effect upon me. End of Book 2, Chapter 8